Hi there, I'm Gord, developer of Baby UI. I was looking for an app suitable for my son. One of the problems I found with most apps, they expect you to use a menu choice in order to bring up more options in the app. So with Baby UI, you rotate the device. He might not deliberately rotate the device to bring up a new option, but he will stumble upon it. It'll respond to shake, it'll respond to touch. As it's face down, it's making sounds about once a second. Here's it making sounds, he picks it up to investigate. I'm interacting with the iPod again. And I've got a version for iPad as a native app. There's no information buttons at the bottom. There's no advertising on this app either. It's just strictly baby user interface, nothing more. I'll get that back to you in just a sec. I'm building particle systems for baby UI included in free updates until my son's old enough that he has other iPhone apps that catch his interest. Bye bye to the nice people. They're more likely to buy the app if you act cute. Give them a wave. Good morning, everyone. I feel like we haven't been together in a long time. I'm very excited um, to be hanging out with you all again. Uh, we're going to start this morning with a special presentation uh, and recognition, and I'd like to invite uh, GM Logan to talk to us a little bit about the United Way. Good morning, Your Worship. Um, and for those of, in the audience who aren't familiar with me, my name is Mac Logan. I'm the General Manager of Transportation for the City. Uh, Mayor Nancy, members of council and uh, attendees, it's my great pleasure today to share with you some great news about the end of our 2010 United Way campaign. As you know, United Way is the City of Calgary's charity of choice and we, we garner tremendous support for the United Way through employees of the City of Calgary. Heading into last year's campaign, we weren't quite sure what to expect. We were in this about the third year of an economic downturn uh, we needed to reevaluate the, the way that we were tackling the United Way campaign, and we also knew that there was more need for our support than ever. So keeping that in mind, we set our target at $375,000 for the 2010 campaign, which would be duplicating the prior year's campaign. Uh, we went back to our tried and true corporate fundraising methods. Anchoring our campaign was uh, our corporate donations through our payroll deductions or through designated donations from employees at the City of Calgary. And what we got out of that campaign this year was uh, an increased amount, not only in total donations, but in an increase in, in the number of people that have donated more than $1,000 per person. And it's quite amazing if you see how many city employees do that. We had a number of other initiatives. We started off last uh, last spring with our city's Minute to Win It, which was a little bit of fundraising as well as fundraising. And we went on to our uh, one of our major campaigns, which is the Flower Day. Now, uh, you may participate in the Flower Day with your staff and, and buy flowers for either chocolate or real flowers for uh, people that you know around the organization. This year, we did something new. We extended it to the Meals on Wheels. And uh, 550 uh, city staff members bought flowers for anonymous Meals on Wheels recipients and I thought that was a really great thing that we did this year. We've also done a number of things for the last few years. We've had uh, quite successful bingos, 50-50 uh, draws. In fact, we upped our 50-50 draw this, this uh, last week to about $7,500, which was a new level for us. We do an online silent auction. We've had golf tournaments. Um, it's really been a, a tremendous campaign and we do have a lot of success and a lot of participation. Overall, we reach over 17,000 staff members in about 100 different locations around the city of Calgary. And uh, we certainly get the message out to every staff and we encourage people to participate, if not through a donation, through participating in one of our events. We had a lot of other fun things to do, like paper airplane flying contests inside the atrium, if you were here that day. Uh, we had our first annual artisans auction. We did uh, bake sales, book sales, jewelry sales, all sorts of other things in different business units dozens and dozens of events across different areas around the city. Uh, we tried some new things like bu busking for bucks. Uh, we had a band night where some, uh, some folks in the field oriented units put on, a, put on a special night with three bands and sponsored the Save a Kids area. It's great to have United Way events that are targeted towards specific charities, not just towards the overall general fund. So the overall collaborative efforts have managed to raise 400, over $438,000. And the enthusiasm that was exhibited by the team was, was really tremendous. 
And I'd like to acknowledge a few of the people that were uh, instrumental in making this a success. First off, uh, Jason Merritt. Jason led our campaign. He was uh, seconded from Rhodes for the year. Transportation is leading the program for two years, and we seconded a staff member to lead that individually. Jason was this year's, and next year it's going to a, an individual in Calgary Transit. And Jason was supported by nearly 40 uh, employee campaign coordinators. Um, and if I could just ask those folks to stand up right now who are here in attendance to be acknowledged. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Owen Tobert for his ongoing support and all the members of council for their ongoing support of uh, letting the city of Calgary raise money for the United Way year after year and put out a thank you to all the individual sponsors and individual volunteers that make each event come off successfully. As, as we are all city servants, we take pride in doing great things for the city of Calgary. And I think the United Way campaign and the success that we've had year after year demonstrates how much city employees care about the city that they work for and they work in and they live in. So I'd now like to invite the following individuals up for the check presentation, Mayor Nenshi, Owen Tobert, and the uh, Calgary chair of United Way, Ruth Ramston Wood, as well as our campaign lead, Jason Merritt. Thank you all. Thank you particularly to our 40 campaign coordinators who are actively energized in this campaign. But this is all about building a great city together and we are very strong partners in that work. The three pillars of United Way are moving people out of poverty, building strong neighborhoods and ensuring that all children and youth of Calgary grow up great. And that is the work that we do together with City of Calgary employees. And we're thrilled that they uh, learn more about the community. They get so actively involved in giving back to our community and building a city uh, with everybody. And thank you all for your participation, to the mayor for your leadership. And Mac, thank you for your involvement. You've been a member of our campaign cabinet this year. You've gone well above and beyond your normal course of duties to be involved in the community in a different way. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Logan and Ms. Ramsden Wood. And before all of you leave, let me add my personal thanks to all of the City of Calgary employees who worked so very hard to make this campaign such a great success. Thank you all. Moving on with our agenda then, on question period, Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, I don't know who the question's for, but a couple of years ago I asked a question in regards to allowing cell towers on MR sites, and particularly community sites, so that communities could receive the benefit of the money. Since then, I've gone through people in parks and recreation, I've gone through people in planning, I've gone through people in transportation, I've gone through people in law, and now I've heard it's corporate properties problem. Are we gonna coordinate a response at some point time soon so that uh, I can find out whether I should do a notice of motion, or is it gonna come forward through one of the departments I just mentioned? Mr. Watson is volunteering to answer the question. I am so. volunteering to answer the question and to try to coordinate all these things. You're absolutely right. There's a number of uh, players to the chair, Alderman <coughs> Jones. We are writing a report, and it slips my mind, but I know it's coming back in the first half of this year, coming out of the last council discussion on this, and that'll be part of that report. Okay, are we also going to... Coming, sorry? Are we also going to look at the fact that there's about 400 of these yet to come, and 
all we're doing right now is annoying a lot of people by putting them behind their fences? Uh, well, you're certainly annoying a lot of people. I certainly hear about it. I, again, I'm, I, as Alderman Jones, I'm sure you know, we have very little power on this whole this whole file. And I, I mean, almost I can look around the table. Almost all you have problems with cell phones in your ward somewhere. And you're right. If we can move them all to MR, that'd be one thing. But there are challenges doing that. But we'll bring it all back and, and let council make some decisions on it. And it'll go through land use. It'll come through LPT. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Jones. On question period, Alderman Chabot. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I think this would be for Mr. Logan. I was I was speaking to a, a resident recently about a product that. Um, they thought might be more environmentally friendly and provide uh, maybe uh, some relief to some of the uh, Calgarians in regards to, uh, to traction control. It's a product uh, called EcoTrack, and I was just wondering if you were aware of it and whether or not we had considered using it. Apparently very environmentally friendly and uh, does provide significant traction um, um, enhancement to the roads during snow events. Your Worship, um, I'm not familiar with that particular brand name. Um, I'd, I'd welcome information on it or if somebody wanted to contact our office or Ryan Justin, the Director of Roads, to talk about this particular product. Okay. I've heard, I've heard Miracle Melt, I've heard a number of different things that have been, uh, that have uh, different chemical properties that have a lower melting point. Well, apparently this was in Metro News uh, paper on the 28th of February, so. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, there's a website available. If you could maybe look look into that, Mr. Logan, I'd appreciate EcoTrack. EcoTrack, yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Anyone else in question period? Very well, then. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda, please. Uh, thanks, Alderman Mar. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. On the agenda, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, I would like to ask you to um, bring forward and deal with CPC 2011-27 prior to dealing with CPC 2011-001. Okay. And that's a, a land use uh, bylaw amendment for the signs. I think we should probably deal with that before dealing with this specific sign. And uh, we probably have a number of um, in-camera items that need to be added. I'm not sure if the Chair of Land and Asset wanted to move the addition of those, I believe that's urgent business, is that correct? And the clerk probably knows about that. Your Worship, uh, there, are, <clears throat> there are three items already listed in the in-camera items. Uh, LAS 2011, 04, 05, and 06 are already on today's agenda, as far as I know, Roger. There are no additional ones? I have, I have an additional in-camera personnel item, if you wouldn't mind moving that while you're at it. Absolutely. Okay. I have to do Anyone? that, Worship. I have no other amendments to propose at this point. Okay. Uh, do I have a seconder for those? Thanks, Alderman Demong. Are we agreed? Very well, then. Now, I believe we've got a couple more. Uh, I'll take a motion to add a couple more urgent business items. Uh, there is the urgent business item on the Council Innovation Fund. Um, a, uh, and those are in camera. Okay. And one more in camera urgent business on the airport tunnel. Can I have a motion to add those? Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Are we agreed? Sorry, can we get another uh, mover, Alderman Stevenson? Oh, sorry, I need another mover. Alderman Hodges and Alderman Farrell will second. Um, all right, so on those then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Great. Anything else? All right, then, uh, on the approval of the agenda, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right, confirmation of the minutes. Can I have a motion to accept these three sets of minutes, please? Your Thanks, worship. Alderman Jones. Seconded, Alderman McLeod. Um, any changes to these? Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Um, just a couple on the first set of minutes. Page 18 of 50, although it may be a minor change, typically on third reading, um, authorization for third reading, um, and I've seen this throughout the minutes, it does say um, carried unanimously when it's uh, when the motion is put, and in the middle of page 18 of 50, authorization for third reading uh, says carried, but it does not say carried unanimously and is required to give three readings. So add unanimously to the minutes. Yeah, I think we can uh, take that as a clerical addition. Um, on page 
41 of 50 of the same set of minutes. Uh, let's get to it here real quickly. There was two ins. I just got to find it here. Uh, amendment to amendment, moved by Alderman Chabot, seconded by Alderman Colley Urquhart, and then in the quotation marks it says in 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 the operating budget. And subsequent, you'll see that there's only one in that's incorporated throughout the amended motion. So it should only have one in, not two ins. Good catch, Alderman Chabot. That's what I do, Your Worship. Thank you. That's my next job. It's going to be his <laughs> proofreader. Proofreader. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Chabot. I think we can take those as both as editorial changes. Alderman Hodges, on the next item. Anyone else on the on the minutes? Very well then, on the motion to approve the minutes with a couple of editorial changes, are we agreed? Yes. Any opposed? Carried. All right then, that takes us to the consent agenda. Um, Alderman Hodge, well, I should get a motion to move the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to move it? Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Do I have a seconder? Uh, thanks, Alderman Stevenson and Alderman Hodges. Yes, thank you, Worship. I'd like to pull uh, UE 2011-06, the multifamily recycling opportunities out of the consent agenda for so that I wasn't at UNE committee for this item, and I'd like to ask Mr. Pritchard a couple of questions. Okay, so I will move that to 10.4.2 under Utilities Environment SPC. Madam Clerk, do I need a motion for that? Okay, can I have a motion then to move that one off the consent agenda? Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Do I have a seconder? Thank, thanks, Alderman Pincott. Oh, no, you can't, Alderman Pincott. Thanks, Alderman Carra. Um, on that one, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, done. Anyone, any other, anything else you want to pull off the consent agenda? Okay, I'll take a motion. We have a motion to accept the consent agenda then. Are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. All right. That takes us then to our public hearing items. Uh, Your Worship, uh, it was multifamily I wanted to pull out, which... Yeah, ten, so I stuck that under 10.4.2 on our agenda. <coughs> oh, okay. Under so the UNE reports. Later on in the agenda. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Thank you. My practice is if we're going to pull them off the consent agenda, let's put them with the committee. So... All right, and given the... Um, change that Alderman Chabot put to our agenda. We're going to deal with item 7.2 in your agenda prior to 7.1. So 7.2 is CPC 2011-027, uh, amendments to the land use bylaw. And we'll just do a little musical chairs up here and then we'll be good to go. You ready for us, Mr. Kimber? Yes, good morning, Your Worship and Council. My name is uh, Laurie Kimber, and I'm here today representing the recommendations of the Calgary Planning Commission for CPC 2011 27, textual amendments to the land use bylaw to allow and to regulate digital third party advertising and message signs in Calgary. With me today on my left is Mr. Ken Melanson, and also behind us is Mr. Zoran Karkic, a transportation engineer. This report proposes interim rules to regulate digital third-party advertising and message signs pending the completion of permanent policy and rules, which are targeted for the end of 2012. At that time, the interim rules proposed today, if adopted, would be replaced. This photograph shows an example of a digital third-party advertising sign. These signs use LED technology similar to televisions, and their purpose is to display images and words to advertise products. They are designed and positioned to get the attention of drivers and passengers in motor vehicles in order to communicate an advertising message. They are called third party because the advertisements displayed on them are not related to a business on the site. This sh photograph shows an example of an electronic message sign. It is different than a third party advertising sign because it conveys messages about businesses and the associated products that are located on the site. 
the rules for other types of signs in Calgary, including conventional third-party advertising and message signs, the conventional ones are shown on the overhead, are not proposed to be changed this time. We would now like to briefly review the status of Calgary's current sign rules and explain why changes to the rules to allow digital signs in some areas of Calgary are being proposed today. The overhead shows a general history of Calgary sign rules. They date back to 1980, with updates being done throughout the 1990s, the last being the billboard rules and policy in 1999. There was some reorganization of the sign rules in Bylaw 1P 2007, but the strategy was that a comprehensive review would be done after the implementation and initial monitoring of the new bylaw was completed. This comprehensive review has now started and is targeted for completion by the end of 2012. It will include detailed consultation with sign and outdoor advertising businesses, community groups, and the public. At the May 13th, 2010 meeting of the Calgary Planning Commission, it was requested that the administration develop interim amendments to the land use bylaw to manage digital signs. This motion was based on an earlier CPC report that identified the need for an interim method to manage the quick adoption of digital sign technology in Calgary as it was being implemented rapidly by the advertising industry prior to any new sign rules and policy and prior to communication with community and industry stakeholders. The graph on the overhead shows the increasing number of applications for digital advertising signs in Calgary, with seven of nine applications in 2009 being approved by the SDAB, increasing to 15 applications in 2010. This map on the overhead shows the locations of some of the over 300 third-party advertising signs in Calgary. The purple stars show where the city has approved digital signs, and the green stars show where digital signs have been approved by the SDAB. Some of these digital signs have replaced previously existing conventional advertising signs, and the gold circles represent these conventional advertising signs. And finally, Your Worship, the red dots show the locations of the digital third-party advertising signs that are currently in progress. In developing the amendments today, we met and listened to stakeholders. Three meetings were held with community group representatives in April, September, and October 2010. The general consensus was not in favor of digital third-party advertising signs due to concerns expressed about how their presence impacts the built environment and how they the effect that they have on the use and enjoyment of dwelling units when they're visible. Community stakeholders expressed a general desire for rules that require digital signs to be separated a minimum distance from dwelling units. Industry stakeholder meetings were held in April, May, September, October, and November of 2010. The framework of the proposed rules was circulated to industry organizations on November 1, 2010. And while no consensus on the rules was achieved, there was general acknowledgement that the rules gov governing brightness, location, and image refresh intervals were needed. The purpose of today's amendment are rules to guide where digital signs can locate and how they operate. Since Calgary's current rules were not designed to manage LED technology, we do not have rules to manage sign brightness, response to ambient light, image refresh timing, the distance from the sign to the roadway, the impact on residential uses, or policy that guides what land use districts are appropriate for digital signs. The technology used for digital signs is similar to television. The images can change quickly, as well as the colors and the brightness levels. There is some evidence that digital signs have a different aesthetic and safety impact as compared to non-digital signs. The reason they may have a different safety impact is that the images are brighter and can change quickly potentially grabbing the attention and the expectations of the driver of a vehicle about the current and the upcoming image. The faster the sign images refresh, the greater the potential for driver distraction. A report by a recognized expert in the field, engineering psychologist Jerry Wachtel, on the safety impacts of digital sign technology indicates that the human eye is hardwired to be drawn to the brightest object in the scene and to those that display motion or apparent motion. Advertising signs are different than business identification signs because the images and text are designed by advertising professionals to purposely capture the attention of drivers and passengers and to focus that attention of drivers on the advertising message. 
Business identification signs, shown on the overhead, have a different effect on drivers than digital advertising because they are oriented to identify the location or the entrance of a business to the public, not to sell a product. The impact of business identification signs is mitigated by the important wayfinding purpose that they serve. The aesthetic concerns about digital signs relate to their compatibility and impact on adjacent uses. Billboards can clutter the built environment and can be architecturally incompatible with adjacent buildings. The brightness levels of digital billboards can impact the quality of life in mixed use in residential areas as they represent advertising that can't be turned off or avoided. They can also affect the enjoyment of parks and pathways and the aesthetic quality of the urban landscape, particularly in areas where people live. Some of these issues have already occurred in Canada, as shown by this recent article regarding the impact of dig digital signs on dwelling units in the city of Winnipeg. Calgary's Municipal Development Plan envisions and promotes higher densities at transit nodes and road corridors. Large digital advertising signs are not oriented towards pedestrians, but rather towards the drivers of cars, and the effects of these signs may discourage people from wanting to live in the areas where our policies seek to promote vibrant, efficient, mixed-use communities. To our knowledge, only four Canadian cities currently have approved permanent rules on digital signs. St. John's, Toronto, and Quebec City have minimum 10-second message times, as well as ambient light emission standards and some restrictions on location. The city of Vancouver does not allow any new billboards at all, including digital billboards. There are also a variety of rules in various U.S. cities and states where minimum message refresh times range from six seconds to 60 minutes, while many cities have outright bans on digital billboards, including cities such as Denver and Dallas. The proposed rules do acknowledge that there is a place for digital signs in Calgary. The rules are designed to allow, but to conservatively manage those signs until Council approves permanent policy and rules. The rules proposed in Bylaw 15P2011 include a minimum message, sign, message time of 10 seconds with a maximum one second transition time. The 10 second interval minimizes the potential for driver distraction. Full motion video blinking or changes in contrast or brightness during a message are not allowed. A maximum brightness level during the day and at night is included in the rules and signs must not overly exceed the ambient light levels. Digital advertising signs and electronic message signs must be separated by 300 meters, reflecting a long-standing existing rule in the land use bylaw. And digital signs must not be located within 30 meters of a road intersection. The rules also propose that digital advertising signs not be located within 150 meters of a dwelling unit in the Beltline or downtown, and 300 meters of a dwelling unit elsewhere in the city. The method used to measure the setback is shown on the overhead. This overhead shows a digital advertising sign at a 300 meter distance, Your Worship. The rules also require that digital third party advertising signs be located 14 meters from a property line, which is based on an 80 kilometer an hour spe posted speed limit. This requirement can be relaxed down to six meters when the posted speed limit is 60 kilometers or less, as shown on the overhead. The proposed rules also require that digital message signs be turned off at certain hours when close to residential uses, with this rule also being relaxable. The remainder of the rules for digital third-party advertising signs in terms of siting and setbacks from major parks, their size and the restricted roadways remain the same as for conventional signs. The rules and districts where conventional third-party advertising signs can occur remain unchanged. But digital third-party advertising signs are not proposed to be listed as discretionary uses in the neighborhood, community, and commercial corridor mixed-use districts, where dwelling units are allowed and indeed encouraged. Going forward, Your Worship, administration will continue to communicate and consult with the public community organizations, and the sign and advertising industry to complete the review and the redesign of the sign rules, with completion targeted at the end of 2012. Calgary Planning Commission recommends that Council adopt the proposed amendments to Bylaw 1P-2007 and give three readings to Bylaw 15P-2011. 
Thanks very much, Mr. Kimber. One quick question for clarification, which is, um, given that we're looking at these bylaws today and you showed on a map the location of a number of signs, um, are they all illegal right now and yet they're up anyway? Um, Your Worship, a number of digital third party and advertising signs have been approved by the SDAB. There have been a few by administration and there is, I believe, at least one that's up without a So they've been approved in sort of a policy vacuum, is that fair to say? That, that is correct, in the vacuum of any rules or policy from Council that's overt. Great, thank you. Questions of clarification, Alderman Moore? Yes, Remember their clarification, Alderman Moore. You get questions for administration later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Honestly, it is actually a legitimate question. So, um, could you go back a few few slides to the the images where it's at nighttime in the? I think it's one of the very first slides. Yes, yeah, something like that. Now, uh, you'd mentioned in your presentation that there are different. Uh, lighting levels for night and day, is that correct? Yes. Okay, do you have an image of one during the day or not? I believe we do. Mr. Melanson uh, has one for daytime. But nothing closer because that I can barely see, even without my, yeah. even with my glasses. Yes. I don't know if he can zoom in. Is there something closer? Do we have to? If, that, if that's all we've got, that's all we've got. That's my, that was my question. I just wanted to know if there was a difference between the night shot and the day shot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wish. Thanks, Alderman Marv. Really a question of clarification. <laughs> Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Uh, Mr. Kimber, a couple of questions of clarification. Um, the first one has to do with the, um, the one second transition time that you referenced, saying the maximum transition time between each digital copy must not exceed one second. Doesn't seem to make sense to me. The maximum can't exceed one second, so it can be one one hundredth of a second. Yeah, the, the, your worship. The purpose of the rule is so that uh, um, we don't have uh, movement or effects that transition from one sign to the next. In other words, there is a sign image up, and then the sign image goes away, and the next sign image, image comes up. Instead of uh, fade in, fade out, movement right, movement left. That's the yes, purpose. But the, of the, the, the way it's written. It doesn't say that. It says the maximum is one second. So that means I could have it one tenth of a second, which I would think, appear like a flash. I, I think I get it, Alderman Chabot. I think what Mr. Kimber is saying is that it can instantaneously switch to another image, but what the effect of the rule is to avoid animation, because that's what's distracting. So if it was more than one second, you could have an animation going on at the same time? No, because, anyways, I can get into, go into detail further about what it to, does to clarify that that you can't have it fade in or fade out, that it has to actually be changing pixels without turning them off at, through the transition point, through the transition time. But it should be a minimum of one second, not a maximum, because it could be one one hundredth of a second, which would appear like a flash. Anyways, I will argue that point later. Um, the six seconds versus 10 second that you referenced, Mr. Kimber, and I'm just wondering, because I've heard um, otherwise, in regards to what is the standard, uh, and you say the standard is more in the 10 second time frame. I'll, get, um, I'll ask Mr. Melanson to put up the best practice research, research that we've done in Canada. Um, of course, this is new technology, and a number of different uh, cities are beginning to deal with it. Um, the best practices that we've identified from St. John's, Quebec City, in Toronto are that there is a 10 second message sign, not a six second message sign. And the purpose, your worship, of the, of the message interval is that, or the principle behind it is that the faster the images refresh, the more quickly they refresh, refresh, the greater potential there is for driver distraction so that the driver's attention is oriented towards the signs, anticipating the next sign and the next sign. So the longer interval minimizes that Mr. potential. Mr. Kimber, respectfully, you're going way beyond the question, which was just what is the norm, 10 second versus six seconds, if you had further evidence of that. But I'll, I'll ask for the questions later, Your Worship, they're more in line with okay. the... Thanks, Alderman Chibu. We're getting into debate uh, from questions of clarification here. Um, Alderman Lowe on clarification. Thank you, Mr. Kimber. The, uh, you made a, a reference to speed. And what's the genesis, or what's the basis, what's the background, what's the, uh, what's the anchor for uh, identifying speed? Is it a relationship to distance, how far, how far away the sign is from the roadway? 
Yes, um, Your Worship, I, I might have to uh, call on uh, my colleague uh, uh, Zoran Karka to uh, explain the uh, references to uh, speed in the, in the various setbacks. Your Worship, uh, Mayor Nancy, my name is Zoran Karkik. I'm with the Transportation Planning. Um, the field of vision, field of view is changing depending on speed at 60 kilometers per hour. Field of view is 20 degrees and 100 kilometers per hour is 10 degrees. And uh, the lateral distance is changing with the speed. Okay, what, what, In addition, what, stopping side distance is changing as well for vehicle to be able to stop, to come to, to a full stop uh, at 60 kilometers per hour is 85 meters and at 100 kilometers per hour, which is first column, is uh, 2010. What, what is the basis on which these, this table was developed? Was this developed for third-party signs or developed for highway signage? Uh, it, it, these are uh, used for, it is, the tool is called, um, uh, it is developed for, uh, highway, for highway signs if you are uh, to stop before the red light. In other That's words, if I was meters. driving down a freeway, it's how long it would take me to recognize an exit sign so that I could actually maneuver into the exit at a, at a given speed. Is that correct? That's correct. So it has really nothing to do with third-party advertising. That's correct. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Um, seeing no other questions of clarification, though I'm really fascinated by this visual. I have no idea how to read it, but I like lots of numbers. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> I will ask then if there are members of the public present who would like to speak in favor of this proposal. Anyone who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? All right, anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal, please? That is a huge relief. <laughs> Good morning, Your Worship, members of Council. My name is Doug Forsyth, Vice President of Patterson Outdoor Advertising, and I'm here today representing the outdoor advertising industry. I have 35 copies of our presentation for submission today, if I may. Thank you. My intent is to briefly show you an actual static digital billboard ad and make some overall comments. Our industry has been part of this city for more than 100 years. And through the years, we've employed many new different technologies, from hand painting to silk screening to rotary posters that display three different ads on slats every three to four seconds, as you currently see on the street. We're now in the digital age, of course, and what you see here is our static digital poster. Each ad is six seconds long. There's a seamless transition between ads. There is no motion or video involved at all, only static pictures. The billboard size is a standard Calgary size, 10 feet by 20 feet. The signs are equipped with light sensors to adjust to light levels and a camera so they are monitored at all times. This style of billboard does away with paper technology and requires much less maintenance than existing billboards. Our industry has no issue with interim regulation of this form of signage. It is not a new product. It has been used around the world for 
over 10 years and in Canada for about three. Most jurisdictions that have signs like this employ a six second refresh rate like we do. In fact, in Edmonton, they just finished a new set of rules and that was one of the things that they recently recommend, agreed to recommend to council. There is enough experience out there with the use of this technology to be able to identify its impact and regulate them for the good of all involved. When I say all, I mean to include the industry and the hundreds of businesses and charities in Calgary that benefit from this form of advertising, as well as residents who are informed by it. That said, our differences with administration at this point arise mostly because they have approached this form of signage as something radically new and have been in their word conservative with these rules. Where industry sees a reasonable regulatory solution for problems which administration identifies, the proposed solutions before council today are of a completely prohibitory nature. Industry has made concessions to administration requests during the process leading up to today. For instance, in a lower than agreed to light level and in a three year term for digital permits. We do not object to most of the new rules. However, there are five of them which will severely affect us and our customers and these we cannot agree with. We have transportation and lighting experts here today to address some of those rules and my colleagues will deal with them as well. We sincerely hope that Council will approve the rules with the reasonable changes we would like to see made to them. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I was really tempted to say that uh, I couldn't focus on what you were saying because I was distracted by the sign, but that would be mean. Um, <laughs> questions for Mr. Forsyth, Alderman Hodges. Thank you, Worship. Mr. Forsyth, if you put the uh, photograph or the image back on the screen, please. You mentioned a camera. <clears throat> Where is the camera? The camera, you can see just to the right at uh, the but front. I can't, but I can't see. That's why, why I'm asking you. So is it oh, on the frame? It's, frame yeah, it's, you, the there's a pole sticking out of the, uh, to the sign to the bottom right of it, and that is a camera at, at the end of it. So we can, it is completely monitored at all times. But does it monitor the vehicles, or does it monitor the sign? It itself? monitors the sign to make sure it's functioning correctly. And what if it isn't? then it's seen by the, the folks that monitor it and can be shut down in, in certain circumstances. Okay, do you have a little pointer or something that can show me where this camera is? Is that on? Um, no, I'm not sure uh, how. The I'm arm right. extending out yeah, the bottom right-hand corner. Yeah. So in all, all of our signs, there's, it is hard to see, but there is a, a camera on each one. Now, this is a modest size, uh, if it, we were thinking in terms of billboards. Is this a typical size, the maximum size, or a standard size? This is the typical Calgary size that you see most everywhere, 10, 10 feet by 20 feet. It doesn't look like 10 by 20, though. It looks a little shorter than that, a little smaller. It is 10 by 20? 10 by 20, yep. It, it, it's replaced, all, all of our signs have replaced existing signs, 10 by 20 signs, but they are essentially exactly the same size. Yeah, it just looks a little smaller. That's why I was asking. Thank you. Oh, we got some speakers list for you, Mr. Forsyth. Uh, settle in. <laughs> Alderman Marr. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Forsyth. This, um, now I had some questions about light with fur administration and, and what, as I understand there's, there's different types of either daytime or nighttime. In your presentation, you said that there was a camera which I, I can see, and, and that monitors the sign. Does that also change and fluctuate the, the brightness of the sign over time? Ambient light does, does change the, the sign, so the, the light does levels do come down much more at night. I would like to probably- Could you restart that again, sorry? Sure. Too? I would like to defer your question, though, to, to some lighting people who do understand the technical aspects of it better than I do. Okay. Uh, Please, yeah, um, whomever can, can answer the question because this is, uh, that's interesting to me. Your Worship and members of council, my name is Chris Rebeccas with Patterson Outdoor Advertising. I'll just put the... Yeah, would you mind restarting that? Yeah. I'll restart it again. Okay. 
So, uh, in answer to the question, the camera serves a different function just for security and to maintain the integrity of the sign, and we're watching it for maintenance purposes. And the sign is vandalized if the lights uh, go wrong. We have someone to go out there immediately to respond because of the camera, and our operations center can watch it. The second question from the, through the chair, through the mayor, is the, uh, the light sensor. Again, difficult to see, but on the very top of the billboard is the light sensor on top of the digital billboard is the light sensor kind of a shape of a beehive. You can barely see it above her head there, a little, um, little white gadget. That measures the ambient lighting mm -hmm. levels around the area. So yes, when the sign, so, it, so during the day, the sign intensity functions the most, of course, under the sign light. Right. And at night, it drops down to 10% levels. Um, obviously, because of the nighttime levels, the sign doesn't need to be as lit as it is now. It drops down 10% or drops down? Drops down, down to 10% to of the daytime level, so 90% drop. 90% drop. Okay. Yep. Okay, that's interesting. And and I guess it it it, it changes it fluctuates during the day automatically. So it can yes, actually it does. It, so it sensors and, and measures. That's correct. Really so cloudy days it would be less than sunny days and so on. Yes. Okay. So most people are familiar with either the plain billboard that's papered up and you see the guys putting it up. Um, then there's also the ones with which are uh, triangular in shape and they they adjust. How is this different in terms of the timing? of um, the, the rotating mechanical ones yes. versus this, uh, this digital one? That's a good question. Or Actually, I could probably show a video of it, but I can describe it real quickly for you. Are you going to show a video? Maybe it, perhaps if there's you, there's, you have more presentation. Yes, yeah, so uh, what I can do is I can prepare, I'm, I'm the next presenter, and I can prepare an answer to that question visually. Um, Your Worship, what, maybe what I'll do is I'll let them finish all the combined presentations and put my light back in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. A um, couple of questions. I'm not sure if you saw the administration's um, presentation, but they did show a, a cone that they would be using as their as their guide in regards to the setbacks from residential inner city versus um, the, sub, the suburbs. And uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in regards to that new kind of proposal. I think again, Alderman Chabot, um, we uh, some of our the people that we have here will be addressing that issue, so that will come as part of our presentation. Okay. Now the six second. They do have a graph as well, I believe. Six second versus ten second. Um, administration has suggested that the norm is more ten seconds. Just wondering what your experience or your understanding of what is. Uh, again, that will be covered. We would respectfully disagree. We would we will be covering that issue as to where our signs um, have a six second refresh rate, along with many others. Okay. So uh, along with uh, much more detailed information on that. Okay. So what questions would you like me to ask you? Well, well I, 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 I really yes. I'm happy to answer questions, but perhaps at the end might be. It's just we do have specific, detailed presentations that have covered all of these and I think it's best to have them answer for you. So they have charts and, and graphs in some cases and admitted lighting experts and, and transportation experts. Okay, um, Mr. Foresight then, what about land use ones? Is that something you would like Point to? of order. This gentleman right here. Can we have the full presentation and then maybe ask questions? No. No? Okay. No, because that, that would just be a way of someone getting way more than their five minutes. Uh, that they're previously allotted, so you don't get to come back, Mr. Forsyth. So answer what you can now. I, I think I'll accept that offer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the land uses that are prohibited is that something that you think should be amended? Uh, I know that uh, I had met with uh, with uh, one of your colleagues specifically in relations to CCOR one, CCOR two, IE, and and SCRI districts as being banned and something that I think you guys would have liked to have seen included. We, we do have grave concerns about um, the districts that, that are now included um, that administration has brought forward. Again, um, I think Mr. Rebecca, uh, as part of his presentation, will be covering with in some detail that issue. Okay. Um, now, in your transition, on, based on your presentation, um, I, I noticed that the sign was was changing rapidly from one to the next. 
And to me, um, a sudden change like that is something that would draw my attention. It's akin to flash. It may not be a flash, but because there's a specific light output associated with these devices, this is not a reflected light issue. This is a transmitted light. Um, so when you change from one image to the next like that, without a transition time associated with it, or minimal transition time, it looks like a flash. It draws my attention. Any kind of a change like that will draw a pe people's attention. And the technology exists for you guys to make that transition with X number of pixels or so many lines uh, as a transition over the entire display over a longer period of time, which would appear less like a flash. More si something that's more similar to the mechanical ones that we see where they, they flip over one segment at a time. Is that something that you would consider as part of the transition between the two? as opposed to this sudden change? Well, certainly the technology would exist. This is, this is our current model that's, that we utilize throughout the province and, and, and through most of the country. Um, again, the technical side of it, um, in terms of how that would impact our signage, I can't, again, probably best left with Mr. Rebeccas, who knows more about the workings of the sign. Yeah. I'm, I'm a, and the bylaw is written to accommodate that trend kind of transition. And to me, that is wrong. When it changes suddenly like that, it's akin to a flash. It may be a static picture that comes from and goes to, but because it's a sudden change like that, it automatically draws your attention to it. And that could be distracting, and, uh, which is why I would prefer to have seen something that had a longer transition time between one display and the next. And being as it was part of your your presentation, I thought I'd address it here with you now. Um, I have no further questions for you at this point because it would seem that I will have to address some of my questions with some of the other presenters, so I'll reserve those for later. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, can you sort of, you're here representing the professional third-party sign industry. Um, can you maybe differentiate between the work that you guys do and some of the sort of billboard flashy signs that we see on the cloud trail these days? Like, well, I, yeah, I, I can only speak to to really our particular signs. Our company has always adopted this model that you see here, which represents static technology. Um, it's. We've done a lot of work and done a lot of studies and find that, that for our model of business, third-party advertising, um, it, is the, it is the product and it, this is the, 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 wor the workings of the sign that, that are best for us. Um, there are, I believe, some first-party sign representatives that, that, are, that are likely here today that can speak to the flashing video signs. Some of the signs, um, and, and I'm not aware of, of the permits and, and some of, on some of the other ones, I do know that McMahon Stadium sign at Crochelle Trail um, is a whole separate issue that, that does have the video sign and we're often confused um, and, and, and uh, it's rep are represented and think that's our sign, but that is not our technology. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Lowe. Thank you. And you may not be able to answer this, and if so, I can go to the next person. I'm, I'm curious about the setback from the edge of the road to the sign in this particular. If, if you're not, uh, that, that can check with Mr. Rebecca, sir, whenever when uh, he stands up. I'm also interested in the speed limit on the road that goes the by there, and, and whether or not that affects your company's uh, determination of an appropriate setback from a road. And if you can't answer that again, I can appreciate that. I'd, and certainly, I. I I think it's probably best left with Mr. Rebecca's, who's the expert in that okay. in that area. My last question is: uh, Does Patterson and I'm thinking of uh, Piccadilly Circus, the big Sony sign that I think just came down? That's third-party advertising. Correct, it is. And or Times, Times Square, Square. yeah, there's lots of that. Or do we have any examples of that in the city that your company operates? Uh, that our company operates? Uh, no. No. Are you aware of any of? that type of third party signage in the well, city? Well, the only one that really comes close in a large scale is um, the one on um, at McMahon Stadium. 
on a large scale basis on Crochow Trail. Yeah. Okay. And that's on, from what I understand, federal land not subject to, to the city. University of, University of Calgary, federal, yeah. Yeah. Q of C land. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Um, actually, maybe I'll ask a really quick follow-up to that one. Um, I'm just not familiar with the scope of your company's operations across Canada, but I do know that in Toronto, for example, in the Yonge Street Corridor, there are a lot of moving video display signs. Those aren't yours? Uh, s most are not. There are a couple we do have like that. And do you have, can you comment on your experience with those? Well, it, it, Toronto's a, a confusing scenario. There are, on the Gardner Expressway, you may have seen some, a number of different signs as well. And Dundas Square is a whole area similar to a mo uh, smaller uh, Times Square, if you will. Uh, it, different rules and, and, and situations. I'm not, that's again, a lot of that is, is it separate third party advertising um, on premise signage in some cases. I'm not completely aware of all the details of that. Our type of sign and, and is, <laughs> Generally, we use a smaller size of 10 by 20 um, that are separate from those cluster areas that have been built, especially within a city. Okay, thank you. Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a, a couple of basic questions, I guess. And, and we've talked about the different types of signs, and we know the mechanical ones that rotate and the stationary ones. These obviously are lit up from within, so there's no external light shining on the sign because it is the sign that is lit itself, correct? Correct. correct. Okay. We do have signs that are lit without. In other words, they have overhanging lights or, or ones underneath. And, and then we have the, the rotating ones that change images uh, three or four sides on a, on, on a vein, I guess. Correct. How is this, and it's very basic, I guess, how is these regulations different in regulating those three different types of signs? And so I'm looking for uh, things like the illumination. How is it different? How are we eliminating the illumination in these signs? different than the ones that have the, the stationary or the rotating um, location-wise, all of those sorts of things. I'm really looking at, if I look at this sign, uh, it may be a less intrusive, I, I'm not sure, because the other ones may actually give you more illumination than this one does in a residential area. I, I don't know, and that's what I'm looking for, something along those lines. Well, we, we our signs have, have invariably replaced existing signs that do exist and you're right some are front lit from above or below others are backlit signs um, that are that are static um, we you know, difficult to answer your question and probably again mr. Rebecca or someone could is better at uh, covering that off but uh, I, I guess just so that we follow up where I'm coming from is I would like to know how these new regulations treat these differently than technically any other sign because in my view all signs should be equal uh, within reason w within reason we agree and 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 we do see this as an evolution in technology a digital we are digital everything now and uh, we do see this as as a transition from our existing signs um, the rotary ones that change every three to four seconds to signs that change every six seconds now so if these are restricted in a certain area uh, compared to other signs but the illumination on the other signs is greater than this one. I wonder why. So that's where I'm Correct. at. Correct. One you. of our great concerns. Correct. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman DeMong. Easy question time. Just how far away are we from this? Uh, boy, that's not an easy question. Um, Yeah, we're in the yeah across the street. Obviously, um, no. I was just referring in reference to 150 meters, 300 meters. Uh, I mean, just thought if you're making a presentation. Yeah, it's a, a, probably one. You know, 150. 150. I would suggest. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Not so. Not so much. That was easy. Thanks, Alderman <laughs> Jamal. Alderman Collier, Kurt. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forsyth, for being here. Uh, I'm trying to just hone in on your presentation. I just got it this morning. So if, uh, if you could turn, I, I want to hone in on the recommendations. So I think that's uh, under tab one, the second page, correct? Is, is that primarily, uh, there are four recommendations that you reference there? Correct? There we go. Uh, correct. And so I, could I, we go through those? Uh, recommendation from the planners to ban third-party advertising. Um, 
Where exactly in the bylaw are you making reference to this point? Have you looked at that? Could you? Yeah, I, I apologize, Alderman. It's uh, t uh, I think uh, Mr. Bardsley will handle. I, th I think we'll be able to handle that question okay. in his recommendations or in his presentation, rather. Okay, so you agree with the proposed districts except for uh, the ones that you've outlined there. Can you explain why? Or, or have you done that somewhere else in here? It, yeah, it, this will be That's handled. That's what by, you're talking yes, about. Yes. Okay. Uh, how about the second uh, recommendation that, you, uh, that you're asking that this not be adopted and, and, and you're... And you, is someone else going to talk about yes, that one as yes, well? Yes. Yes. And what about the next one? Asking a, a, a industry asked for this not to be adopted. Uh, and I, why? I, again. Same. Yes. Yes. Okay. And the same with the last one. Okay. Correct. Do you have other amendments that you're bringing forward? Will someone else be dealing with that as well? <laughs> they will. Yeah. And I yeah. It's unfortunate that we've gone this. I mean, it's not unusual for us to have combined presentations and questions around each of these, even if it does take longer than the five. So this is this is different procedure. So it it really doesn't get to the best uh, conversation about this matter. So no, and and I, and I apologize for that. It was my goal to introduce the product um, and give essentially an outline and then go. So how many them all. how many others will be speaking? But we have, we have four. Four others. Okay. So I guess we'll all stand up, ask the same questions. We won't get the answers. We'll sit down and then we'll we'll go on. So it's unfortunate. <laughs> and sadly, if that's how the industry wanted to do it, that's how they wanted to do it. We could have talked about a combined presentation, but anyway, that is as it is. Where rules are in place for a reason. Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, two quick questions. I'm interested in the. Um, Comment made in passing that if there is a problem with the sign um, as detected by the camera, someone would have the opportunity, presumably quickly, to drive out and look at it. Potentially, there might be a, a very serious problem with the sign flashing irregularly or whatever. And I'm wondering what sort of controls are in place to um, shut down the sign or modify the messaging, or if there are, is something like that. Is there some automatic processes or manual processes? They, they, the sign w is turned off immediately if, um, if there's an alarm that comes in that there is something fundamentally wrong. So there's a default it. that it just shuts down. Perfect. Right. Um, I'd like to dig um, a little bit into the 300 meter um, issue and I'm wondering if you're the best person to ask about that. It, uh, I'm just, it strikes me as... Next, next presenter. Thank we'll you very much. We'll cover that off. Thanks, Alderman Putman. Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so you don't want to an ask answer any questions? Of <laughs> Apparently, I'm not doing a very good job at it. But I okay, well, I'll leave those questions. And I just have one then. In tab two, on page two, you have digital posters, digital spectaculars, digital mall networks. Can you explain the difference between the three? Uh, digital posters are the product that you see here, which are traditionally known as, as 10 by 20 usual size. Digital mall units are a product we have in, in, in malls like South Centre that are smaller, they're often kiosk type, that will have wayfinding systems included in as well, as well as ads that run on them for the larger posters. Sunridge Mall has them, for example. Um, and digital spectaculars are the large, uh, usually 14 feet high by 48 feet long spectaculars, um, much larger. We are not able, we do not build those in, in Calgary, but we have built those at the, uh, at the Calgary Airport um, on Airport Trail. And uh, you may see them elsewhere in the, in the province in your so travels. We, we have one in Calgary, where is it? At, on Airport Trail. And uh, we also have one at uh, just south of Airdrie on Highway 2 within the city well, of Airdrie. Yes. Okay, so it's That's, just a matter of the size of the sign then? Correct. So that, that, exactly. Spectacular being a spectacular size. Yeah. Thank you. Those, those, that is the most common type of sign in the United States, actually, that we are talking about for all of these. Okay. Thanks, Alderman Jones. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I'm wondering if we can reassess how this part of the public hearing is working and ask the, the um, presenters if they would like a combined presentation where we, they each get five minutes. Then we'll be able to ask any of the presenters the questions because I can see us repeating this for each presenter. So yeah, it, would you please check? Thank you. We could do that. Alderman Pincott? 
Um, you start, Your Worship. Mr. Bardsley? I was uh, um, John Smith, Fraser Mulder Casper. Oh, sorry. They can spell that. Um, I was simply going to say this is the procedure that uh, previous councils told us we had to follow when we tried joint presentations. We're quite happy to do a joint presentation if you'd like. Well, there's no real, there's no real um, ability for a joint presentation. Um, but what we can do, as Alderman Farrell is suggesting, is listen to all of them yeah. and then ask questions at the no, end. And that's, that's what we're talking about. But I, I wanted to let you, Council, know uh, this is the procedure, the way that the procedure bylaw mandates it. That's not something we want to do. Frankly, it's a bit off. I mean, you should have five minutes to present your case. I understand. Period. period. Well, um, and I understand that you have um, a bunch of different, a bunch of different nuances. But uh, I will say that this is a bit getting around the laws that we operate under. But well, you know, if it is what it is, you brought people, you have presentations. We'll with respect, to your well. worship, if we have as much time as the administration does, I suppose that'd be fine too, including questions. But that would keep us here for quite some time would it not with respect in my life sir I have presented to this council many many times before I got to sit over here and as Alderman Dekali Urquhart well knows when she asks me questions we can go on for an hour I think my maximum was an hour and 20 minutes in standing yeah. on that podium I don't mean to be impertinent but that said the rules are there for a reason yeah even members of council only get five minutes sir so Let's just be clear on what we're talking about here. We are very Not clear. Not because of where we come from, do we don't get special permission that regular citizens don't get. Your Worship, I apologize profusely if you're taking it like that. That was certainly not the intention. Thank you. At all. Thank you. No, I apologize again. Alderman Pincott. Anyway. Thank you. Well, if, if it would make it easier, uh, I would move a motion. Uh, that we ask the presenters to do a combined presentation of no more than 20 minutes. Uh, 15. 15. Uh, sorry, 15 minutes then. I will, I will accept that. Uh, I, would, I will move that motion because that way we could go around. We, we can do it as a council motion. Madam Clerk, is that all right? Okay, yeah, I can take that. Do I have a seconder? Yeah, second. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Sorry, you were too slow. Uh, all right, on that one, are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Any opposed? Very well then, um, proceed. Thank you. I just have one question, which you. probably will go to the next person. Uh, and it's sort of following up on what uh, Alderman Keating was ask, asking about, what comparing, looking at the, the lighting of different signs. These are not the only signs that are lit. You, we have other signs that are lit, but they're lit from the exterior, right? Uh, from the exterior, and we do have some backlit interior signs. So as we well. have, are there, are there any uh, ambient light measurement requirements on any of those signs? Uh, not, to, no, not to my knowledge, no. Do you measure the light levels coming off those signs? We have not. Because you don't need to. You're not, it's not part of the regulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Forsyth. Sorry for you got to be on the hot seat first, but uh, why don't we take the next three together again? I'll ask the clerk to turn the timer on. You've got 15 minutes in total. Your, your Worship, members of council, uh, my name is Chris Rebeccas, Director of Leasing with Patterson Outdoor Advertising. I guess I can deal with the questions after I'll go into my presentation. Um, so I'm here to speak to, and specifically to speak against the rules that uh, are a great concern to the industry. So specifically, let's start with the first rule. The first rule abolishes signs as a discretionary use in C Core 1, C Core 2, Industrial Edge, SCRI districts. The second rule. And, and sorry, and, and, and sorry. The second rule is abolishing the signs from 300 meters from a building containing a dwelling unit, and 150 meters from a dwelling unit, a building containing a dwelling unit in the core of the Calgary city of Calgary. And these rules are not relaxable. The last two I just stated, the se separation, so we can't go to the appeal board and and argue if the sign is not even visible. If there's buildings in between the sign and and the and the residential, we can't argue that case. Third rule is the mandatory 14 meter setback. Today the rule is six meters. And keep in mind this is setback from the property line, not from the edge of the road. So in addition, as we know from the edge of the road, there's other setbacks between uh, the edge of the road and, and the property line. So there could already be extensive setbacks already 
in place. And the, and the fourth rule is the separation of digital billboard, third party sign with electronic message sign. So any type of sign that has a little bit of digital electronic component would require 300 meter separation. And the final rule, which would be the next speaker we'll address is the refresh rate that's been mentioned a couple of times as well. Uh, we're here to, to request that the six second be the norm in the city of, as in other cities in Alberta and Western Canada and across North America. It was only very recently made clear to us that the thinking that led administration to suggest these rules that I'm addressing. And as mentioned, we are in disagreement with the approach administration has taken to these matters, which are more prohibitory than regulatory, considering that these are only interim rules. These rules will severely impair the industry and the countless businesses and charities which use this form of advertising. The administration wants to prohibit digital billboards in a number of land use districts where billboards are now allowed. As mentioned, the four of these are CCOR 1, CCOR 2, Industrial Edge, and SCR, SCRI. We understand that the administration's rationale for this is that the, in the first two districts, CCOR 1 and CCOR 2s, is that these are pedestrian areas. And therefore, administration are thinking of banning all third party signs from them in due course. That is, over the next 12 to 18 months as we meet and review the bylaw, uh, which will address signs all third party signs in addition to digital signs before you today. Administration feels that if they are thinking that in that direction, it would be best not to let industry put up any digital billboards while this review is ongoing, as it would then be hard to get them out of the ban. If, sorry, if the ban is put in place down the road, it'd be hard to get them out. They also give some other reasons such as aesthetics for supporting such a, such a ban now. So I wanted to give you a couple examples of, of the impact of, oh sorry, I'll just verbally verbalize it. So CCOR 1, CCOR 2s, some common roadways that, th that those zonings are found are McLeod Trail and 16th Avenue. These are roadways that currently allow third party advertising signs, the standard billboards if you will, that are not digital, and have always been a common area that you find these signs in. So our concern is um, that we're unable to convert or change or even add a digital to one of our existing billboards on McLeod Trails or 16th Avenues um, and disagree that, they, that, this, that these type of zones would be, should be banned from it. Industrial Edge is self-explanatory. And SCRI um, is a zoning that is dis definitely, for the most part, railway properties, railway lines, railway right-of-ways, and signs are allowed there today. The prohibition of a digital billboard, so I'll deal with the second rule here, within 300 meters of a building containing a dwelling unit is a, is a major challenge for us. There's already a rule in place in the bylaw that prohibits the impacts of third party signs on residential areas. By changing that to the words dwelling unit or a building containing a dwelling unit, and by making this prohibition not relaxable, administration is broadening the scope of the rule and saying that in no circumstances can the impact of such a sign within 300 meters be addressed by development permit review whatsoever. We fundamentally disagree with that. So in this diagram, I'm just highlighting some signs here on McLeod Trail between 42nd and 45th Avenue. This is just an example of uh, three or four uh, third party signs that have been approved, have a permit. And if we were to approach the city today and change one of those signs to a digital, the city would say no because they would take the compass point, do the 300 meter circumference and say that if there's any residential within 300 meters or a building on McLeod Trail that has a residential apartment on top of it, you would not be allowed. Whether it's visible or not, whether the residential is buffered between commercial and industrial, today this rule pass would not allow any uh, digital in this area. And same thing, I won't belabor it. Again, Blackfoot Trail South, again, a common roadway through industrial parks that have allowed third party in the past. Again, it turns out there's, in this case, it's industrial to the west. Once again, any of these signs would be untouchable for a digital billboard, regardless if they're seen or not, and regardless if residential is, is far away from this industrial area. In addition, in an audience as well today to answer any questions, we have a lighting engineer from Stantec, who's here, we'll say a few words, and we'll show council that the light cast from these signs 
is not a factor and is a much less, less, lesser distance of a factor at all when you compare it to 300 meters. So our question is why is this rule proposed and why in this form? The existing and proposed rules to which we do not object, so the existing rules today which protect residential and the proposed rules which a number of them we've already agreed to and are not here to argue against, um, are more than sufficient to address any perceived impacts of these signs on residential areas or dwelling units. That is what the development permit process is for. Why take this away from the industry in this fashion? The third rule is the 14 meter setback. Um, as mentioned, as mentioned today, uh, it's, the six meters is, is a setback standard today from a property line, so already there's already a buffer from us off the roadway for existing billboards. They're proposing to increase that to 14 meters. And they mentioned, if we want to have it less, then just go to the appeal board is kind of the, the answer back to us. Um, the challenge with the 14 meters is a number of things. The one in this photo just shows if you go that far set back, all of a sudden the sign, you start questioning the visibility of the sign, um, whether it's even effective with other buildings and trees. In addition, as well, if you locate it back, the challenge as well for property owners and land, landlords, who would allow their sign to be located in the middle of their lot where they do their business, store things, park things, their buildings, et cetera. So the 14 meters is very challenging for us to deal with. And the, the, the fourth rule is the 300 meter spacing between digital billboards and message signs is a challenge. These are two different types of signs. Our experience in North America is these bylaws are always dealt with separately. And to start combining rules overlapping digital billboards, which is one size of product, versus a message ID sign for a business, which have different sizes and different um, limitations and opportunities. Um, you combine that with the 14 meter setback and you're eliminating opportunities for us to do our business. I've been in a, to before S subdivision development appeal board numerous times and to tell you that the ability to relax rules such as these, if given, will, will not be enough to blunt the impact that this will have on our industry. Again, we ask why prohibit, why regulate in this fashion? Very damaging to our business. The existing and proposed rules, which we do not object to, are more than sufficient to address any perceived impacts of these signs. The case-by-case -case examination of the impact of the sign is what the development per permit process is for. Again, why take this away from us? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, and I should warn you that you've taken 10 of the 15 allotted minutes um, there. Um, but just before we go on, I'll just stop the timer for a second and recognize Alderman DeMong. I'm pleased to introduce our City Hall School class for this week. Uh, they, are, they are 23 grade 5 and 6 students from Prince of Wales School in Parkland, accompanied by their teacher, Jennifer England. Their focus for this week will be how do our past and present affect our future. If you would please uh, stand to be acknowledged. And just to let you all know, you're now on TV. <laughs> Thanks all, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in my office uh, later this week. All right, please continue. Good morning. My name is Nicoletta McDonald, and I'm the Director of Sales at Pattison Outdoor Advertising. I'm here to speak to the fifth rule, which troubles the industry, and that is the 10-second refresh rate. Refresh time is the amount of time that one ad appears on the screen. Currently, the ads change every six seconds. The planners did actually discuss this issue with industry, but they were adamant that the refresh rate be 10 seconds. We are not exactly sure why they are so fixed on this rate. In the USA, 40 states allow digital signs, and of those, only four use a 10-second refresh rate. Three have no real regulation, and the rest use between eight and two seconds. In Canada, all the Western markets use six seconds, and in fact, Edmonton has just recommended new rules about digital billboards, and they have accepted six seconds. The 10 second rate which the planners want is not industry standard and is used by only three Canadian cities that we know of, Toronto, Montreal and Halifax. The six second rate allows Pattison to offer one spot per minute to non-profit charities free of charge. This is a service which is greatly appreciated as the letters in our materials show you. <clears throat> Local festivals, Distress Centre, United Way, Alberta Ballet, Glenbow Museum, a variety of Calgary artists are just a few of the many non-profit and charitable agencies who have benefited from our digital boards. Just this past Christmas, our digital boards recruited 22 medical professionals for Samaritan's Purse to help with the cholera outbreak in Haiti over the holidays. 
That was an immediate crisis that we were only able to respond to because of the digital billboards and our commitment to reserve one spot to PSA. If the refresh rate is raised to where the planners want it at 10 seconds, this type of program becomes economically challenging to offer. There is no compelling reason to change the refresh rate from the industry standard of six seconds and industry asked the council to approve the refresh rate of six seconds and reject the 10 second refresh rate requested by the planners. Thank you. Thank you. We've got one more, I think. Pardon me? I just said we've got one more person. Your Worship and Council, my name is Bruce Nelligan. I'm the manager of transportation at DA Watt Consulting. Uh, we've been working with the industry over the past several months as their transportation consultants. I'm here to answer any technical, technical questions about the billboards or any aspects as they relate to safety. Thank you. Thank you. And was there one more? Sorry, I miscounted. I thought there were three, but there's four. Um, I'm Shaheen um, from Stantec. I'm the lighting engineer. I have done study for Patterson uh, for one of the existing digital board at 9th Avenue and 5th Street, and I'll be happy to answer any question. Great. All right. Thank you all very much. Um, we will go to questions from Council then uh, for any or all of you. You can come back to if you want, Mr. Forsyth. Alderman Lowe. Oh, Mr. Bardsley, were you still going to present as part of this as well? I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Worship, um, thank you. I, I just had the summary. Go so ahead. Instead of saying anything, I'm wondering if you just allow me just to put it up on the overhead and Council can look at it really you, quickly. You can even say it. you got three minutes to go. No, we worship by, I think we've uh, taken enough of Council's time. All right, thank you. So I just put that up. This is just the summary. What's uh, paragraph one is what the industry would like to see changed and the, dig and the uh, italicized portions are simply the reasons for that. You've heard all these before already anyway, so I'm not going to belabor it. Are these the ones that are in the presentation that was handed uh, out? Fairly well, right? except your worship. There are a couple Oops. of things. There's two additional ones to this. When we gave the presentation materials out, we were under. We didn't realize the SCRI district was in that bunch, so we had to add that. Okay. Uh, the only other one I think that's different is that uh, we had a better look at the 300-meter uh, separation for digital signs, meaning the electronic e-sign class, which is the on-premises sign, to a billboard. And that we have come to conclude is, is, a, is a thing that we'd like to see studied more, and that's been added. Uh, for Council's information, very, very quickly, the current regulations for uh, third-party signs don't have any separation from these types of signs, but there is a 30-meter separation from an ident sign. The recommendation staff is making that there be a 300-meter separation between a digital billboard and E-class sign, and that's something we think needs a lot more work. So that's been added. So those two, one tweak, one addition, otherwise it just is in the book, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, questions for this uh, team here. Alderman Lowe. Thank you. Um, for whomever, I guess, we need the, we need the crowd up there. The, uh, Mr. Rebeccas, the billboard that was in your original, in the original display, your, your uh, the first video you, you put up on there. Well, how far was that? What was the setback of that sign? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to surmise you from my recollection. We don't have the site plan with us. It's an 80 kilometer hour roadway, McKnight Boulevard in this area. There's an extensive setback already because of, the, because of the roadway, McKnight Boulevard. There's a grass boulevard up to the fence, and then we're set back from the fence to the park. So from the park line, we're about three to six meters from the park line as it is now is my recollection. In addition to that, there's a setback of the Grass Boulevard, so we're quite far from McKnight Boulevard Roadway. And if you went, and if you added the Grass Boulevard setback, and you went in from the fence property line, another 14 meters, you'd be in the middle of the lot, and the sign would be virtually ineffective because it's so far from the roadway. Okay, but the picture you showed us, to your recollection, is whatever the boulevard width was, plus three to six meters from the... Plus the fence, from the fence, from the fence. approximately, yeah. Okay. Thank correct. you very much. And the speed on McKnight Boulevard at that point, you say, is 80 clicks? Is 80 kilometers per hour. Okay. Correct. I need to understand from whomever the relationship between speed and setback for third-party signs. And I'm going back to the, to the, uh, the uh, table that was put up by transportation, which evidently, if I understood the, uh, the evidence correctly, uh, was really related to my ability to recognize a highway sign 
to read it, to take the corrective action necessary to comply with whatever that sign may be instructing me to do, including some decision time in there if I want to get off the road at that point, for example. So is there a corresponding study with relation to digital bill? Obviously, you want them read so that there's got to be something in there. Your Worship, through to Councillor Lowe. Um, the relationship between the speed and the placement of the signs is, is something that came out of the work that we've been doing on behalf of the outdoor advertising industry and working with the city and trying to get approval of certain signs. So we, there, there isn't a lot of research out there that shows that if a sign is placed in, at X number of meters from the roadway that it's, that it's less safe or there, there really isn't a lot of information at, for me as an engineer to go off to say whether it's safe or unsafe. There's, there's been a lot of research, but it's all been inconclusive in terms of the relationship about advertising signs to safety. So to respond to the city's request to do a safety report on a particular sign, we started looking at some of the engineering techniques that we use for the placement of traffic signals. So um, when we look at the placement of traffic signals, one of the things that we look at is the stopping site distance, which is related to speed. So the faster you're going, the longer it takes for you to stop. So that's where the whole issue of, of the stopping site distance and the distance that you saw on that uh, chart that was uh, displayed earlier came from was, was the stopping site distance, which changes as it depends on speed. So it was something that we took from, from a different application. It wasn't, wasn't to do with outdoor, you know, the outdoor advertising signs per se, but it was something that we tried to apply uh, to this particular topic to try to try to help us in, in determining where the sign could be placed. Did you find that the, was, was the, the comparison useful? Well, it was something that we that we used in um, to look at specific sites and uh, and to say whether it was in the primary cone of vision or the secondary cone of vision, but um, um, it was something that um, th that we looked at, but whether or not it was useful in, you know, in determining the exact placement of it, um, it's, it's questionable. Okay. It strikes me that the purpose of a highway sign is my maneuvering my vehicle down the road. Admittedly, advertising is to get my attention to read the sign. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, did, did you read any studies that says that my focus on my primary function is distracted by a billboard over here, be it lit or otherwise? Now, there's been a, a lot of research on um, the outdoor advertising industry and signs, billboards, and how it distracts drivers. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of it is inconclusive in tying billboards to safety, road safety, and actual crashes. Um, but what there are a few things that I think the industry and, and the research agrees on is that um, glances of longer than two seconds uh, could be problematic in terms of a road safety perspective. Um, however, there has been uh, research that has been done that says that that on average, a, an outdoor advertising sign or a billboard will attract a glance of about a half a second to one second. So, so that's the kind of research that's been done, and that's and that's what we've been using in terms of working with administration on, on the applications for these, these signs. But if I understand your information correctly, that's for all signs, just not digital? Correct. Okay, so it would apply equally to a paper billboard, a vein type, a front lit, a back lit, et cetera, yeah. okay. Yes. With respect to the ambient lighting issue, uh, and I'm hearkening back to Mr. Rebecca, so remember, I think we had, a, we had a problem up in Simons Valley with a, a sign that was bottom lit that was problematic. Is, is, is that lighting controlled at all other than off on? And how does it relate in relation to the kind of light, ambient lighting that would take place from a, bill, from a digital billboard with the controls you're proposing on it? So sorry for clarification. So the first part of the question is is regarding whether what kind of impact or what changes the lighting can do for digital, how it's changed? No, or my, my question is if, if I'm using that, that, I don't know if you recall the one we oh. had up in, in Simons Valley, overlook Sage Hill there. The, uh, you know, that was at night, it was just a glaring bright light. What I understand is the digital signs, you can 
adjust that down. Is that correct? That's that's correct. And I do have our lighting specialist Shaheen to answer as to what kind of how do, how do cast. We, how do we light. measure the point at which any light is too much? Oh, so so what they've done, and actually that's an earlier question. Someone asked the difference of lighting between existing billboards today and digital. So. Today, for standard billboards, which use halophane lights and can be used at the bottom of the signs shining upward or the top of the signs shining downward, that's physical light onto the sign surface of a paper or vinyl billboard. Today, um, that's always been accepted. Uh, they've never been measured, and the rules, and there's, there's no rules in place in the bylaw that requires certain lighting um, controls on those existing signs. For digital billboards, um, we all recognize that the industry, the city, the manufacturers recognize, yes, these signs are, are tend to be more intense. So the, what the administration did was they spoke to manufacturers, the electronics in specific, and came up with a level to measure the sign output so it does not exceed a certain amount. In this case, in the bylaw, it's 500 nits in, at night. And 10 times that during the day of 5,000 nits. How it's measured is actually there is a gun called a nit gun. What, um, what is a nit? And what is a nit? I'm going to ref, uh, refer that. I'll, answer, I'll finish the question, then I'll refer to our lighting specialist to get into the specifics of that. But um, unlike standard billboards, this is the first time, and we recognize that because of the technology, that there is lighting levels in place. And, and even before these rules were, were discussed or passed, our signs have already been placed through the appeal board, as heard earlier. And it was done independently by Stantec, they measured the signs, and in fact, our signs already fell into those guidelines even before we started measuring them. So today, the digital billboards you see today on the streets that have been approved by the board meet those guidelines that are in the they're in council before you today. And as mentioned, as you can see in our arguments, this was not brought up today. We're not in we're not um, concerned with the lighting levels as brought forth by administration. Um, that dropped significantly since we first started the negotiations, but we felt it was a, a necessary concession and we accepted the fact that the levels were lowered. Okay, I and guess then I'll, I'll, I'll refer to your... Sorry, Mr. Rebecca, before you go on, and maybe your lighting expert who can tell me this, but what's the effect of... I guess I need to know what a, what a nit is, but what, what's the effect of the reduced lighting as you move away from 100 meters, 150 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, uh, supposedly into a residential area? Does that... that does that amount of light, at what point does it become um, undiscernible? Yeah, it's, it's substantial, and, and, yeah, and the question you're asking is, where does, it, where does the ambient light kind of just swallow up the sign after yeah. a while? Because obviously, um, our signs are quite different than here in the city context versus rural highway context, which is where signs have little ambient light to compete with out there. But uh, it does drop substantially, and, uh, and uh, I've got some numbers here from our lighting specialist to give you an idea of how far they drop down and what level is probably a good measurement level for a sign to measure it. Maybe I could ask you, just for my help, tell me what a knit is. I mean, give, it, give me something I can roll. How, how many knits have we got in here at the moment? A uh, knit is a candela per meter square. Uh, so knit, if you're looking at any, any light fitting or it could be uh, even like sun, so it's something, like if you're looking at any light fitting, the light coming from that source is the brightness. Knit, knit is basically a measurement of brightness. Okay, measurement of brightness That's right. per square meter. That's right. So, and again, to try, for me, to, I'm sorry, Your Worship, for, for me to try to put it in perspective, um, enough light on a, from a flashlight for a meter for me to read uh, a page in a 12 font how many nits would I need to do that um, that would be uh, um, there are two things one is uh, brightness and the other is uh, foot candle level so when you are talking like when you want to read something you would be you would need something that's reflected from the reading material so that would be that that is measured in lux and uh, uh, to, if, <laughs> if you want to measure, if you want to read something that too at night, and the lighting level depends upon the person whether if we have children here, they can read ten times less light than I can, and as we age, we need more light, so it's it varies. But in general, uh, if you want to read something, um, two hundred or two hundred and fifty lux should be good enough. 
I, I just have to point out that Alderman Pincott is dying to answer this question. <laughs> but, but, but maybe we really do you want to add something? Do you mind, Alderman Lowe? Uh, I, if, uh, I, I, my, my question is, was well, next one that just handed to me is how many nets in my laptop here? No, and there. <laughs> so let me just let me just help. Uh, nits is a way of measuring perceived uh, brightness, so perceived brightness. So you measure a nit by looking at That's the right. source. I got that. You measure intensity by what in, comes in back. a different measurement by what's down here. So you can have a very bright, very bright source in the corner of that room, which would be high nits but here would be low foot candles. So in this room, we would have relatively no nits, but high foot candles. So nits is perceived brightness. What we measure down here is lighting intensity, something completely different, which she tried to explain around foot candles. So it's, it's two different things that you're measuring. You know, brightness, it's really, it's really brightness, wow. which is <laughs> brightness, <laughs> brightness, which is the source. On, on and all, me. <laughs> all skills. And, and, and FYI, for those in the gallery, if you're if you're wondering about that exchange, Alderman Pincott in his previous life was a very well-renowned and uh, and multiple award-winning lighting designer. So he, he has some expertise in this area. But wow, <laughs> Alderman Lowe. Okay. I'm, I, I think I'm, I think I am where I need to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, Go ahead. I also have 35 uh, reports. Uh, if, with your permission, if it could be distributed, maybe that would make things simpler. That's fine. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, my last question has to do with with uh, uh, the the cone that we see being used regardless of topography. You know, if we have a, a, I think Barlow Trail, your, your example of Barlow Trail is a really good one where the signs are on the east side of the road, the residential is on the west side, but significantly below the road. So, but if I read, understand the proposal correctly, because it's within 300 meters, it would not be allowed today. Is that, do I understand that? Because that, that the, the nux of your problem was that? That's, that's exactly correct. It is a challenge for us to measure sign location 300 meters, and if there's a building with a dwelling unit, we would be prohibited. No. So Blackwood trails, Mount Cloud trails, or border residential, those kind of roadways would be prohibited. Okay, now if the, it, it seemed to assume, and it seemed to assume to me that they were assuming that all signs were placed at right angles to the roadway. It's my experience that very few are. In point of fact, you tend to angle your signs so that oncoming traffic has a, has a your, your advertiser has a chance at the oncoming traffic, I'll put it that way. So is there any provision within the bylaw as you read it to cut off that arc, limiting it to the road, particularly where you have a, a topographical feature that falls away, or conversely climbs? No, and that's why that's why we made it a, a strong case and why we're here today in contingency like this because of that kind of rule. This does not allow for any, the challenge is twofold. One, there is no contingency for topography, <coughs> buildings, trees in front, anything, any kind of buffer between the sign and 300 meters is taken out of the equation. And secondly, it's not relaxable. Double whammy for the industry. I am. I think I first met you while I was on DAB, Mr. Rebecca, so I understand about relaxable. The, uh, my last question is, in your placement of your current signs, your, your standard signs, is speed of the roadway a consideration at all? No, the bylaw today has no address, does not address, there's no concern whether the speed limit is 50, 60, 70, or 80 kilometers. The, today they have setbacks, zoning, and as they did in Edmonton, they simply added digital billboards to the existing rules and say, where billboards exist today, digital is fine too. Just two provisions, please. No, no video or motion, and control the lighting, and we're happy. So here they've taken it beyond that, and they've limited particular zonings, they have the huge separations, et cetera. So it is quite different. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Alderman Lowe. Uh, uh, the puns they write themselves, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to refrain. Alderman Jones, 
Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, my question is basically the same. Mr. Rebeccas, in recommendation number two about the 150 meters from a dwelling unit, your concerns, you don't really address what your concerns are about the distance. Is it that you might be close to a hotel? Is that classed as a dwelling unit on a major road? Uh, is it concern that uh, the, sh the, the dwelling unit might be behind you and, and the sign's in front and it's not shining back there? So is that the concern? Or? Part of it, yes. The, the concern is, um, and to, to clarify, the 300 meter from a dwelling unit and 150 meter from a dwelling unit are, are the same. It's just the context where 300 meter, the 150 meter rule that you referred to through the chair, through the mayor, is for the downtown core. And our concern for that is, of course, the core is heavily developed. And to put a sign up on a wall, for instance, we just got approval to put a sign up against the International Hotel, up against the wall of a building. But if there's a residential next door to that building, even though, our, even though the International Hotel is in between the sign and the, and the uh, condo, it would, be refu it would not be allowed based on the rules today. So the 150 meter, our concern is um, there could be, the, the, it could be developed, it could be a buffer, there could be, the sign may not be visible whatsoever in the core because it's so heavily concentrated development-wise. Outside the core is a 300 meter rule from a dwelling unit. So you combine, so that rule is part and parcel together, A and B, if you will, together, and both rules are not relaxable. So hence the picture that you showed earlier on McLeod Trail where it showed units within the 300 meter setback, but which wouldn't be able to see the sign if, no matter how you tried, even if you stood on the roof. Correct, because our signs, um, they're again, sorry, not again, but in today's rules, our heights are maximum allowed 26 feet. So we're not even allowed to go as high as a second story building, if you will. So our signs are low to the ground, cannot be more than maximum 26 feet. And as a result of that, and you, you go down the call trail, 16th Avenue, you put a commercial building behind, between our sign and residential, our sign is not visible. So I noticed in here, in your, your four recommendations that you have, you're asking the industry, or you're asking us not to adopt these, but you're not giving us an alternative of what you want adopted, or at least I haven't seen it looking through this book. Um, it's not, it's, uh, sorry, the best way to look at it is actually these ones here. Uh, the book. See, sorry, I can't okay. see that. So it's actually not, it's simply more than just not adopt. I'll clarify, it's to delete. So when they, so when they s suggest that there's four zonings today, CCOR 1, CCOR 2, for instance, SCRI and IE, Industrial Edge, we're saying those, the billboards allowed today in those zones, we're asking for them to be deleted, to be deleted from the bylaw recommendation before you today. Um, and then the rest of the rules, of, and so that's example of one. So we're asking for it to delete. The second rule, again, 300 meters, because 300 meter, 150 meter separation, that's the second rule, we're asking that to be deleted. Not only not adopted, but, but to be deleted. For the reasons given um, um, in the report, and as mentioned, um, the, the separation distances are, are critical and, and impact our, in our, our sign industry. The third rule we're asking is to change from 10 seconds to six seconds. The fourth rule is another deletion, the 300 meter separation from digital to electronic sign, again to delete. And again, and the, and the final rule is a 14 meter setback, again to delete. There's already provision in the bylaw for six meter setback. So we're asking for it to be deleted from 14 to six. Okay. So it's mostly deletions and one change from 10 seconds to six seconds. The other four are straight deletions. Okay, and I have one question for your lighting person. You, and it was a question based on what Alderman Lowe had asked. Is there has been studies done in regards to light and signage. Has there been any correlation between accidents and cars or? Uh, actually, there are. This particular subject is very subjective, to be very frank. Um, there are various standards available based on Illumination Engineering Society of North America. So what we have done is uh, we have done a study uh, of the existing digital board which are from Patterson which is located between 9th Avenue and 5th Street. I can show you. This is for um, basically most of the question has been asked regarding this. Um, just to understand the intensity of light coming out of the uh, LED, the digital board, if you're standing straight in front perpendicular to um, the billboard, 
that's, that's where you will experience maximum obtrusiveness of light. As you go far off, it becomes lesser and lesser. So uh, if you are at like 70 degree from the edge of the digital signage, you are almost like the, the, the lighting level reduces almost to zero. So if you're parallel, there's nothing visible. The other parameter that's related to obtrusiveness is um, the distance, how far you are from the board. So we did a study. We actually plotted um, 300 uh, feet distance uh, for each of these angles, as I showed you before, like 30 degrees, 70 degrees, 90 degrees, and then 140 degrees. And at every 100 feet, we did a measurement. Two sets of measurement um, for nit meter, that's, um, that's a brightness measurement, and the other one is the uh, lighting level measurement. And we did uh, two sets of reading. One is uh, daytime and at nighttime, because the lighting level differs at the two times. So uh, I will be showing you two tables wherein we, we took the measurement. The, the table that you see here is uh, the lux meterly reading. And this table shows the, um, the net meter reading. Now in this uh, particular table, as you can see, at nighttime, at none of the points, uh, the net meter reading is, is exceeding 500 nits, which was one of the topic of discussion in between. So, The table that you see here is, um, is, is the lighting trespass um, recommendation that's available. So basically, each of the area can be divided into various zones. Um, this, the existing uh, lighting study that we did, uh, we based it on ambient uh, light brightness, which is that's uh, zone three. So what the standard says is, is whatever the ambient lighting is. For example, if the ambient lighting level is one foot candle, um, the combined lighting with the digital signage cannot exceed 1.8 foot candles. So 0.8, what you see is the allowed trespass. So what we concluded looking at the various readings, um, the lighting level was never beyond the recommended ambient level. Does that answer your question? I was going to say, so the answer to my question, is that a yes or a no? <laughs> <laughs> Do, was, is there any studies been done that, I guess the question was, is there any studies that have been done in relation to light, digital lit signs, and car accidents? There are various studies, um, not from one, but various uh, different associations have done. So in general, when you compare like, between conventional and the digital, or just the digital? I guess what I'm searching for is, if somebody's saying that we need a setback because of driver safety, uh, and the setback, the farther setback is, the less distraction it is for a driver. Is there anything that shows that there is a correlation between digitally lit signs and car accidents? Your Worship, uh, there has been a lot of research done on the digital billboards and, and trying to correlate or try to understand how they impact safety. Um, none of the research to date is conclusive uh, in indicating that it does cause more crashes. Um, there has been uh, research done that shows that it is and it isn't. And, and because it's relatively new, there's still ongoing research where, where the FH WA in the U.S. is doing a quite a comprehensive research program right now to try to understand that better, but that information is, is not available yet. But the information that's been collect, collected to date is inconclusive. Is it not available just because it's, the digital signs are so new to the industry? Yes, because uh, the research in the digital billboard started in the early 2000s, but to date, as I said, there's been a lot of reports done, but nothing conclusive um, in tying that to safety. So would there, I, I noticed in the report they're asking for six seconds, or ten seconds rather than six. Uh, is it because of the, as Alderman Chabot said, it looks like a flash and the less flashes there are, the better off you are? I think what's more important is, is the exposure of the drivers to a certain 
number of ads. And from what we've seen and, and from some calculations that we've done, um, it really doesn't make a lot of difference in terms of the refresh rate, whether it's a six second or a 10 second. The driver's generally gonna be exposed to two ads. So depending on, on, on what part of the cycle they're arriving at the sign, uh, most drivers are going to see one tra at least one transition anyways if it's six or ten seconds so and there's been no research to say that uh, six seconds is less safe than ten seconds so that's the argument in the industry is you're not going to sit there and watch ten of them go by as you're driving you're only seeing going to see the maximum two or three anyway correct okay thank you your worship thanks very much alderman jones alderman keating Thank you, Your Worship. I'll go back to my original question because I really do believe that uh, nits, nats, nuts, and candles with feet should all be regulated because we have to because that talks about the distraction, the brightness. Um, if we look at illuminated signs in comparison to these, there has to be a difference. I guess when I look at the footprint of the sign, it goes back to my original question, is or are these digital signs as far as size, place, location be treated differently than any other sign? that is out there? The only two differences is the video motion yep. and the lighting. Other than that, no, there should be no differences and City of Empton exactly did what you just stated. That what we're doing with these is we're actually treating them different as far as footprint. There are certain things that have to be regulated without question, but as far as location signs and all of these, these are being treated different than any other sign? Correct. Our, our belief today, today's bylaws with a six meter setback, that these signs only be allowed in commercial industrial areas and that these signs do not impact residential. These are existing rules today in place in the bylaw. Thank so you. So yes. Thanks, Alderman Keating. Alderman Chabot. I'm not sure if we have enough time for lunch, Your Worship, but uh, thank you. We'll settle in, Alderman Chabot. <laughs> Got I've got a couple minutes. of questions. I'm not sure to address this one with, but um, I've got a number of amendments that I was proposing, um, some of which I, I believe <coughs> you've had a chance to see them all, and I'm not sure who to address which one with whom. Uh, but um, one of the recommendations in the amendments that I had proposed had to do with some of the things that were presented in regards to the setbacks. and with a graduated variance, and, and I appreciate what was said about property line versus edge of roadway, uh, but some of the recommendations here include six meters on 60 kilometers or less, 10 meters on 70 kilometers per hour or less, and 14 meters um, for 80 kilometers or greater. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in regards to those proposed amendments. Um, we are open to that. For the 14 meter setback, if it's a graduated, increase and in, based on speed limits um, we're open to that compromise we're as mentioned in the original presentation we don't think it's necessary as shown by um, our traffic expert lighting specialist and the fact that there's already a six meter setback from the park line in addition to the regular setbacks off the roadway but if the council so choose and said that would be a fair compromise between industry and the and the uh, sign and uh, sorry and the administration we would accept those recommendations um mr rebecca um I asked a question earlier about the, the transition time, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on this, the question that I had to administration in regards to the one second transition versus no more than one second transition. As mentioned, uh, the technology allows the transition to change, correct? The model that we have today is just under a second and it meets the proposed rules and administration mentioned should be more more than a second and and we can change it to be closer to a second just above a second it could be 1.1 it could be you, technology allows transition to be changed um, our point i guess is that these signs have been in place in alberta for two plus years at this model they work successfully we're not aware of any challenges or safety concerns and the ones in front of in, in the city of calgary today through the appeal board have been operating six months plus as well as McKnight and this model. And again, there'd be no issues um, that we're aware of with the model running today. But it, technology allows it to be changed, correct? Because yeah, I was going to say, I've seen other manufacturers or other uh, companies have transition times associated with some of their, um, their LED displays. 
as opposed to what I saw on the screen here, which was a basically a, like one one hundredth of a second between just between um, different advertisements. So you would not be opposed to having it a minimum of one second. Is that kind of what I understand? Correct. We would not be opposed. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and make that argument later. It isn't one of the proposed amendments that I had. Um, there are some other things in here, I'm, and I'm not sure if you saw the rationale associated with my proposed amendments. Um, uh, Alderman Farrell, myself, and, and Alderman Pincott had a chance to, uh, to speak with administration and some of the traffic engineering folks in regards to why they had incorporated some of the setbacks that they had, uh, field of view, as you heard, uh, intensity and the change in the the per, the, the way that it, that administration will evaluate those based on the cone as you probably saw as opposed to the concentric circle that was originally proposed and and uh, was included in the bylaw changing it from the face of um, and looking at that cone and I don't know if you had a chance to look at that cone before but it um, what I saw from uh, uh, your expert there on the lighting um, from Stantec, she did kind of uh, demonstrate that there would be reduced intensity as you moved outside of that cone. But within that cone, it <coughs> kind of suggested that the intensity was fairly concentrated in those areas as well. So just your thoughts from the lighting perspective on the cone that was presented by administration and how you see that impacting the setbacks. In fact, it's even to more our advantage, we feel this, this measurements that is done by the lighting specialist is done directly on. You have to be driving directly towards the sign. So right off the bat, when you're driving on the roadway and the digital's off setback, six meters, eight meters, 10, 14 meters, you're already away from, you're starting to get away from the 30 degree cone of vision already off the bat. And yes, 30 degrees is the most intense and based on her measurements, it drops off to about, at about 80 meters. At about 80 meters from the sign is when ambient lighting pretty well takes over. Mm. And that the sign, if you, take, if you take a gun to measure it from 80 meters and turn the sign off or on, you get the same measurement because of the ambient lighting in the area. Okay, that's interesting. 80 meters now. I'm not sure if I'd heard that number before, but I appreciate you saying that. Now, ambient light. This is not looking at something that's brighter, such as uh, maybe a full moon. How would that compare to uh, 500 nits out of a sign in comparison uh, with relations to proximity? At what point would a full moon be brighter than the light output of a sign at 500 nits at night? Do you have any kind of comparisons to kind of give me a no. sense of? You know what would be a good comparison, and, and Shaheen would be the best person to answer this, is um, when she measured a sign, she compared it, she, she compared it to North American standards for lighting and compared it to like light standards that the city of Calgary uses, lighting that you do inside um, an exit of a building, for instance, there's certain lighting level requirements. And um, Sheen could probably give you a quick summary as to how this sign light brightness compared to just the normal uh, lighting levels that, are, that the city uses in the surrounding areas. Would that be? Yeah, I mean, a sense of reference. A reference um, in regards to outdoor, I, I mean, indoors is a separate issue. Yeah. If we're talking about a television. I know HDTVs typically put out between 450 and 1,000 nits, depending on the light intensity within the room. They self-adjust, but they don't have to compete with ambient light um, indoors. So if you turn out all the lights on the inside, the screen will drop down to about 450 nits. But with uh, if you open the curtains, you won't be able to see it because it only puts out typically a maximum of 1,000 nits. So hence the reason for 5,000 nits during the day for an outdoor uh, sign. So just a, a sense of you know, putting things into perspective in comparison to other things, if you could give me some comparative analysis on that. Yes, yeah, Shane can talk about uh, things into perspective. other lighting standards that, that the city uses to measure standard lighting okay. outside. Like uh, the lighting level generally, like for pathway, if you're talking about like uh, Trifaro, like East Village, like pathway is like 1.5, 1.8 foot candles. That's the lighting level. Now the digital board study that we did, um, most of the like reading, I can put it again. (coughs) 
So if you can see um, the readings that we took, the maximum that we got was 1.98 uh, foot candles. So if we, if we take typical lighting level for uh, downtown, like I would say it should be like about one foot candle. So the, allowed, the maximum allowed trespass is 0.8 foot candles. So it's additive basically. So one foot candle ambient plus the light trespass through the digital, digital signage, if you put together, it's like 1.8 foot candles. But some places it may be slightly more, 1.2 foot candles plus 0.8. So it's like about two foot candles. So if you look at the lighting levels that we got, it's less than two foot candles, just the lighting level. So how much it would eliminate the ground directly in front of the sign? Again, uh, when we look at the digital signage, um, it depends upon, like, the study that we did, it, it was for the downtown. Now, different criteria would apply if it's, this is for a residential area. That uh, if it's a residential area, then um, the light trespass limit is lower compared to the medium uh, mixed use unit that we used. So it's, it's subjective and it depends where it's being used. Whether it's transmitted light or reflected light, you could still use um, a candle, um, one candelabra or one candle, can, candela uh, measurement, like one candela per, one candela per meter, meter squared, squared That's right. um, as a measurement, whether it's reflected or transmitted. So for an illuminated sign that's lit from um, a standard incandescent light that's reflected off of a, a sign, has there been any kind of measurements done on some of those existing signs? Yes, um, in fact, when we were doing the study, um, we also took a measurement from one of the uh, lighting which was standard conventional. So it's, um, 103, that's what we got instead of 300 and 290. So if you, if you are looking at the conventional board, this is what you would get approximately. Another thing to mention that the readings that you see, it's taken at, as white background, that's the most uh, maximum intensity produced, so we wanted to see the worst case scenario. So all the readings that you see is with the white background of it, digital signage. Oh, so this, uh, not LED billboard that you're referencing, that wasn't necessarily a full white background? Um, it, it, it was partly, like the one which I took. It, it had like some white background and some color as well. 103 nits, is that what I'm reading? That's right, on that? that's what we got. Okay. All right, so, um, interesting. Again, limited to um, limited to, um, in that particular case on, on those kind of signs, on a billboard, the intensity wouldn't vary dif dependent on the angle of view. You wouldn't have that restrictive cone that you would have with an LED. That's correct. It would be same output, yes. wide, wide range, right. as opposed to a very focused output with an LED. That's right. Okay. Thank you, I helps. One more point to notice, uh, though, with the conventional board. Um, conventional board, we have the uh, up lights, so which we generally don't account as an environmental friendly lighting because there's a lot of light spill that goes up. Right. Um, whereas for uh, the digital board, it's mo mostly coming out of it and downwards, so there's nothing going up. No light pollution. <laughs> okay. Um, so. I'm not sure, like I say, if you had had a chance to look at some of these, some of the recommendations included some of the relaxations on, on the regulations. Um, I'm not sure who can comment on all of the <coughs> proposed amendments that uh, um, we were going to put forward and your thoughts on all of these. I don't know if you saw them. There's a, a B, C, D, E, and F, G, H, and I, and J. Um, as part of the recommended amendments. Is there anything in here that you do like other than the 10 second thing, which I know you don't like? Um, is there anything else in here that you think is something that you could work with? 
Uh, Your Worship, through the Chair, uh, probably I'm best to answer that. The uh, short answer, Alderman Chabot, is uh, the amendments that are suggested uh, deal with some textual things which we don't have an issue with. They deal with some other things that the industry doesn't have a problem with. To the areas we're focusing Council on, you've already heard your answer to the graduated setback as per speed, I think, and you got your answer to 10 seconds. The problem with the 300 meters and the problem with the 150 meters, even if you take it from the front, which is a great improvement, I admit, is that it doesn't deal with what you're trying to get at, right. which is light cast and visibility. You've heard evidence of a measurement, for example, it says 80 meters is about where it gets to. Uh, it doesn't allow one to um, deal with the situation that you're dealing with, where the sign is, where it's pointed, and so forth. So the problem with that amendment uh, that you've made Yes. is that it's good when it says front of the sign. Yes. We agree with that. Uh, changes residential area, which is the bylaw now, to dwelling unit, that's fine. <coughs> but what we'd like it to do is to recognize that there's a lot of situational issues to deal with there. With it, nobody here has a problem with not shining a light into a residential dwelling unit. Hmm. So it's a good start from the point from the front. It's good that the recommendation is to be relaxable. Uh, trying to relax that kind of rule at STAB is difficult if it's ironclad, like prohibited. Mm. Uh, so there's a bit of a wording issue. So that'll take care of that one. The class E sign and the class uh, F sign spacing, we've already talked about that, and I don't think you addressed that. And land use districts, uh, I don't know that we're, those were addressed in your amendment. I didn't see them. Uh, that's a different issue entirely. So the bottom line is, uh, with respect to the amendment, the uh, the change to say any rules are relaxable is welcome. The separation from property line is welcome, graduated on speed. The measurement of uh, effect of a residential dwelling unit from the face of sign is welcome. Uh, but we'd like a little more tuning up done based on what you've heard today. On, on the proximity. So you're saying the 80 meter uh, measurement would be something that you would be more inclined to support as opposed to yeah. 150 or 300? Yes, Your Worship. Okay. Actually, I have no further questions at this point, but certainly have lots to debate further. I, I, I'm a bit shocked, Alderman Chabot. I was all settling in for the lunch break. Thank you very much. Alderman Pincott. Um, thank you. Uh, a lot of my questions were around lighting and, and the, real, the real impact on lighting and uh, on the light output of these things. And, and you've done a lot of work to try and get us to understand that, and I appreciate that. Um, when we take a look at your your illustration of essentially the, the, the drop off as we go off from the viewing angle, um, did you do, calculate that in, as a percentage? What kind of drop off at 30 percent, 70 percent, at 70 degrees, 30 degrees? Um. Or, is, or do we just have it as just a straight measurements? No, this measurement actually comes from the manufacturer of okay. the LED, uh, LED whoever manufactures the digital. So we got it from them, okay. but we didn't take it the way it is. We actually did measurement at site, yeah. um, so which was very close to what they have indicated. Okay, and when you look at the IESNA guidelines, when we when we take a look at the say the the guidelines for uh, um, ambient uh, street light street level um, intensity required for safety on a sidewalk, um, say for you know a pedestrian, what's the the minimum level of foot candles that we need on a sidewalk for nighttime safety? Now, when we d define like sidewalk safety, there are areas that could be defined. The right. area, there could be area that is safe and would require lower foot candles. Right. And there could be area which requires high security. So I mean, I, if, if talking about high security, um, the requirement is about 1.5 foot candles. 1.5. That's right. Okay. But there are areas where we have done design which also d deals with 0.5 foot candles because that's not a very um, security concern area. Okay, so kind of point 0.5 is, is the point. So if I go back, then, if I go then to your table that is measuring, that where you were measuring foot candles away from the sign, um, uh, when we're taking a look then, say 0.5 foot candles as kind of a nighttime ambient light level from, a, from IESNA guidelines for safety. That's right. Uh, 
the majority of these, except for the ones that are in yellow, which you've uh, are below that level, right? That's right. And the ones in yellow are measurements that were taken as you moved away that you ended up being close to a, a, a street light? That's right. The, um, the, wherever it's highlighted as yellow, um, there was a lighting standard very near to where we were taking the measurement. Okay. That's why we've highlighted, highlighted it separately. Okay. Um, and then the ones that are NA, is that because there was, I don't know, a building or something yes, in the way? Yes, there was a building. It was falling inside. Some of the points were falling inside uh, the building, and some points it was not safe to take because it was a highway. Okay. So we had just left those and, points. And your furthest away measurement, you did this in 100-foot increments, so your furthest away was 300 feet, so... That's correct. To, to round up into meters, 100 meters max. Yep. Uh, was the furthest you were away. And in... Almost all locations, except for straight on, if you held your hand up, you wouldn't actually see a shadow because you are below ambient light levels. And also the readings that we took, just to mention to the council, um, the reading that we took was at eye level, looking straight on to the board as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. I just I want to clarify that just so that we understand what the real lighting impacts are of these on the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Pincott. Alderman Marr. Oh, is it popped in? Thank you, Worship. I do have a couple of quick questions relating to some of the guidelines and the impacts that it's going to have. Now, I understand that the, the six second rule versus the 10 second rule. What currently is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what currently is allowed with the, um, the flippy ones is, is six seconds, is that right? So you're, or is it 10 seconds? Uh, currently, and actually I'm gonna show it visually. Um, currently right now, again, there's no limitations on these mechanical trio signs. They're what we call them trios, trios or trilateral. Okay. They're on, a, they're on a prism and we'll play one now. I actually like flippy better, but. Big and white, can you? Can you go to the full screen as well? So there it is, the one on the left. If you count, if you want to start manually counting, it, it's, the ad stays up for about three seconds, three to four seconds. Mm -hmm. And then there's a physical motion, which is another two seconds plus. So you get to be like five, six seconds with the ad and the motion. Mm -hmm. And then we've compared it to our digital six second model to the right. Okay. And you can see the difference of the physical motion and, and the ad face. And, and as we introduced this product a year and a half ago, we met with the administration, we talked about uh, this is just the natural step, evolution of our billboard. The, the mechanical tree on the left was also received trepidation by the city 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. it's, this, that sign on the left has been around for 20 years across North America. Three advertisers, can you restart, restart again? Uh, three advertisers. And basically, we think, this, we think the sign to the left is just a natural, on the right, sorry, is a natural evolution of the mechanical to the digital, mm -hmm. still displaying a static message. And in fact, the duration is even longer on the street, six seconds, as you heard earlier, uh, the longer the better. And um, at the same time, they've been around for a number of years, successfully. No, and I appreciate that. So the sign on the left, the, uh, the trilateral sign, now that is also illuminated at night, is it not? Correct. It's a, but it's it's externally lit. So there's a physical light at the bottom. You can right. can't really see it. A single light that shines upward to shine the face is lit at night. Correct. Okay. So there's there's less light pollution as a result of, of it being externally lit, shining up onto onto the. Yes, uh, as as shown the by the, the resident expert here, there's more. It's more advantageous for the digital sign because the light is contained and focused mm -hmm. in the in the lines and forms the build of, of the sign and it shines downward as opposed to the practice for years and years, which is lighting on the bottom to shine upward. Right, okay. Now, our, our, on the sky, I, the I sky. appreciated the comment that um, Alderman Chabot met about when the, oh, stop now, could you redo it again? So when it, when it starts to change, the sign on the left, when it starts to change and it's almost like a, a page turning rather than something that's just instantaneously changing the image. Yes. So, but uh, you're saying that takes about a second for that to ha for, for that to occur? Longer. Oh, okay, two seconds then. Okay. So, and if the and if the image stays for how many seconds here, and then two seconds, 
of, of changing. So just kind of, it takes three to four seconds actually for that for that physical motion to go through. Okay. And then once the ad is up, once the motion stopped, yes. the ad is up for like three seconds, three to four seconds max. Okay, so the continuity is basically just really the, the, the advance in technology, the evolution of the sign to be able to suddenly have a digital image which you can transfer much more yeah, rapidly. Instead of, instead more exposure instead of, to the... Correct, instead of physically taking three seconds okay. plus to have it physically done, it can now, through electronic, electronic digital, be done in second. Okay. What struck me as interesting is that as a result of this, you were able to add on um, public service messaging. The six-second model, six model is important to us for two reasons. One, as mentioned, it's been around for years. These signs are not, uh, they're costly, bottom line. And the, the economic model allows us, six seconds allows us two things. One, and most importantly, small businesses to afford it. Mm -hmm. It keeps the cost down so that small businesses are buying these advertisements and can compete against box stores, national chains. Secondly, um, the model allows us to donate one spot. It's a, it's a 10, 10 message model, 10 six second messages. So we donate 10% of the sign to nonprofit. That's and something charity. you're doing now. It's not something you're proposing. It's something that you're actually doing. Yeah, we've done it. Yeah, it's something we do now. It was, it's not part of the bylaw. It's not a requirement. It's a mandate of our company. We, as mentioned the, by, by Doug, our first presenter, we've been doing business here for 80 plus years. Mm -hmm. And it's a mandate from our ownership to give back to the community that we live in and do business with. So it was made clear from day one when we introduced these signs from our head up ownership is that we donate one spot to, for, for nonprofit and charity. And that, sign, that spot remains 24 seven throughout the year regardless if we have a queue for advertisers who want to take that spot, regardless if we can sell it more. Um, so that one out of 10 spots, 10% 10 of the sign goes to that. Okay. And the letters are in your package. Now, I've, I've been looking through this, this book that you'd sent us, or that, sorry, that you've distributed to us with um, some of the sign locations. I know you can't see it from there. Uh, with the, the 300 meter radius. Now, some of the signs that, that are indicated here are on major roads like 9th Avenue. Um, but that if this prohibition comes in to effect, it essentially would eliminate the ability to use these digital signs, but not necessarily the, the existing signs that are already in place. Correct. So just so, it would prevent the implementation of this new new type of sign. Yeah, correct. We have one on yeah, Ninth Avenue is in your package across from the Greyhound Bus Depot as you come yeah. into the core. Yeah, Trail. Yeah, so right uh, now that sign used to be the one on the left, the trio. There oh, was yes. was existing billboard there for years on a CP railway right away. We went to the city and asked to change the two from, from mechanical to digital. Mm -hmm. It was refused. The appeal board heard our presentation and felt it was acceptable based on the numerous conditions that was put in place. A lot of it is in today in the rules that are being proposed in front of council. Okay. So notwithstanding the fact that it went through SDAB, if uh, actually there's probably more an administrative question. Maybe I'll, I'll hold that one. Um, the other thing that was interesting to me is, and actually Alderman Hodges mentioned it was um, the concept of uh, he, he actually said something about amber and that triggered something in my head about amber alerts are you do you know what an amber alert is we, we know it very well and as part of our presentation actually when we met the administration a year and a half ago is that our vision was that one day if there's a handful of these signs the network could be available to emergency departments such as the police to use it for amber alert it's already used in the u.s extensively mm -hmm. so when That's there is an amber alert um, they have access to the signs and they have a they have passwords and codes and templates they can get into the system and put up an amber alert um, immediately using the network of signs and that's and something that you would actually support we'd be th we'd be thrilled if we can make that work with one of the city departments here yes we of course we would support it okay that's we that I mean we do it now with our regular billboards it's just that it takes a while right I mean not sorry not for amber alert but for lost missing persons for that kind of thing that we've put right our, but that of course takes a few weeks to put it up no no Obviously, Amber Alert, you need it immediately. It's electronic, of course. Yeah, I've and seen that happen in the United States, actually. That's, uh, yes, and we would propose that. Again, it wouldn't be a bylaw thing, but it would be part of our proposal, yes. Okay. Um, a, a lot of these really technical issues with regards to the lighting and so on and so forth, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask uh, questions of administration as well. But um, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm seeing is, is that uh, I understand that this is, is – a, a technological advance and as a result um, it, it's it is interesting uh, certainly and it has uh, 
there is trepidation, certainly from our administration and people that, that, that are believing that this will have a, a major impact on, on the visual light pollution. And that's concerning to, to us as a municipality and certainly to, to the different ward aldermen. But um, it, some of the comments that you're saying with prohibition of the 300 meters, which would effectively eliminate a lot of these major roadways. I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy towards that in, in understanding that that has a, uh, uh, an impact on, on being able to deliver this. So you've answered my questions with regards to the 10 seconds and the sec six seconds, and also your ability to, um, to provide an Amber Alert, which I think is interesting. And um, thank you very much for your presentations. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Marr. Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, of all the interesting issues, I'd like to dig a little deeper into 300 meters again. I'm not sure who to address. Uh, following on Alderman Jones' questions, um, you have, I'm trying to read the, the paid tab four from your booklet and combined with the material we've just been given. It seems uh, industry is recommending that we delete the recommendation establishing the 300 meter rule. It seems fairly clear. Do you have, um, where to start? Do you have a recommendation of what the appropriate distance should be? Is there any other issues? Of um, the recommendation, if, if, if it wasn't for just straight deletion, because as mentioned earlier, we feel that the bylaw addresses it today with protecting residential, and it's very clear in the bylaw today that these signs cannot um, impact a negative, negatively on residential. But if, I wanted to, if you wanted me to throw something out and suggest a compromise, it would probably be 100 meters. So I'd take it, we say in 80 now, you've heard from the lighting expert, but 100 meters from, from the cone, 30 degree cone of front of the sign, unobstructed. So if you, so if you wanna take a measurement and you wanna do 100 meters from the front of the sign in that major 30 degree portion, which is where the, the sign is intense and effective, that would be like dread, dread on, and you go 100 meters from that middle point and, uh, and separate it from that, from that point, that would be a fair compromise. Thank you, and also, I'm not sure it's been brought up, but what about behind the sign? Um, are there any matters, that, uh, should there be a distance that's appropriate for technical reasons, some sort of radio frequency or electromagnetic radiation? Do you have any suggestions as to what the distance should be? Should we be putting them 10 feet outside a window of a multi-unit development, for instance? Yeah. Uh, actually, no, there's no, no impact or fear whatsoever from an electronically, electronic point of view uh, for, for this sign. It's, a, it's like a television. This is LED technology. You can stand behind your TV, no impact. Your kid, you could have having dinner behind your TV, no impact. Same, same philosophy here. Um, as for lighting, um, as shown by the lighting expert, uh, again, like LED TV, if you stand at an angle looking at your TV, you can't make out the image, you can't see it, you can barely see any light coming from it. So um, as, as shown, there's no lighting concerns whatsoever behind the sign. The sign, barely, the sign barely bleeds any light on the edges of the sign in front, and from behind, it's 0%. 100% no lighting bleeds behind the sign. So no requirement there for separation. Thank you, just as a matter of curiosity then, what is industry practice in terms of billboards and, and residential windows at this state? Was there a normal protocol or industry standard? Uh, normal protocol today is, is one, we're not allowed in residential districts, that's very clear. Secondly, in the bylaw it states that uh, lighting orientation of a sign cannot negatively impact residential. So, so that's a very black and white very clear statement in the bylaw today. So a single condo tower would constitute a residential district. The zoning is such that that you would be prohibited from locating even off, even in a say a neighboring zone <laughs> land use that would perhaps permit you to be there. Uh, the, the condo tower is interesting because downtown is is a mixed use area. So you could, it's not uncommon to see a condo tower zoned to allow these type of signs nearby. Like the condo towers. People living in downtown accept the fact that they're in, that they live in a mixed use of commercial, bright signs, lit signs, r railway, uh, railway tracks, um, heavier traffic, heavier pedestrian volumes, et cetera, et cetera. So the way the bylaws right now is separation from residential district, but from a condominium, if that's a residential district, then the answer to your question is yes. But in downtown, it could be also zoned commercial if you understand the downtown yeah, so sorry, I'm, I know I'm slightly off topic here, but then what the, would the distance be from the back of one of these signs to the nearest window? The back, uh, 
again, as, as long as the sign, as mentioned, my compromise, as long as the sign orientation and facing is not facing into the condo, uh, the back should be no issue. If, the sign, if, if we back onto the wall of a condominium tower against the concrete wall of a condominium tower, and we back right onto it, but the sign is facing forward and is not visible, um, that's been done with existing billboards today. We see no difference for a digital billboard to be backing onto a property, as long as it's zoned in commercial, as long as the sign is zoned, allows for it to be zoned there, commercial industrial, and does not impact residential in front of the sign, uh, we see no issue. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Putman. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Uh, I have a number of questions and I likely go over, so I'll just stop when noon comes. Um, I'm sorry, Shaheen, Shaheen, what's your last name? Machivana. Machivana? Hi, Ms. Machivana. Did you do the Langevin Bridge? You did, yes. Congratulations on that. It looks great. When the Langevin Bridge was first lit, there was um, fairly rapid changeover of color, and we realized fairly early on that it was distracting to drivers and people were actually going through the traffic lights. So we, we toned it down quite a bit. Um, at what point do we know that something becomes a distraction and, and then uh, make a quick change? I think the concern that I see is the technology is fairly new. Um, it's certainly new to Calgary and um, safety for drivers is paramount and comfort for um, our residents is also paramount. So at what point do we know when we're creating a driving distraction and are able to adjust or, um, or creating a, a distraction for our residents. When it, I agree with you that initially when um, the Langen Bridge was first installed because it came as pre-programmed to meet the schedule, so there was some flashing which we said this is not acceptable and it has to be changed. Um, for now what it is, it's like 60 seconds transitions we have given and there is no uh, flashing or sudden change it's all um, like it's seamless transition so that way uh, whoever is driving or whoever is living in the nearby residential area is not disturbed by the lighting um, the idea here is that person should enjoy being in the environment rather than getting you know disturbed or causing safety concern so that has been fixed but yes we had put it we had changed that from two seconds to 60 seconds and it works fine Okay, thank you, I would agree. Now, um, my concern, um, aside from the distracted driver, because I, when I was taught to drive, I was told, drive when you're driving. And now I think there's, there's sort of a general um, thought that you can do all sorts of other things while you're driving. So, so um, in the interim of, of permanent rules, we need to know when these things are distracting. They're, they're meant to distract to a certain point. And how much, is, how much distraction is reasonable? And I'm not sure if we know the answer to, the, to that because the response I'm hearing is any studies are inconclusive. So, um, but I think that's the whole point of having interim measures is we can continue to, to study it further. So, um, as far as whomever wants to answer that is fine. And I'm not sure if we want to have that answered afternoon. Three minutes. So we are proceeding with the answers. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll I'll clarify that some a number of cities across North America, very large cities, have banned these things outright. Uh, why? And, and is distracted driving one of the reasons? Uh, our, our evidence is the contrary, and that's why we presented in the package, and you can see that 40 states allow these signs, a substantial number of states, a number of cities. Um, and a lot of cities that, that we found that were banned already banned billboards in general. So they've already just taken it the natural step. They already don't allow billboards, so of course they're not gonna allow digital as well too. Um, no, we're not aware, and if those cities that may have banned digital, we're not aware of any city that has banned a digital billboard because of a safety or distraction concern. Okay. 
the challenge, and I'll let Bruce follow up as well, that there's numerous distractions, both inside the vehicle and outside the vehicle. Too many in my view. There's, there's a lot, agreed. And, and that's why the studies have probably found them to be inconclusive. The studies have come back and say, they're, they're safety neutral. There's no different than a standard billboard, no different than in a Tim Hortons ID sign, no different than a city sign that says 300 meter exit for, for Barlow Trail. Um, and other studies have shown, uh, and then of course there's numerous distractions inside the vehicle. And, and of course some jurisdictions, as, as Alberta done as well, is, is the cellular phone, of course, and, and it's come before you now before. So in answer to your question, no, there's, the distraction has not been shown conclusively to be for, for a billboard, whether it's static, whether, regular, whether conventional or digital. Video, yes, there have been studies to show the video motion. Mm -hmm. uh, a study was done by, by a lady uh, for Toronto, actually, um, half a dozen billboards, one of the studies we presented to uh, administration, and they came back and concluded that, yes, the video motion garnered more intention, uh, but that's never been our desire. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a big difference between residential and dwelling unit. And I believe Alderman Putman's asked that question. But it's, we're differentiating between the, um, the right to um, live without light trespass for multifamily and residential districts, which are single family. And I think that is a pretty important to clarify. I have a lot of concerned people who um, we've got we've got corridor studies throughout the city where we're trying to encourage people to move into multifamily, and somehow we think that their right to peace and quiet and and those things are, are different than the rights of those in single family. And I have an objection to that. But multifamily, 16th Avenue, for example, we spend a lot of energy, fair amount of money, uh, changing the zoning and and the feel of 16th Avenue to encourage multifamily. And, and so are you suggesting that the distance should be different for, should there, we allow one of these units across the street or even right next door facing a multifamily dwelling unit? No, we would not support that. So how can we differentiate in the bylaw that that's not what you intend? Because in the bylaw what we're proposing is your, your scenario you just described as a sign orientated and facing residential, so it would have an impact. A, a dwelling unit. Yeah, a dwelling unit. And, and we're, what, our, what we disagree with is they've, they've gone the extreme approach. So keep in mind, in summary, uh, the, these, anything we discussed today, these are all interim rules. So we are going to be sitting down with the industry, as you know, over the next 12 months. And our concern is they've taken the very extreme approach of 300 meters from a building containing a dwelling unit. So we could be, so, and as we use examples throughout our presentation was, if the sign is not visible, mm -hmm. and topography blocks the sign, so we could be lower and, and or the residential could be lower below the grade. Um, if, it's not vis if it's not visible, then why is the city being, if you will, handicapped with that straight 300 meters with no sense of discretion, no sense of even allowing to be relaxed? They've made it very clear. So if, so, if, so if we're along 16th Avenue, and 16th Avenue multifamily tend to be just up behind, there's usually commercial on both sides of 16th Avenue, in my experience. Well, but 16th Avenue has been completely rezoned to encourage fairly significant zoning. It was part of the whole, it, it predates Planet, but it, it led to the, our contemporary view of, a, of an urban corridor, where all of 16th Avenue is is high density residential? It's, 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 well, it's, it's voted case by case. They looked at it case by case, but it's very simple for us. If the sign is on 16th Avenue that we're proposing and it faces into residential, the, the, the current bylaw does not allow it and we, and we would not allow it. You're saying how to protect that? My, my suggestion was take a measurement from the front of the sign go 100 meters, if there's no residential within 100 meters. And you're, by residential, you're talking about dwelling units. By dwelling unit, sorry, dwelling. yeah. If there's a dwelling unit within 100 meters from the front of the sign, unobstructed, then the, the billboard should not be allowed. Okay, all right. All right I folks, have a couple of other We're going to stop there. Uh, lunch break, lunch break. We'll be back at 120, Alderman Farrell, you'll still have the floor, all right?
All right, we're back in session. What's this one? Oh. What's this one? I don't know how. Okay, thank you. I think I'm down to one more question. Um, we often, oh, I'll wait till they're, not even there. they're coming. This is a quick one. Quick one. We hear quite a bit about Times Square, and and um, I'm not sure the square in Toronto where they've they've got. Um, pardon me, Dundas. Dundas Square. So I know we've been talking. Um, part of the Centre City team has been talking about changing the rules to allow a concentrated area of the downtown um, where we would relax our sign bylaw within certain parameters. So are you working with administration on that? Um, today, no. Um, the first step is set a set of girls, rules and guidelines that both administration and industry can work with for just the present rules for digital, which are static. And I, I think that we're referring to the Dundas's and Times Square's of the world as a different animal together. They're bigger signs, they're more video, mm -hmm. uh, motion, if you will. I heard it brought up by yeah. Alderman Lowe, so I, I don't want to confuse well, the matter. I, I, that, yeah, one day that may come up, but as of today, no. There's no talk of it. There's no designated area. It would require a lot of stakeholders, mm -hmm. landlords, downtown business association, those kind of things, and um, and I could that would be down the road. Okay. Right, nothing right now. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. <laughs> we'll let Alderman Demong get back to his seat. And there we go, Alderman Demong. Okay, and, and I realize it's uh, my uh, somewhat ignorance with regards to nits versus illuminated and illumination. Can you give me a some type of reference between one of the old style billboard uh, where we shone a big bright spotlight on the billboard, how that uh, compares to the uh, 5,000 slash 200 nits that you're offering as the digital video? Yeah, I'll refer to our lighting specialist. It's, it's 5,000 nits during the day and 500 at night okay. are the maximum levels allowed. Um, if you don't mind, be able to answer. For conventional um, bill, uh, billboards, it would be less, much less compared to digital uh, because there is no dimming in case of like there, it's not bumped up during the daytime. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you may correct. No, that, that's correct. It's okay. uh, it is the lighting is not made to be possibly lower or higher intensity. It's just a straight Hall of Fame bulb. Yeah. No, I realize that, and I'm just trying to. I in in my own mind, I'm trying to envision whether whether the brightness. I realize during the day it's not going to make a lot of difference, but at nighttime, is it going to make a lot of difference between the 500 nits that you're allowed and the Brian, I'm looking for help, and the and the lumin luminance of the just spotlighted standard billboard that we're all accustomed to. If you're comparing the digital with the conventional, yes, there is a difference. Um, the digital uh, is much more brighter compared to the conventional billboard. Okay, that pretty much answers that. Now, I was just curious. Um, you guys had two different uh, displays going with regards to the changing of the. Uh, on, on your DV, on your digitals, the first one that was going through near, I'm not sure where it was, and then the second one where you had them side by side. Was there a difference in the time frame in the changing of the uh, pictures between those two? Yes, yes, there is a substantial difference, and that's why we believe the digital is a marked improvement. Nope. Just oh. so that you, I'm clear, the, the original digital that you showed us oh, sorry. Yes. versus the second digital that you showed us, uh, no, ignoring the phased one, yeah. was there a difference, like was one a 0.2 second change and the, first, and the second one was a 0.8 second change or anything like that or was, did you guys make note of it at all? 
No, we didn't make note. Um, but my understanding is all the signs we've ordered are on the same model and transition time. So that one sign that showed side by side was in Edmonton. Okay. Digital. And the very first one we showed, that's the McKnight Boulevard that we're showing, mm -hmm. um, should be operating on the same principle. They were operating on the same, same principle, principle because it almost is, seemed like there was a difference in, to my eye. That, yeah. that one seemed to be doing a much quicker change than the other one. Um, optics? Could be, yes. Uh, and, and maybe one is off a, a bit. I, we can okay. be checked, but no, I don't have that answer because there are two different signs, two different cities installed at two different times. Uh, my understanding, though, is that they're supposed to be running the same model. Okay. regardless of where they are and when they're ordered. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, if I may add, that McKnight sign is six seconds. We've, we've checked and rechecked, so that, that no, is... No, I meant the transition right. time between the changing of oh, the pictures. No, they, should be, they should be the same. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Nice and easy. Thanks, Alderman DeWong. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> uh, you presently have two signs that are on airport property. Is that right? One on Barlow and one on, on uh, Airport Trail? For digital, correct, yeah. We have numerous signs, or a number of signs, on, on airport, airport lands, but two, only two signs, correct, one on Airport Trail and one at Barlow Trail and Airport Road, the entrance into the airport, um, are two locations that have digital billboards. So neither one of them will, if this goes through, neither one of those will be able to stay then? Um, that, the regulations that the city, their portfolios are a little bit different. Um, those have permits, so those were um, applied to the Calgary Airport Authority. They have their own land use agreement with the city, as you're probably aware of. And, um, and so then we got directed by the airport, we applied to the city, and the city gave us a permit uh, based on the airport's uh, recommendation of where they went. And so, they, so this would not be, so to answer your question, the bylaw today, whatever is passed today, would not impact those signs uh, now or later? No, I can understand the one at Barlow Trail and uh, Airport uh, Road because that's on, it's not facing a city street, but the one that's on, uh, on Airport Trail or 96th, you know, it says in here that uh, they'll be banned from 96th Avenue at Harvest Hills over to Barlow Trail. Well, that would take that one in, wouldn't it? Um, in this case, it doesn't because it's on airport lands and has a separate land use agreement. So all other, all other lands outside of airport lands would meet that rule, which is correct. They'd be banned. So right now, airport trail, uh, we cannot build on the north side of airport trail. Okay. They're, all, they're all private lands and they don't meet the bylaw. On the south side, because of the separate land use agreement, the airport is allowed uh, to work with the city and the industry to put signs up. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Stevenson. Folks? I think we're done with you for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're still in the public hearing though, so is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition to this? Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? There is one person who... Uh, uh, no, we're in opposition. There was no one who spoke in favor. Yeah. So Sorry? I'm, I'm just going to leave something here. There's one person who cannot, who's in favor of our position, Your Worship and members of council. She was unable to stay for the afternoon session, so I have 35 copies of her presentation. She's with the Downtown Business Association. We can distribute those. Thank you. Thank you. Your Worship, members of Council, my name is Owen Craig. I'm with Beltline Planning Group, representing Beltline Communities of Victoria and Connaught. Um, I would like to uh, submit a letter and a brief synopsis of a survey that we've conducted relevant to the topic at hand. Okay, please distribute those. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to use and be upfront and indicate that I'd like to use an overarching broad description of our stance on digital and billboard vehicular scaled third party advertising and then drill down on the details and land on the uh, issues at hand for the amendment proposed. If you'll allow me that indulgence, I'd like to do that. I will read from the letter that I prepared. Beltline Planning Group reflects Beltline community's best understanding of the majority perspective on billboards. This view is garnered from 10 years of experience of community support to eliminate vehicular scaled third party advertising in our district. Beltline Communities has deployed a survey to confirm and demonstrate the validity of BPG's position to date, we have received 149 respondents, 
Preliminary results indicate overwhelming response in agreement that billboards, digital or otherwise, have no place in proximity to residential use and dwelling units in the Beltline. Beltline Communities encourages the City of Calgary to ban all vehicular scaled third party commercial advertising, billboards, or what's typically considered as billboards, within the Beltline Community District. Um, and I'd like to be very clear, we're focusing on the vehicular scale digital billboard scenario and billboard scenario uh, and not the kiosk or smaller personal business oriented signs. As our community uh, continues to rapidly mature and become more residentially mixed use throughout the deployment of these signs runs counter to the emphasis placed on creating vibrant pedestrian scaled environments in the blueprint for the Beltline, Beltline ARP and city centre or centre city land use district. Distracting light pollution emitted from these signs has the potential to significantly impact adjacent residents. For example, one is we've all experienced the lovely scenario of being in our living room with an over-aggressive channel surfer and how frustrating that can be. Uh, now if you take that and uh, magnify it on a scale of 10 and place it outside a condominium that may have 230 units at 1.5 people per unit, that works out to be about um, 400 to 500 residents fairly easily. Uh, that can be uh, exponentially more frustrating. Uh, and now imagine a single family home or dwelling that has a sign affects one or two or three, four people on a street. Uh, you put that in the belt line, it can very easily if, uh, impact uh, 500 to 1,000 people with one sign, regardless of illumination. Uh, further, vehicular scaled digital signs of a size or placement intended to attract the attention of drivers are wholly unacceptable. Beltline has no interest in discussion of a regulatory condition to deploy vehicular scale digital billboards in our community district. They are entirely unacceptable. By their very nature, they are designed to capture attention. They would not be utilized by any industry if that was not the case. Um, despite the fact that the science is not there, I think we all have common sense enough to know that uh, there is an added distraction to the drivers. Um, and uh, what is the tipping point between cell phones, kids in the back, and uh, traffic signs with respect to digital signs. Um, and what I'd like to do now is just indicate that uh, while our stance is uh, to not support the amendment simply because it's a third party amendment for third party advertising uh, of a vehicular scale in nature, I want to emphasize that our concern is we are striving very diligently to create fantastic and uh, appropriately scaled pedestrian environments in the Beltline and the center city. Uh, we think that these types of signs uh, are appropriate for motor vehicle use and not for uh, areas that are developing and burgeoning pedestrian environments. Uh, Beltline is not opposed to third party advertising in general, rather we oppose vehicular oriented billboards uh, scaled for commercial advertising, digital or otherwise. Simply put, they are a blight on our high density pedestrian oriented urban district. Um, if I may, uh, I'd just like to share with you a couple sound bites from the survey that we've received uh, and been delivering. We had 149 people respond to the survey. 70 lived in the Beltline, 79 lived outside of the Beltline. 30% of respondents, 21 individuals who live in the Beltline, said they could see a billboard from where they live. Only 7.5% of respondents indicated that they could see a billboard from where they live. And this is uh, leading to the question of digital sign proliferation and billboard proliferation in general. Uh, our aspects that we think that are inappropriate for the current amendment are the uh, seeking of a relaxation from the 300 meter proximity rule to dwelling units to 150 meters. Uh, regardless of whether you can see the sign or not, the signs have a psychological and pedestrian scale impact on neighborhoods that we think are inappropriate for areas that we are trying to strive to create value uh, or high quality pedestrian scale environments. Uh, we think it's high time that the Beltline, as it matures, uh, can evolve such that it, we can push those signs to other areas. Um, a couple sound bites. Um, I do, of course, appreciate the signage that identifies a store, business, or medical office. The billboards, however, are an eyesore and a safety hazard. This is specifically with respect to digital billboards. Depending on and with ever-changing content and design, they also alter the whole appearance of the community in an ever new way in a negative way. There are architectural guidelines for new buildings which are negatively, which are negatively affected by the billboards. Uh, this, this is a community, every day it's stronger and stronger, but billboards definitely detract and wouldn't be permitted in other communities. Uh, third sound bite, and this will be the last one on digital billboards. Billboards are the wrong scale of public advertising. Either smaller scaled advertisements or better designed advertisements should be encouraged. 
And with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation and willing to accept comments and questions from Council. Thanks, Mr. Cray. Alderman Marr. Thank you, uh, and thank you for being so patient this morning, Mr. Craig. I know, sorry, this afternoon. I know that the, these can take some time. So uh, today, the overall discussion is really more centered around digital versus non-digital signage, not necessarily where it should be in, in terms of the district, but really more the digital versus non-digital debate. But I appreciate your, your comments. I do have a couple of follow-up questions. In your presentation a moment ago, you had suggested that the Beltline Community Association would be opposed to automobile scaled signage. So the standard, um, what is it, 10, 10 feet by 20 feet? 10 feet by 20 signage in the Beltline district as a whole, whether or not it is a static um, paper sign or those um, flicky triangular ones or digital. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay, so regardless of the type of sign, whether it's digital or not digital right now, you're really just saying that in your particular area in the Beltline, because of the density and because of the, um, the impact that it has visually on multifamily residents, regardless of the type of it, you're, you're, you're in opposition. Uh, correct, uh, although I tried to tie it back to specifics related to digital signs, but yes. Right. It's the overarching principle. The overarching principle, and, and that was my comment. And just again, because this is specifically about digital, I just wanted to remind you of that and, and uh, get your comments. So thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Alderman Mar. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I heard your name a few times, but I still didn't get it. It's Owen Craig. Craig. So Craig being the last name. Uh, correct, yes. I've had that problem with grade school teachers all the way up to apparently aldermen now, yes. But you, ha you have it. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, I think you told me that once personally. Um, Mr. Craig, um, so the existing billboards, you're not overly happy with those either? Uh, correct. We're not enthusiastic about them. Um, we're in a position where the Beltline is maturing far faster than the, uh, uh, the bylaw can to uh, help um, provide more appropriate guidelines for dwelling units in proximity to these types, these types of signs. So if they're illuminated, it poses a similar challenge to what the digital signs could potentially Correct. pose. Correct, yeah. Okay. The, um, you uh, made reference to the over-anxious uh, or over-exuberant um, channel changer, and, but what's being proposed here is a, is a static display with uh, potentially six second intervals. Um, what's proposed is 10 second intervals. I, I wouldn't really associate that with a with full motion video and an exuberant channel changer. I think that might be a little extreme, wouldn't you say? Um, well, depending on how fast you change channels, it looks pretty static to me if you catch one frame per second. But uh, I, the illustration is the simple example of you have an illuminated object outside of a dwelling unit's window that affects a large number of people, and they're not in control of what's being shown. Um, and they look out their window at any point in the day and, and have no recourse or ability to adjust to that. Um, so we think that there are some parallels. Uh, while they may not be exactly direct, I think the analogy is still valid. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, human-scale pedestrian type of uh, development. Uh, so are you, um, by virtue of saying that, arguing that there is no pedestrian functionality associated with these, what you call uh, automobile-oriented type billboards? Uh, the signage is developed by industry to be deployed at uh, high-capacity vehicle thoroughfares. Um, their size, proximity, density, and scale of advertising type font and the approach that they use for the copy is specifically targeted towards uh, vehicles um, and not pedestrians, and I think that we'd be fooling ourselves to think otherwise. Um, our, our issue at hand with those is that while we don't reject advertising that's of the pedestrian scale that's been designed for people to see on the sidewalk, we think that our neighborhoods have matured, especially the Beltline, so that the, uh, the motor vehicle is no longer the predominant advertising demographic. Well, I, I guess it's a matter of opinion because I would argue that I, I see these billboards a lot more when I'm walking than I do when I'm driving, but that's me personally. 
Anyways, I appreciate your presentation here today and voicing the opinion of your community. Thank you. Thank you. If I might, okay. uh, Your Worship, just ahead, respond Mr. to that Craig. last component. Uh, the mere fact that you can actually notice them more as you're a pedestrian is, in fact, the, the, the uh, gem at the heart of the discussion, and that's the problem that we do have as the Beltline is. As people slow down and walk, uh, it's not only uh, something that impacts driver safety and illumination and light pollution, it's something that impacts the pedestrian realm. So that's a, a very good example of our argument. Thanks, Mr. Craig. Alderman Farrell? Thank you for being here today, Mr. Craig. Um, so you see a difference between the Beltline and McLeod Trail, for example? Uh, yes, we do. Okay. Now, the Beltline, I'm, I'd be very surprised if your ARP doesn't have some restrictions around auto-oriented signage. Uh, it does, yes. It does. Yeah. So you're worried about the, um, the migration of existing billboard signage to digital? or proliferation. I don't think with these rules we would allow additional, but maybe that's something to be clarified. We're concerned about, I think one very importantly, yes, the proliferation, the conversion of existing signs to digital. Uh, we're concerned about uh, as our community matures and residential and dwelling projects are brought online in different parts of the Beltline, um, the ability to um, uh, for the bylaw to keep pace with this uh, is problematic. And so the specific uh, amendment today on the table that we're pr particularly objected to or objecting to is the, uh, the relaxation or relaxable requirement of the proximity to dwelling units. Um, we don't think that uh, line of sight is a necessary criteria, although it's a completely uh, or more objectable than not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a concept of proliferation throughout the neighborhood and pedestrian scale environments as well as driver distraction. Um, so the uh, 300 meter relaxation and relaxable in nature and then also the differentiation between the Beltline as a residential and uh, mixed use uh, dwelling based community versus uh, your typical suburban residential environment. Uh, we don't think that there should be a distinction made based on density and in fact the opposite distinction should be made because you have more people hovering over those signs than you do in a residential suburban community. Well and some of those more suburban communities would have a berm for example separating the sign from from the residential, well, as it, so, how many of how many billboards do you have in the Beltline? Uh, we recently conducted a uh, a mapping study. It's available on our website, Beltline.ca. Uh, we mapped between 25 and 36 billboards. Uh, it's actually more along the lines of 30, and uh, some are in affected areas or neighboring areas on Earlton along McCow Trail that are technically across the street from our geographic boundaries as a community. Mm -hmm. um, but we put them on there as an affected party. As an example, the majority of them are along 10th Avenue, and uh, there are uh, a couple within residential proximity to dwelling units that have recently gone up that are in the approvals process right now. So if we were um, to make the rules a little bit easier for some areas of the city, you, you would see us tightening up the rules in, in more pedestrian-oriented, primarily residential districts. Um, Mixed-use districts. Mixed-use districts with proximity to dwelling and residential, yes. Yes. I, I think every resident in the city should be treated with the same respect. Um, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Mr. Craig. Anyone else? Thank you for your time and thank you for being here. Anyone else would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Good afternoon. Mr. Van Wiegen. My name is Bob Van Wiegen. I'm the urban planner for the Federation of Calgary Communities. And while we can't speak uh, for every community association, we do try and provide a, a community perspective. And we've been present at the, at the consultations where the uh, city has been meeting with the community and other stakeholders to uh, uh, discuss this issue of science. So for or against, do you get up? Uh, for or against. If I'd gotten up four, I might have been home by now <laughs> watching on television. Four, because we need some kind of control on this new class of signage. Overall, the proposals that administrations bought for do achieve this. Against, because some communities would frankly prefer a moratorium, at least in business and third-party signage, at least until a full sign review is complete. 
the Federation Support Administration's first stab at this last April, which was to require a DC, direct control, because maybe that was the next best thing. Uh, nonetheless, administration is planning work on a permanent policy, including broad public engagement and public survey. That hasn't happened yet, except for the meetings with the affected community associations. Yet, in the absence of rules, and in the absence of the consent of Calgarians, many of these new kinds of signs have been deployed with the permission of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. Without controls, the signs will move for unusual to ubiquitous before we know it. A moratorium, a direct control is what was originally proposed, or strong discretionary rules which are being proposed today may apprehend this pending digital sign race and allow some time for civic reflection on this new addition to the public realm before the digital horse is any further out of the digital barn, if you'll pardon that extremely difficult analogy. With everybody coming up to speak against, maybe administration got it right this time. Nobody's entirely happy. I want to, uh, I want to mention a few things in, in response to some things that have come up as well. Um, I think it would be, uh, we would not support a relaxation of the distance from, from residences um, or a reduction to 100 metres. 100 metres uh, is very close in my estimation uh, to have the, the channel changing as, as Mr. Craig suggested. To bring them into c Corps 1 and c Corps 2, 16th Avenue was raised as an example. But what about 17th Avenue Southwest, Marta Loop, uh, 10th Street Northwest, Kensington Road, 4th Street? These are pedestrian-oriented roads, uh, and this is an entirely different scale of signage. And if we're talking about driver distraction, I tell you, as a driver and as a resident of the nearby area, you must pay a lot more attention when you're driving on 17th Avenue than you are on many higher volume, higher speed roads. Because there's crossroads, there's people turning out into traffic, there's people jaywalking, there's signage. During the summer, people practically drive with their head out the window looking at the scenery. And uh, the last thing we need in these, in these, uh, in these more pedestrian-oriented areas is uh, to have another type of kinetic signage, which frankly we're just beginning to understand and get used to. Also, uh, I think a, a good point was made earlier with regards to Planet Calgary. We're trying to make these corridors in the areas more human, more habitable, because we want more inhabitants in these areas. And I do think that, that uh, having uh, more and different kinds of signage, including this new digital signage, certainly without a lot of reflection, is, is going in a direction that's uh, um, opposite to making these areas more habitable. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much if you have any questions. Thanks, Mr. Van Wiegen. Alderman Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Van Wiegen. I'm, I'm uh, curious about your comment about the, uh, the, the re relaxation of the 300 meters. Mm. Because, and I misspoke myself when I addressed it before, I said uh, Barlow Trail, when in fact I meant uh, Blackfoot Trail, where your residential is significantly below the roadway. Mm -hmm. And on the east side, it's all industrial. So why could the 300 meters not be relaxed in that circumstance? Well, I guess there's a couple things. Um, I guess there's a couple things I'd, I'd, I'd want to, to mention. One, and this is, this is like unofficial, there was some talk about reducing the 300 meters to 100 meters and definitely would not support that. In terms of relaxation of uh, the 300 meters in the land use uh, discretionary process, uh, I guess uh, every time I every time I hear the word uh, discretion, I'm always concerned about what the uh, aspect of it might might be. Um, some of the examples that were shown, uh, I'm not familiar with the Blackfoot example personally, but on McLeod Trail, for example, the examples that were shown in Earlton, there's quite an elevation change between those signs and the residences in Earlton, yet they feel they're looking right down on them and those signs are looking right up at them. So I'm not certain that it's, uh, it's easy to make that determination. Uh, I'd say in this interim period, um, uh, better safe than sorry, uh, people don't uh, apparently don't want these near to where they live and uh, and uh, we should respect that. Mm. 
So I'm, I'm having some difficulty, and I'll use the Earlton example, where at night what we hear is that after 100 meters, essentially the signs disappear into the ambient light anyhow. I don't believe that for a second. Go take a look at it at night. Uh, take a look at it at night with the given signs and, and you know, the high reflection of, of, of not being able to reduce it as I understand it. Uh, so that, that's the, my concern around that one. So you, I hear, what, what I think I hear you saying is you don't want anything that can get to DAB. Uh, does anybody want anything that uh, can get to DAB? <laughs> you're, you're getting them all now. They are. Yeah. They are, and the results are? I would rather that this be as, um, I would rather that this be as straightforward and as bulletproof as possible. Uh, like I said, over the next, over the last few months, while no rules have been in place, these signs have been appearing and will continue to appear. I think we need to have a fuller discussion on signs. Some of the issues raised about the lighting of other kinds of signage, I think, are very interesting. Um, and I don't think, I don't think we should do anything uh, to, uh, I don't think we should do anything to add to a problematic situation while we discuss these, uh, discuss uh, comprehensive sign rules for the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Law. Alderman Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Van Wegen. Did you ever sit down in a room with the industry where communities and members of the industry brought, brought, brought together to talk about um, some areas where the rules maybe could be um, loosened and others where they needed tightening up. Did you ever have that discussion? I was at one meeting that was, um, that had community and industry people um, and uh, I didn't find the exchange to be very productive. Uh, there was uh, some pretty entrenched uh, points of view on both sides that were uh, that were strongly expressed, so I, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that that was uh, that that particular exercise been particularly good. Maybe we could try it again at another point. Is there any sense of urgency? I mean, I, sometimes when uh, people know that a decision is going to be made with or without them, they have they're more motivated. Yeah. So I'm just I'm wondering if you think it would be helpful. Um, in terms of in terms of urgency, uh, I think well, one thing right now, I think I, I guess in terms of urgency, I'm concerned. A lot of communities are concerned that right now it appears to be the wild west, and everything's going to subdivision and development appeal board, and that we need some sort of interim rules, um, and probably need them today mm -hmm. because they're better than nothing. Um, and we have a little while to work on the other rules, and, and maybe that discussion at this point is better taken care of in, um, by looking at the long-term rules. I think maybe having a sit-down just to focus on this thing. One thing that happens is I think we get off onto tangents and talking about the other kinds of signs, and so I think a, a discussion that's a little broader might be more productive. And that maybe can happen as the uh, as the as the overall sign review is done. That might be the better place for it. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think that uh, I think that uh, it's well past time that some sort of rules were put in place so this can at least be managed now. Yes, because we have seen a number of applications come in absence of rules, and then yeah, exactly. And we have them in place. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Anyone else for Mr. Van Wegen? Great. Thanks, Mr. Van Wegen. Thanks for being here. Anyone else would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Good afternoon, Mr. Fack. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor, Alderman, city staff. My name is Oscar Fack. I've lived here close to 60 years in Calgary. I found it very interesting we create new rules, bylaws again, to create digital. We have digital technology everywhere. We have TV, we have everything. It's affecting our brains already. I don't have all this technology, and I'm glad I don't. When you listen to the experts, it affects your blood system, 
your brains uh, get devalued. It, it's very frustrating when people know what's going on and, the, and all this digital is very hard on driving. Like was indicated, you heard some good comments. So we should listen to these comments and analyze and say, look, look at all the paper that I've got here. For uh, only one bylaw, it's a little bylaw, all the paper that we're using, they always indicated and said, when we have good technology, we're gonna use no paper or hardly any paper. We're using actually 10 times more paper because of technology. And technology rules, controls the whole system. What goes in comes out. This is in the world we're living in. There's no, it's like a fiction world. So let's get back to good common sense. The old billboards were just fine. They put some digital on them, that was great. But now we're going overboard. The eyes can't even take the glaring, the, the lighting that's going on back and forth. There's a lot of accidents going on because of the, all the digital. I had somebody uh, uh, rear end me about two months ago, and, and he took off. And the guy behind me said, uh, came to him and said, look, I know where you took off to, so I chased him. I not chased him, but went to the parking lot. He had his foot in the cast. I am, I am enjoying the story, Mr. Feck, but, um, <laughs> but that's true. you have to get back to the point. But I do want to hear what happened. He had his foot in the cast. Okay. Well, because he, watching, he was watching the digital, probably how many parking spots there's at Chinook Shopping Center. <laughs> you see, what I'm saying is I'm partly being facetious, but it's the truth. We've been railroaded back and forth. We don't know what's going on anymore. We, our brains are being almost mushed because of the old technology. I'm glad I, I don't have all this. My brain is just working just, just fine. I, I could probably use a better brain and a little less mush. Thank you, Mr. Fass. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> your brain is just fine. Your <laughs> technology is so heavy, you know absolutely everything that's going on. <laughs> I'm not sure that everyone around these tables would agree with you, Mr. Oh, Pat. they do. <laughs> You're in the digital and, and everything. But my, my final remarks are, oh, this is just a camouflage, and it's, it, it will have a big effect. This is not Las Vegas, not Times Square. I've been all these places, but what I'm saying is, let's get rid of all this flashing and and manipulating. We have to get rid of all this. Let's go back to common sense, what we had. I know I keep repeating these things now and then, and most people don't want to hear that, but somebody has to repeat it. Let's get back what we had in the past. That's what makes the world go round, not spin everything out of control. We are being spun out of control. That's the whole problem. That's why we're adding I call it self-implosion, like the Roman Empire days in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you all know what I'm talking about. Let's get back to good common sense, and that'll work. We will survive a lot longer if we get back to that era. Thank you very much. Is Words there any to questions? Live by. Thanks, Mr. Fack. Any oh, of questions? Of course not. All right, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? All right, then, we will close the public hearing on this and take questions for administration. Okay, we'll take some debate. I think Alderman Marr may have, uh, oh, Alderman Carra. <laughs> Alderman Carra. Um, so I guess my first question to administration is, have we differentiated between the different types of, uh, oh, I'll wait. Have we differentiated between the different types of digital signs? Your Worship, um, Your Worship, the, um, the proposed amendments uh, today only uh, identify the electronic messaging signs as a certain type and the digital third-party advertising signs as a specific type. Uh, it doesn't differentiate between the sizes of the signs. Okay, so it's, it's motion video or just static presentation 
is what the differentiation is. Um, Your Worship, just to clarify, the differentiation is the more or less the content. So with electronic message signs, uh, the content is related to the business on the site, whereas third-party advertising is related to a, to a third third product party or a third uh, product. Okay, so there's no distinction between the video signs and sort of a static display sign. Uh, Your Worship, the, the amendments do not allow uh, any full motion video in, in either type of sign, only static images. Okay. And where does the, uh, where does the, um, the sort of the video action that's happening on the, on the, uh, the sign by McMahon Stadium, where does that fall into the bylaw? Um, at this point in time, um, your, yes, Your Worship, uh, Mr. Melanson just reminded me that the McMahon Stadium sign is on University of Calgary land, and so it is exempt from our land use bylaw, provided that the sign um, deals with um, university uh, matters, university issues. Okay. Um, my other question is, the there, there is a, a sign and it's on McLeod Trail, right at sort of the mouth of uh, Mission Road. And that's sort of, it's high up on a pylon and it flashes. Every time I drive by it, I think I'm dealing with a Nova Cam. I imagine. Yes, Your, your uh, Worship, we, we have had some issues. Uh, however, my understanding is that sign does have a permit now um, as, a, uh, di as a third party advertising sign, uh, digital. And um, so it's, I believe it's operating in accordance with the permit. Okay, you know that sign drives people crazy. Um, I'm having a hard time differentiating between sort of the safety considerations that we're discussing today and the sort of the aesthetic uh, discussion, the, the, the aesthetics discussion that we're having, and I'm not sure that we've sort of, I think we've, we've blended them, and I don't know how to phrase this question exactly, but can you give me some insight as to how you guys sought to differentiate and or blend that within, within these proposed temporary amendments? Um, try to be brief, Your Worship. Uh, there, there were both aesthetic and safety considerations uh, in this amendment. Um, the one thing that we need to emphasize is that these are interim amendments to, as Mr. Van Wiegen mentioned, to manage the situation until we can have some full, full engagement and, and a permanent set of rules. Um, so part of the, the longer term uh, plan will be for us to look at some upcoming uh, safety studies. One of them is being done by the Federal uh, Transportation uh, um, Department in the United States to look at the safety aspects and that report is due later this year. Um, has been delayed for some times so where we can get a better understanding of the safety impacts. And then the second, the second issue we're dealing with was the aesthetic and compatibility issue. And as has been uh, noticed and discussed today, um, we did not list digital third-party advertising signs in, in the corridors. The, the 17th Avenue Southeast, Southwest, uh, 16th Avenue, Kensington Road, etc. And the reason for that is we, we felt that at this time those are areas are the mixed-use areas where council's policies are seeking to promote more dwelling units and more mixed uses. Um, so we wanted, rather than a default decision, for a, a, a decision to be based on, uh, on policy and considerations um, that would be um, the rules coming out of some policy that would occur later. So part of that policy development might be to identify smaller size signs that are pedestrian oriented that might be appropriate in those areas. Okay, my last question has to do with this. I'm trying to wrap my mind around the, uh, the, the setback requirements for these signs. Um, what is the philosophy of safety driving that? I have, I mean, we, we put up a bunch of charts and we talked about as road speed increases, people's reaction time decreases and all of that. I, explain that to me because I mean, I think, I think we, we know that roads have a design speed and then roads have a posted safety limit, a speed limit, right? And the old school of, of you know, road engineering was that we want to remove objects that people smash into to increase safety. 
But of course, the further back you place things from the road now, we know the faster people drive. And so you might have a posted speed limit, but the design speed might be a lot higher than that. And we do know that speed kills. And so you know, as we try and transition from an automobile-focused transportation environment to an environment that puts a lot more emphasis on other modes and seeks to blend these modes working together, explain to me the explain to me the setback within the context of the new CTP as opposed to the traditional conventional way of designing for road safety. Your Worship, Mayor Nenshi, uh, my name is Zoran Karkik. I'm with Transportation Planning. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess you're, you're talking about two concepts here uh, with the setbacks from the property line. We're trying to achieve uh, we're, we're trying to manage competition for driver attention. We believe that uh, traffic control devices are primary, uh, uh, and then uh, maybe on-premise sign would be secondary, and then third-party advertising sign would be our last concern if drivers are seeing it or not. Um, the other concept is the clear zone that you mentioned. Uh, its minimum is six meters. Um, it is used to um, uh, set back the objects from, from the true lanes so that um, there would be, um, nobody would hit these objects. So that's, that's what you were talking, probably when you were talking about pushing ob objects away from the True, true, fair. Yeah, I, and I'm just, you know, obviously the further you set things back, the more open the space, the, the faster people will drive. Yeah. So. So, so these are different. Uh, are they? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I guess my last question is to you guys. I mean, I think what industry is sort of putting forward to us here is that the digital sign, when responsibly deployed is no real is, is not really different from what we currently have and is better because it's less environmentally impactful, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great story unless it's way more visually impactful. What is your opinion? Certainly, uh, Your Worship, uh, from what we've seen and heard from communities so far is that, uh, that uh, digital signs uh, do have um, a brighter, more uh, vivid, um, um, presentation to the public and that's why at this point in time pending longer-term studies were and longer-term work we're proposing to, to manage them essentially fairly conservatively and then uh, develop more studies that can perhaps give council some uh, more conclusive recommendations I'm not, I'm not sure if that's helpful or not but yeah that's fine thank you very much thank you uh, Alderman Kara Alderman Marr you're next but I see you're scribbling are you ready yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, Your Worship, thank you. At this time, I'd like to move a referral of this, uh, of CPC 2011, 27. Sorry, I should give this to the clerk right now. So they could, uh, and create a special council task force to be comprised of three members of council, including the chair of LPT and two others to be appointed by council today, perhaps during the in-camera session and uh, to report back to the Standing Policy Committee on LPT no later than June 2011. I think that this is a complicated issue. There's a lot of uh, people that uh, don't have the technical expertise when we're talking about um, candles and lumens and nicks or knocks or whatever the heck they are. Uh, and it is, uh, it is controversial insofar as that we are talking about the evolutionary change of an industry that it's uh, involving community stakeholders and administration. And I would love to see a smaller task force that was able to, to understand the issue much more clearly than we do now and report back as, uh, as a committee to LPT and then through council. So that would, be my, uh, that would be my referral motion at this time. All right, do we have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman collier Card. On the referral motion, I'll just run through my list here. If it's on the referral motion, if it's not, I'll leave you on the list in case the referral motion fails. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. So perhaps the mover can, um, can
can answer in his close. I think what we're trying to attempt to do today is bring some rules in place when where there is none. And, and so would there be an understanding that we would have a moratorium on these applications while we delay further? I would hope that we'd want to see um, sort of more, an urban perspective and a suburban perspective included in this, and also whether or not you would be including the stakeholders so there would be more meaningful stakeholder involvement. And may I ask a question of administration mm -hmm. during this debate? Um, so when do you anticipate, oh, you disappeared on me. There you go. When do you anticipate the report that's coming from the U.S. that talks about the impact on tra transportation safety and digital um, signage? Your Worship, that uh, report initially was supposed to be in January. It's now, uh, my understanding is May of this year. Um, but of course, the, the timeline on that is out of, not in our control. No, but if it does come in May, do you think this could help inform that committee? Um, or is it too, is it too late? It's, um, pa it's, it's, it's part of the... Uh, I'm not sure what the timing of, of the meetings would be. It was certainly the, the uh, safety study coming out of the U.S. was something we are definitely going to include as part of our longer-term discussions on the, on the permanent rules that would be proposed to Council. And one of the questions I was going to ask about, about the recommendations before us is, um, is there a better way to differentiate the more pedestrian-oriented urban corridors um, as opposed to a more suburban context where I think it needs to be treated differently? <clears throat> Um, Your Worship, the, um, the recommendations before Council today are, are essentially proposing that in that um, the districts that we're not uh, recommending that digital signs be listed are the, the CCOR 1, CCOR 2, the districts where you typically see dwelling units, um, as well as the Industrial Edge District, which is a district that's immediately adjacent to residential. So es essentially that's, that's the recommendation today as well. But I do see a big difference between Kensington and McLeod Trail or Blackfoot. So I, I don't know if that nuance is, is covered in this in your recommendations. What I'll uh, do is I'll ask Mr. Melanson to, uh, we have a map that shows the uh, CCOR 1, the CCOR 2, um, in the districts where um, the signs are not listed and we could show that for council if they'd like to see that. So is that the uh, red? So the uh, the red color, uh, your worship, would be the uh, CCOR 1 and the CCOR 2 districts. I think the yellow is just to highlight the areas, just to identify where the red is, but it, it doesn't encompass the yellow areas, just, the, just the, uh, the red dots that you see on the map. So the concern about McLeod Trail, where does that come into play? <clears throat> I, I believe that um, some of the concerns have been expressed uh, reg with regard to the proposed 300 meter setback from dwelling units. And uh, I also understand that there has been some discussion about making that relaxable so that um, if an application was received by the development authority, um, it could be circulated to local communities and discretion could be exercised to say, uh, reduce the setback distance if there was a physical obstacle like you're in a valley mm -hmm. or behind a building, reduce it uh, to a lower number. So that is an option as well for consideration. Okay, thank you. Well, council, I, I will support this referral um, with, and I, reluctantly, we've tabled this at Planning Commission several times, and I think um, the concern I have is that in, while we delay making a decision on this, we see applications um, and without policy context. But I, I'm hoping that if the industry has a little bit more time to work with city administration, members of council, and with the community, that they will... Uh, do that in good faith and not um, try and squeeze in a number of these digital applications in the meantime. If that happens, then you've lost my support in the future. So um, I will support it with reluctance, but I do hope that we look at, at the urban context in difference from, in different from, um, from a more auto-oriented context. Uh, Alderman Farrell, I will, if you want to, up to you, but I will accept a motion arising should this pass. 
if you would like to put in a moratorium in place, I think I can do that. I think we can do that, I mean, um, from now until this committee makes its report. Okay, I think that would be Oh, reasonable. never mind. Ms. Phone says we can't do that. A more, no, as a motion arising or as a... Either. either. As well, an action. I'm Presumably just, we don't have that power. I'm hoping that the industry displays some good faith. Thank yeah. you. It was worth a try. Have I mentioned many, many, many times that the that the MGA doesn't uh, give us the powers that we need. On the referral motion, Alderman Chabot. Yes, uh, thank you, Your Worship. This is very uh, much reminiscent of, uh, of what it's like at home, being voluntold to do stuff. Um, <laughs> when you're that brilliant, Alderman Chabot, people <laughs> need you to take opportunities. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting. I, I know there's been a lot of discussion around the rules, and uh, I'm also concerned about the absence of having some regulations in place. And uh, I, I can't recall exactly what the timeline was that he had put on there. June. 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 Yeah, there's a significant amount of time between now and then. And I think we could at least come close to um, ultimately uh, what would be a good interim solution and provide some rules and regulations around this. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on this thing at this point, uh, especially in light of the fact that it adds more work to my own workload, but uh, assuming that it's going to pass. I'm chair. I'm making an assumption there. <laughs> uh, so anyways, I uh, I do have some questions from administration, though, if I may, very briefly. Yeah, go ahead. If we, uh, if we were to make amendments to the, and I'm not sure if Alderman Farrell answered this question. I was trying to read through some of the stuff that I had. But if we were to amend the land use districts, would that require re-advertisement? Um, you amend the, the, uh, the list of districts in the, uh, the land use bylaw, uh, in the proposed bylaw. I, th I think Ms. Ms. Flown is, is nodding her head. Yes, it would require re-advertising. So we couldn't actually make an amendment because we can only make an amendment at second reading. So if we were to propose even an amendment, it would then necessitate the need to re-advertise and have a new public hearing? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll let Ms. Flown answer that, uh, but I will say in advance that yes, that's probably right. But in fact, even some of the amendments that um, were being suggested by industry today, especially the one about uh, changing the districts to which this applied, Yes. Would in fact require a re-advertisement and a public another public hearing okay, because we, because this was not initially advertised. Ms. Sloan, is that fair? That's correct. I'm, and, and I'm just trying to be clear about how this process actually moves forward. If we we can't officially amend the bylaw until second reading, so essentially there'd be no amendments on the floor until second reading, in which case the public hearing would then be closed. So when it came back, if we did approve amendments to it at second reading, it, it would necessitate a re-advertisement, wouldn't reopen the public process? I, I'm just trying to understand the process here. You, your Worship, it really depends uh, what the amendments are as to whether or not a new public hearing and re-advertisement would be required. Um, adding a use to a district that was not previously advertised would absolutely require a new public hearing and a new ad. Um, if, if you were just tweaking rules, for example, instead of a 300 meter setback, it's going to be a 250 meter setback, that's something the council could do without a re-advertisement or public hearing. Okay. Um, one, one caveat that I'd put on that, or not caveat, but one additional point I'd make is um, the difficulty is that a public hearing has been held with respect to this bylaw. And so by referring this back and having a, a, a group work on this, um, it's highly likely that a new public hearing is going to be required in any event because new information has been gathered outside of the public hearing process. So that would necessitate a public hearing as well as a re-advertisement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, it's unfortunate actually that this referral motion was made before we could actually implement some changes, um, at least to initiate some changes and possibly um, have an ad hoc committee um, be directed to develop new or additional guidelines, specifically in relation to third party advertisement. And I think that would have been a better way forward, but uh, I'll uh, listen to the 
additional arguments and the mover in is closed to see whether or not I can support this and still not there yet. Thanks Alderman Chabot. Alderman Stevenson? Uh, no, not on the referral. Alderman Lowe on the referral? Well, Your Worship, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Flown for the explanation around the effect of the, the referral because uh, I was a, a bit curious about that. And, it, you know, to be frank, you, Your Worship, I'm, I'm not quite sure why Council wants to take on administration's work. Candidly. That's uh, our job is to govern, not to manage. Having said that, um, obviously I, I can't support the referral for... Uh, a variety of reasons. I also uh, appreciative of the fact that Ms. Phone reminded you that we cannot put a moratorium in place. We have a bylaw, and applicants are entitled to make application under that bylaw, and we're obliged to process those applications under that bylaw. So those those are sort of the salient facts around this. So uh, with respect to uh, the referral, obviously, Your Worship, I uh, will not support it, and. Uh, I'll leave my light on for further debate. Thank you. I'm going to turn your light off, Alderman Lowe, not because I don't want you to debate further, because I want to exhaust the list. So turn it right back on again. Alderman Keating on the referral. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I do need a couple um, questions of clarification administration as well. Um, I thought I heard today that we're in the process of reviewing signs, sort of the sign bylaw across the city in general. Is that correct? Yes, Your Worship. Okay. And I thought the timeline was something like 18 months. That is correct. Okay, so we're reviewing the by. So in this interim of 18 months, could uh, anyone apply for a regular billboard, lit or not lit, and that may go forward separate from it being digital? Y yes, that's correct. The, um, the, the proposed amendments today do not in any way affect um, the existing conventional uh, billboards. So a moratorium is only on the digital aspect, not on signs in general, and therefore within 18 months we'll come back with a whole, possibly whole different set of rules. That is the intention, Your Worship. Okay. So on that respect, the referral, I, I kind of had wished it, it dropped the task force as well, because I think we should have just referred it back for the 18 months and, and gone forward from there, but uh, on that point I will support it. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Keating. On the referral, Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my questions relate to, um, I guess in part, uh, why, why we would have council members on this, and I'm hoping Al Alderman Mark can clarify that a little bit further in his close. Um, but I also am curious as to how this, the, uh, referring back for more information, more detail differs. This is an interim policy, and so it's not intended to be perfect, and it's not intended to be final. and so. I'm getting the sense that it, it's, its lack of perfectedness is a barrier for us to move forward on anything. And I, I, um, I think we just need to deal with this as best we can as an interim measure and put the timelines around this. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman McLeod. And I, I think what I've heard from administration on this is that while this has been tabled a few times, um, their sense is they really need a bit more direction on which way to move forward because council has been a little, members of council have been a little all over the map. So I think that, if I may speak for Alderman Marr, but I'm sure he'll mention it in his close, I think that was the intent here. Alderman Putmans? Yes, thank you, Worship. Um, and Alderman um, McLeod touched on some points, but perhaps a, a point of procedure. Does a referral motion have to have some sort of content as to what the purpose of, of the referral is for? What We're referring it back to administration to do what precisely? And it's a little bit to the point about where we're at in the policy process. Sorry, I don't have my orange book with me. <laughs> Notice I know the date has to be in there for a referral motion, but I'm not sure. Everyone that. looking at their orange book now. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Anytime. Alderman Putmans, thanks so much. You're so welcome. Um, I know you enjoy these processes. <laughs> no, not really. No, not really. <laughs> Does there have to be a as point? As long as there's terms on which the referral is put, and I think after this long public hearing, it, some of the, and uh, and the public submissions that we've received, it's clear that it's to consider those and come back with an answer. To consider, okay, it's not explicit. Yeah, I think it's clear. So to we're referring a report to a task force, including the chair of CPC 
and two others to be appointed and to return. It, that, that's a bunch of activities. I'm not sure what they're doing in the meantime. LPT, but what, what are they going to be doing? They're considering. Maybe Alderman Moore can suggest that. And perhaps in your close, Alderman Moore, I'd appreciate understanding what the intent is. I'm looking forward to supporting this motion, but along with others, perhaps seriously considering whether or not we should be engaged to this as council members. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Footmans. Uh, anyone else on the referral motion? Alderman Jones? <laughs> not a chance. Your Worship, uh, um, I would just like clarification of the two others. Is it two others from administration or two others from stakeholders? Well, you've got three members of council Plus the chair of the land use planning and transportation and two others to be appointed by council today and I just no. what he means is three members of council one of whom is the chair of LPT and two other members of council. So he uh, so said it twice total. then. Uh, his comma is I think misplaced. Okay. Sorry but are we suggesting that three councillors are going to make these decisions with in conjunction with nobody else just these three because that's what this referral says pardon it actually kind of, it actually kind of does all it more. does you've got well come back to LPT with the report from three aldermen well I just if you're going to respond in your clothes that's not good enough because I want to know who else is going to be on you can, so you can respond them. now Alderman Mark Okay, okay, so the intent of it is, number one, why did I want to use it as a small ad hoc team? Because I think that there are some severely entrenched positions, both administratively uh, as well as the, uh, as the industry. I think that a small group of members of council, like we have done with Snow and Ice and other, other committees, uh, the Public Safety Task Force will allow us to be able to drill down to the real nitty gritty of the, of the issue to determine hey, what can work for us as a, as a city? How do we work together with administration and the stakeholders and bring together a new plan that will make sense for everybody? So uh, June, I'm saying that as the, as the latest date, if we can bring it back sooner, that makes sense. The chair of LPT should be on it because it's uh, obviously going to LPT. Two members of council to be determined uh, in, in camera today. We think we can make a, a very quick decision as to who should be on this. And we're going to include that the, uh, this team would have the ability to draw from the resources of administration to uh, ask the stakeholders, both public and industry, to come together and, and uh, work towards an agreement that will make sense and uh, create a new bylaw as a result. Then come back through LPT and then report back to council. I think it, it, it may not be as detailed in the referral motion, but I think that the essence of there, we could come up with the terms of reference very, very quickly in order to determine how this should move forward. So that's my, uh, that's the rationale. And I think that while we've all enjoyed this four hour debate, this is a, an elegant sol solution to the problem and uh, we can actually move forward on it in spite of the fact that uh, this keeps going back to CPC and bouncing around our administration. Wow. So, Almost sounds like a close. Did that help Alderman Zemong? Nope. <laughs> well, Peter, you can you, else, you can. On the, no, I just want to know who else you want on the task force. I mean, uh, again, it's the it, audit committee. You had a specific for for the snow. If you ice. want me to appoint people, I can appoint people right now. And if you want to be there, I think that's a volunteer. I, I, be, I believe I think he's volunteering. Will be one of the people appointed. Absolutely, to the task Peter. Force. Welcome, welcome aboard. So you and Andre, and then somebody else. I, I think, if I may, if I may. I have just learned that in this council room. What's written is what is done. If it isn't written, it's not done. If I done. may, I, I think I heard your concern, Alderman Zwang, and tell me if I'm wrong. I think I heard your concern as being, um, will this involve administration? Or is this just three members of council going off and making a decision? Is that right? Pretty much. Yes, and I think what Alderman Marr said was that this task force would, of course, work with administration to go forward. Um, and if you want to add words to that effect. Well, if I wanted it to, if you just wanted it to be that, I would have made it the chair of uh, CPC just all by himself. But um, uh, in, in reality, Thank I Thank you for not making it the mayor all by himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, no, me. Uh, oh, sorry, CPS. 
I meant CPS, I was joking. I'm joking, I'm joking. So uh, I think the, the intent of it, if I haven't addressed that- Excuse in me, I'll just leave and you can close if you wish. Okay. You still got four, you got Okay, you said two. <laughs> yes, Dad. <laughs> Anyone else on the referral motion before I call on Alderman Moore to close? We're having fun here today, folks. Anyone else? Alderman Moore to close. You just told me to sit down. Now I'm standing again. Okay, uh, so I hope that members of council understand the intent of it here. I'm not trying to muddy the waters, rather than I'm trying to, to, to create a small, um, elegant solution where we can have a, a group of members of council, three in number, one of them being the chair of LPT. Uh, we can find out who those other members are going to be during the, um, the in-camera session where we can poll members of council as to A, interest, and B, willingness to do it. Um, it seems that we have a volunteer right there, and maybe Alderman Pincott's demonstrating he's interested. So, no, no, not, not me, Mike. Uh, but uh, also, the intent of it is that we can report back to LPT with the decision no later than June. I think if we can come back sooner and create terms of restaurants where we have an understanding that of course we're going to draw upon the resources of our administration. Of course we're going to talk to our stakeholders, uh, both public and industry, to determine what's, what makes the most sense given this new technology. Uh, and I would uh, ask for your support on this. Thank you. Closed, Your Worship. Thank you, Alderman Marr. On the motion to refer, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Carra. Yes. Alderman Chabot? No. Alderman Colliercott? Yes. Alderman DeMong? No. Alderman Farrell? Yes. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Alderman Keating? Yes. Alderman Lowe? No. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Marr? Yes. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? Sorry, Your Worship. No. no. Mayor Nenshi? Yes. It's carried, Your Worship, 8-7. Carried. All right, so um, Alderman Marr, I will accept a motion to add as an item of urgent in camera business the appointment of that task force. Do I have a seconder? I'll second. Thank you. Um, so just to add this as an in camera item, uh, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Um, Alderman McLeod, while we're at it, I think you had an item you wanted to add? Second. <laughs> Move that Alderman Farrell have to go home. Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> yes, to add to the in-camera item, an item of urgent business. Um, it's, is it a personnel matter or is that? You, you can say we, what it is, the appointment to the library it's board? It's appointment to the library board. Okay, so and you're seconding Alderman Farrell? All right, on that one are we agreed? Any opposed? All right, carried. Uh, we've now got 7.1 on the table. Um, First, uh, on a point of procedure. Yeah. Be being as council just approved this appointment to this committee that said that we're gonna do this today. At what point today are we gonna be doing this? We just added it to the agenda. Okay, that's what the appointment yeah. is? That's not library board. The, you know, it's the one that Mar added okay. just before Sorry, that. I missed that. Um, I was just thinking about how to resign from chair. <laughs> <laughs> you have until we get to the in-camera session, Alderman Chabot. Um, now, folks, we've got item 7.1 on the table here. Um, and I'm going to turn to Ms. Flown. Since we've disposed of 7.2, can we table 7.1 at this point? Where? Um, Are you worship on 7.1? Okay. All right. I'm prepared to, if you take a look at, uh, at your agenda, there was some uh, recommendations that I made a planning commission on uh, 2010, October 28, which uh, fundamentally, uh, to fundamentally, it did reverse the recommendation of the Planning Commission, and I was moving approval, adopt the proposed redesignation, give first reading to the bylaw, amend the proposed bylaw as follows. In other words, uh, okay. 
et cetera, and so on. I'm, so I'm, I'm prepared to move that recommendation, Your Worship. Okay. Given that, given that we still do need to hold a public hearing. Yeah. So given that, why don't we go to Mr. Cope and uh, let's get started. Thank you, Your Worship. The item that's before you today is an application to designate a small piece of land, the area outlined in red adjacent to McKnight Boulevard Northeast, being 0 0.006 hectares in size, from the existing SCI land use district to a DC direct control district to accommodate a digital third party advertising sign. The parent parcel currently houses the Heritage Christian Academy, which is a private school. Current time, a two-sided third-party advertising sign with the west-facing sign being a digital third-party advertising sign uh, are located on the area to be designated. Uh, the sign in question uh, <coughs> with the west face showing there. Uh, neither sign has a valid development permit allowing for the use. By way of history, a third-party advertising sign or billboard as they're commonly called was approved on this site as a discretionary use under the I-2 district of bylaw 2P80 in the early 1980s with the possibility of a review every five years, a renewal every five years. The last renewal for that sign occurred in 1998. In 2000, an amendment to the bylaw 2P80 occurred which prohibited third party advertising signs on this portion of McKnight Boulevard. This provision has been carried through to the current bylaw 1P 2007. The third party advertising sign, which you see here, has remained in place without a valid permit since 2003. In 2008, the third party sign was removed and replaced with a new digital third party advertising sign, again without benefit of a development permit for the new sign. The sign contravened numerous provisions of bylaw 1P 2007 in terms of sign location and was also not a listed use in the SCI land use district. The new sign was subject to enforcement action for removal with the order on hold pending the outcome of these proceedings. To address the issue at that time, the applicant applied for a development permit, which was refused. That decision was appealed to SDAB which also upheld that refusal. As a last resort, this land use redesignation request is the last option available for the applicant to retain the illegal sign. The bylaw that is before you that has been submitted has been submitted by the applicant. Its primary focus is to allow for the use to occur in the base SCI district and exempt the sign from the location prohibitions along McKnight Boulevard. Special rules have been incorporated to address some of the aesthetic and safety related issues that have been brought forward by administration. In the event the redesignation is considered, administration would note that there are still issues with the rate of change of the various images, as well as with the light intensity projected by the digital sign itself. It should be noted that the proposed bylaw also does not address the other bylaw relaxations which will exist on the site including separation from other non-third party electronic message centers or separation from a major open space. Uh, the bylaw relaxations are noted uh, on the screen at the present time. Uh, we do have some site uh, photos. This uh, is showing the sign which is in place. You can just see it to the right hand of your screen. This is taken from the intersection of McKnight Boulevard at 19th Street. Uh, one of the concerns that we do have with this sign <coughs> is with respect to safety and its location to a merge lane and the weaving lanes from McKnight and 19th Street. This is another sign showing the distance from an existing message or electronic message sign, which is located on the Port of Call property, 19th Street, and then you can see the sign again in the background uh, adjacent to McKnight Boulevard. The next sign or picture indicates the relative change at night uh, in terms of the sign in comparison to the surrounding light sources. A similar, oh, unfortunately the reflection is bad on that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, should also note we have a photograph showing the 
relative change of the intensity of light between uh, the digital sign and the adjacent and the adjacent third-party advertising signs. Part of the discussion that uh, <coughs> Sorry. Sign showing the relative change during the day of the lighting of the electronic message sign, which is, is in the front foreground, and two other third party signs located uh, farther away. In considering the application, the administration noted that the proposal was not consistent with the bylaw with respect to the prohibition of third party signs on McKnight Boulevard, nor with the provisions of the SCI district. The use was not considered compatible with the adjacent private school, and that is the primary use on the subject site. Additionally, the incorporation of the digital component resulted in a number of aesthetic and traffic safety related concerns, which have not been adequately addressed and those can be expanded upon by our, our traffic engineers that are in the audience today. The sign's location in close proximity to the major intersection, merge and weave lanes, creates a significant potential for driver distraction, and representatives from the transportation department can address that issue as well. Administration found no planning merit for the use of a direct control district for use that otherwise does not conform to the standard requirements of the land use bylaw. Similarly, there were no physical conditions that would suggest special consideration be given to this particular use. In considering the application, Calgary Planning Commission had numerous issues. These included, abilities, included the suitability of the use, particularly with respect to the digital component of the sign, whether or not the use of a DC district was actually the, uh, uh, the appropriate method uh, to deal with this <coughs> type of an application. There was also consideration given to allow for the sign to stay in place until the completion of the overall sign study review in 18 months to two years, um, as well as the traffic safety issues associated with locating this type of a sign in this specific location. As there was a number of varying degrees of uh, opinion on this sign, Calgary Planning Commission was unable to come to a specific recommendation to Council as a result of a split motion. As such, CPC moved to forward the application to the public hearing without their recommendation. Therefore, the only recommendation before you today is from administration, that being that the redesignation be refused and that bylaw 1D 2011 be abandoned. Thank you, Mr. Cope. I have been uh, informed by Ms. Flown that if any member of council wishes to table this matter, this would be the time to put that motion forward um, before we open the public hearing. Is there such a motion out there? Your Worship, I wonder if I could ask Ms. Sloan the effect of a tabling. In other words, would the enforcement action continue or would it go into be allowed to continue until such time as the either the task force has completed its work and or uh, the sign review that the administration is proposing to approve? Your Worship, it really depends on the um, uh, parameters of the tabling. Uh, my advice is that if it's to be tabled, it should be tabled to a specific date so that we do not have to re-advertise for a new public hearing. Um, given that a specific date was not set for the other matter to return to Council, um, I'm not sure how Council would want to proceed with that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Your Worship, but I believe the task force was to report by June, was it not? The task force was supposed to report no later than June to LPT, meaning as it wends its way through the, the procedures, if there's a bylaw change, it's supposed to go to CPC, right? Yeah. Which means it may not get back to council before September unless the task force gets it to LPT by May. Okay, so Ms. Flown, if I was to table this now, do not later than uh, December, would that what would the effect of that be? Your Worship, we'd have to re-advertise. We need to have a specific date that the count, that the public knows to come back if they wish to speak to this item. What's the last council meeting in December? What's the, what's the public hearing date in December? Would that satisfy it? 
It could. Um, another option is to table it to a date sooner if you so choose, and it can again be retabled to a specific date. Okay, I'm thinking on my feet here for a moment. Um, Your Worship, I will table this matter. M Mr. Chair or Mr. Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm just wondering if the area alderman might want to do that. The courtesy. Um, you know, by procedure, uh, anyone can do it. I believe the area alderman in question is actually Alderman Chabot now. Oh, is that? It says Chabot in the thing. Oh, it changed to you. Um, so if, as a courtesy, you'd like to see if Alderman Jones would like to do I that. Will, I will ask so. Alderman Jones if he would like to table this to the first public hearing in September, given that uh, July tends to be a bit of a zoo. Or, yeah, the public hearing in September. Alderman Jones? <clears throat> I kind of liked the one in May because I wasn't going to be here. But. <laughs> <clears throat> Your Worship, I was thinking of tabling it anyway because I felt that with the bylaw that was before us, we would probably have to move a section of GG, which is McKnight Boulevard from Deer to Zerfo Trail, the East Barlow anyway. So I was thinking of tabling it. I was just waiting for my turn in the lineup. So I'll move, it till, now, I'll move it till September then. Table so it. motion then to table this item to the first public hearing in September, which is, Madam Clerk? Well, 12th of September. Second. Alderman Lowe is seconding it. Um, motion table, as you know, is non-debatable. So on this one, are we agreed? Agreed. Oh. Um, although it's not debatable, I, I certainly need some clarification on something before I can vote on this, and that's in regards to I'll existing use, Your Worship. Is it continue on? That's a Ms. Flown question. Thank you. Your Worship, the, uh, the current land use will be in place and uh, if they're able to apply for a development permit under their current land use, um, they can do so. If their particular land use does not allow for it, then they are precluded from doing so. And I don't know the specifics of their application, so that might be something Mr. Cope can answer. I haven't got a clue. Mr. Cope? Uh, at the current time, the development permit that they had applied for was refused. It was also refused at SDAB. Uh, traditionally, uh, the uh, enforcement order, which is still in place, uh, is held off pending the outcome of all the options for review. All right, then. On the motion to table, then, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Very well then, carried. Thank you. That takes us then, flip, 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 to item 8.1, that's CPC 2011-031, proposed street name and land use redesignation in Sage Hill, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Mr. Oh, Chairman. And just one thing before you start, Mr. Cope. Members of council, I'm just clearing the queue uh, on the lights just for simplicity. If uh, you want your light, turn it back on. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a color mapping here showing the updated R1S districts that were supplied by the applicant, if they'd like to do, receive those. Sage Hill. Okay. R1S, yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. The application that is before you is an application for a redesignation in the community of um, Sage Hill, along with proposed street names for the affected area. The area to be redesignated is 8.99 hectares, is outlined in red, and bounds on Simons Valley Road Northwest and Sage Hill Drive Northwest uh, on the east and the west side, respectively. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing SFUD, Special Purpose Urban Development, uh, De Future Urban Development District, and redesignate the lands to R1 residential, R1S residential to accommodate secondary suites, as well as M1 multi-residential low profile district. The uh, outline plan for the area was considered by Planning Commission and approved. This is an example of it. This mapping shows the updated R1S district, which uh, uh, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending occurs on the flankage lots uh, along the roads uh, in all the affected areas. Uh, the proposed redesignations were supported by Planning Commission. Should also note that the changes to the R1S were supported by the applicant. Therefore, the recommendation is for the council to adopt 
Proposed street names of Sage Bluff, Sage Hollow, and Sage Point. Adopt the proposed redesignation from S FUD to R1, R1S, and M1, and give three readings to bylaw 22D 2011. Great, thanks Mr. Cope. Uh, any questions of clarification for administration? Alderman Lowe? Nope. All right then, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this item? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Your Worship, members of Council, Kathy Oberg with Brown and Associates Planning Group. We're the applicant on behalf of Karma. I have representatives from Karma, DA Watt Transportation, and Stantec Engineering. Should there be any questions that you'd like us to answer? Thank you. Questions for the applicant? Alderman Lowe? Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, uh, Ms. Oberg. And now, this looks just like a residential community only. What, um, what kind of other amenities are there in proximity to this? Because all I see here are houses. I don't see recreation or anything like that. Sure. As part of the um, Sage Hill community, there's quite a, a vast amount of amenities nearby. To the uh, southwest, um, Genesis had approval for, um, there's a, a regional town center um, with a TOD area just southwest. Uh, United has approval for um, a mix of more um, single family and multi uh, directly to the west. Directly to the south um, is the other half of the redevelopment cell. Um, this cell was uh, special in that it was subdivided when it was with the MD um, and got annexed in. So that area to the south got redeveloped, or it, it's gone through land use and it's all high density multifamily. And then to the east, we also have an approval for a mixed use area and some residential, a school site, and then to the north that, some more high density multifamily. And then just to the east of that is the West Nose Creek area. So it's quite a, um, overall when you look at the entire area, quite a bit has been approved to date. Any, any commercial retail? To the southwest, that whole area, there's that future mixed use and there's the office transit hub. Basically, everything in that south area there is all regional commercial. And that's the 600 meter line that I see Yes, there? that's the TOD line, yeah. Which includes? Uh, it includes a portion. The uh, right densities right. to the south were approved at 31.8 units per acre. So when you balance across, um, when we looked at this and, and, and when we sat down with administration, they were hoping for more of an eight to 10 units per acre with the stuff to the north to kind of balance the community. And at the end of the day, I think we end up at about 17.2 units per acre. What about um, uh, MR dedication? The MR for this area was given to the, um, to the MD. There were two sites that were created. There's a site directly to the north. If you look at the very top of the map, there's a municipal reserve site. Um, we've had some discussion with, with parks and the fact that, or maybe there's an op opportunity to do a disposition and, and transfer some into the central part of the community. We're still working on that. Um, there's some studies and whatnot and communication we need to have with parks. JUCC did look at that as part of our application as an option and they were supportive if, if everything worked out well and um, it was agreeable by both parties that they would support a disposition. So we're currently looking at that. Okay, but that doesn't form part of this site. That would be um, moving a, a, a piece of MR within this community. So in other words, moving some from that top parcel. But legislatively. But it's not part of, yeah. It's not a requirement. No, it's not a requirement, no. Because that no. darn MD. We've already given all of our, our municipal reserve, yes. Okay, sorry. Didn't mean to be dis yeah. disparity. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. No further questions. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other, any other questions for the applicant? Very well, then. Thank you, Ms. Oberg. Uh, anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone else in favor? Yeah. What? What? No, no, no. John Carlo had his light. I was too. I was too slow with my. my buzzer. We can ask Ms. Oberg to come back. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. I'm okay. Okay. Uh, anyone else wish to speak in favor? Anyone else wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? Okay. Very well then. We will close the public hearing and take uh, questions for administration and or recommendation. Alderman Lowe. Now, Your Worship, I'll move the recommendation to Planning Commission and three readings of the bylaw. And I'd point out to uh, Council that uh, when we put the R1S lots in, this was uh, very carefully done given the shape and nature of the, the land and the, and the, uh, the way the community was being developed. So the, you'll notice that the R one S lots have been placed in flankage situations to facilitate parking and to facilitate the rules around R one S as we understand it today. So uh, there it is, and I'd ask your support. Thank you. 
Thanks, Alderman. Well, I feel like that issue may come up later in the agenda somewhere. It's just, just a sense. Alderman Collier card seconded that. Uh, Alderman Carra. <clears throat> Thank you. I've got a question uh, with the two long linear sort of block frontages that internally I assume front onto uh, the internal road network, but back onto Sage Hill Drive Northwest and back onto Simon Valley Road Northwest, respectively. Yes. Um, has there been any consideration for? Who is responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of those defense ways that will be backing onto those public right of ways? I believe standard practice, and I would stand corrected, is that any uh, standard fences that are built as part of the subdivision process uh, are located on private property and therefore it would be the responsibility of the individual property owner. So what we start to get into is the kind of mess that we've already learned that we've made for ourselves where you have a uh, privately owned fences that enter into various states of repair and disrepair and no means to deal with them en masse. Uh, unless the uh, fence is being maintained as part of a sound attenuation device. Well, right that's what I'm asking. Case. Yes. That's what I'm asking. Has that been the case? Uh, I'm not sure for Sage Hill Drive Northwest. I think that may just be a common fence uh, to prevent access to Sage Hill Drive. Uh, I believe along Simons Valley Road Northwest there is a grade differential there. Uh, so the need for sound attenuation fencing might not be required. Uh, however, I'd have to go back to the outline plan to confirm that. Well. You know, in general, I understand the uh, layout of this, but I think that we're making mistakes uh, by creating property that is single loaded and sur surrounded by right of way on both sides. I mean, what we're basically doing is we're creating properties that, you know, couldn't even begin to address, you know, th they've got two roads basically. So from the property tax base that we're pulling out of the area, we're, we're double loading the tax load. And, you know, from a maintenance perspective, we're starting to create problems. Was any of this discussed at CPC? None of that was discussed at CPC, no. Okay, so Simons Valley Road is, a, a, what's the classification of that road? I believe it is a major. Yes, major. Okay, and that's right across the street from the, uh, from the school site? A uh, school site would back onto it, yes. Okay, is there any, um, has there any, any provision made for kids who live in this neighborhood to cross Simons Valley Road to the uh, to the school site? I believe only at the intersections as shown, which are uh, controlled by traffic lights. Okay. Is it a mono sidewalk or a separated sidewalk uh, along 136th Avenue? 136, which is the south boundary there. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that would probably be a mono. Yeah, could be either apparently. It could be either? Could be either, yeah. So this has not been worked out yet? No, it would be worked out the, at the DP uh, stage? Development agreement as part of, with part of the subdivision. Okay, how do I find out about the maintenance of the, because uh, the, we've, already we've already got ourselves into a mess with this, and are we repeating the mistakes of the past, or are we considering this? Your Worship, maybe I could just add, there is a review underway currently of the, the fence maintenance policy for the reasons you've identified, and it's being led by the Director of Roads. And I believe a number, I believe Alderman Stevenson has been uh, one of the people leading the charge behind that. So there is a review going on. I'm not sure of the time frame for reporting, but we acknowledge that there have been issues in the past of exactly the nature that you're identifying. Mm -hmm. There isn't a quick answer to it, unfortunately. Yeah, so, I mean, I've also asked to be part. Alderman Stevens, has, has that committee met yet since we talked about it? No. Okay, no, so it, it's, it's moving slowly. But it hasn't met. I just uh, was in a meeting about three or four weeks ago just to um, get the ball rolling. Okay, well, I'm eager to be a part of that as okay. well. And uh, I'm just questioning, are we just creating more of a mess for ourselves before we solved it well, here? Unfortunately, there isn't an easy answer to it. 
Well, I mean, the, the, the easy answer is to put the maintenance of that fence into some sort of common title. Does that happen here at the land use stage, or does it happen at the DP stage? Um, even with the suggestion that you're making, that, that unfortunately isn't, isn't the answer as I understand it. It's quite a complex web of legal intricacies. There isn't a simple answer to it, and we couldn't do something here on the floor of council in that regard. So would it happen at this stage or would it happen at the DP stage, solving this in terms of? There is no development permit required for that. Okay, so they go right to a building permit. Well, the individual homes do. Their, the common fence would be provided by the developer, but it's the issue of long-term maintenance that we are grappling with and how best to handle it. It is challenging. Okay. So in the absence of having done in the absence of having solved it, we're creating more issues for ourselves by... Well, we're, we're hoping to find a solution, but we are adding to the existing dilemma. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Axworthy. Um, you done, Alderman Carell? Alderman Chabot, please. Thank you. Actually, I was going to ask one a similar question, but I, I don't see it identified here on the plan. It is going to form part of this development, is a perimeter fence? Uh, I'd have to look at the conditions of uh, the outline plan, which approved by council uh, by CPC. Normally speaking, if there's a requirement for common fencing, that forms part of the uh, subdivision approval and the development agreement when it comes in. So development permit approval. Development agreement. Agreement. Yes, for the okay, servicing. There's the, nothing as yet on this, is there? No, only the outline plan has been approved. Uh, the condition, oh, I mean, in terms of development? No, as far as that perimeter fencing? Uh, no, nothing at this time. Okay, so we haven't really created this problem yet. Physically, we have not, no. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're working on creating a problem. We're working on it. We're eager to create the problem. <laughs> um, in regards to uh, uh, regional... Um, mobility options, all I see is monolithic sidewalks. I don't see any kind of regional pathway. Is there anything in here? Leave the path, leave the pathways we're showing on this location map. Uh, we're running along the ravine, along 37th, or uh, sorry, Sage Hill Drive, uh, northwest, the red lines. So this area would connect to the west, uh, down to the ravine system and over to Nose, West Nose Creek. Uh, but nothing. Other than that, it would have to connect through the uh, sidewalk system into the uh, regional network along the creek. Unless something comes up from the south through that other development that hasn't occurred I don't believe yet. that is the case, but uh, there's always that option, I suppose. That's not, uh, that hasn't been subject to a subdivision plan yet? Uh, the lands to the south have outline plan approval and land use. Okay. And no regional pathway going through there. As no, far as I believe know. it's showing along uh, Sage Hill Drive. Yeah. And um, where that future school site is there, what is that I see in the bottom right-hand corner? Is that a little bit of green space there? Future school site to the to the east. Yeah. If you keep following that through, yeah, right there. Right in that little corner down there, is that a little bit of green that I see there? Uh, yes, the, the red line would be the pathway that runs through the Nose Creek system. That would be the boundary between the adjacent, uh, uh, I believe that's the, the existing farmstead down there, which is being preserved. That little green space that I see there going east-west. Oh, I see. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, that would be a connector from the roadway into the uh, Nose into Creek that. Park okay. system, West Nose Creek Park system. Uh, it almost looks like it might connect up. Okay, those are all the questions I had. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions for administration or debate on this matter? Yes. Um, I'm just question. Whose diagram is this? Who's the author of this diagram? Uh, that was provided to us from the uh, from Brown and applicants, Associates. which is Brown and Associates. Yeah, I guess my only question to Brown and Associates is why a walkway, which is a linear feature, is delineated by a asterisk. Sorry? Those, those red asterisks, what are the, am I reading that right, that that's a proposed walkway? 
you know, the walkways are shown in red, the red So line. what is the, red, what's the asterisk, according to the legend? Yeah. The red starry thing. Oh, so I'm sorry that uh, they are, they must be uh, the three meter walkways that connect uh, roadways to other roadways between lots. Oh, I see their, I see their connections through the cul-de-sac for humans right. as opposed take to you cars. Take the cul-de-sac onto the major roads. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Marr. Um, at Alderman Lowe, did you want to close? What did I say? Oh, dear. <laughs> Closed. Um, on the recommendations, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Uh, I think I just saw two. Low, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Losing all your names. Kara and Farrell are opposed. Anyone else? Okay. Um, we'll go into the readings of the bylaw then. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Kara is opposed. And Farrell? Same division, council, are we agreed? Any opposed? All right. How do we do that? <laughs> Second reading of the bylaw, same division? Are we agreed? Any opposed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw. This one I have to do separately. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Very well then. Third reading of the bylaw, same division. Are we agreed? Any opposed? All right. Same division then. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to 8.2. Road closure and land use redesignation in Scarborough, Mr. Cope. That's uh, item CPC 2011-32. Thank you, Your Worship. The proposed application incorporates a road closure application as well as a land use to redesignate the closed road to RC1, which is the adjacent land use to the site. The land in question is shown in red on the location map and is land which currently forms part of the church property and is not required for travel. Proposal is to dispose of this reserve, uh, this road closed, closed road, uh, and sell the land or exchange the land with the church on the adjacent site. Uh, the proposed uh, proposal was considered by Planning Commission. Uh, they are recommending that Council adopt the proposed closure and give three readings to Bylaws 3C, Bylaw 3C 2011. And secondly, that they adopt the proposed redesignation from undesignated road right of way to RC1 and give three readings to bylaw 23D 2011. Area in question being shown on the screen right now. Thank you, Mr. Cope. You. Any questions of clarification for administration? Alderman Carr, question of clarification? I'm assuming that the uh, land use redesignation is to bring it in. Is the church currently the R? The, the church R is currently zoned RC1. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Cope. Um, we'll open the public hearing then. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this application? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this application? Anyone wish to speak in opposition? All right, then the public hearing is closed. Alderman Marr? Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, move the recommendations of the administration. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Farrell is seconding. Any questions or discussion on this one? All right, then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, bylaw 3C 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And on bylaw 23D 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Very well, thank you. Uh, item 8.3, please. Uh, CPC 2011-33, land use redesignation in Chaparral. Thank you, Your Worship. The area affected by this proposed redesignation is outlined on red on your location map uh, on the screen. Uh, the proposal is to take the land from the existing R2M residential low density multiple dwelling district and redesignate the lands to R2 residential one and two dwelling district. 
purpose of the redesignation is to allow for the individual sites which have been previously approved to be developed with uh, zero lot line type single detached development. Should note as a result of this uh, redesignation, there will be no change in the actual density for the sites uh, with a total of 15 line lot, 59 lots actually continuing to be developed. Proposed redesignation will allow for the single detached homes to be considered a permitted use, eliminating the need for a discretionary land development permit for each of the sites. Therefore, uh, Calgary Planning Commission, in consideration of the facts, are recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation from R2M to R2 and that three readings be given to proposed bylaw 24D 2011. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Cope. Anyone, uh, any questions of clarification for administration? Aldrin Chabot. Oh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just a quick one, Mr. Cope. R2 lists um, secondary suites as a, uh, as a permitted use. And so if it transitions to R2, it could be 59 lots with second uh, plus As permitted 59. uses, there would be that opportunity for secondary suites in each of the units, yes. Thank you, Your Worship. No further questions. Thanks for that clarification. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any other questions of clarification? Very well, then we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this application? Your Worship, members of Council, Kathy Oberg with Brown and Associates Planning Group. On behalf of GenStar, we're the applicants. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I have one. I just thought I heard Mr. Cope say that the overall density is not changing. It won't change. So we're just moving from a place where one could have had townhouses to a place where one will have duplexes. Is that right? Actually, it's a, it could have taken semi-detached, and instead we're looking at a different product that maintains the same density, actually the same size of lot, mm -hmm. except with the zero lot line. It um, just gives another product in this area. Oh, They've I got see. quite a bit of semis and townhouses and multifamily. It just offers one other choice. So these will be detached, here. but they different. Will be, yes, but the servicing, the way it's been lotted out and uh, serviced, we could go either way. We could do either the zero lot line or the semi-detached. Terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for the applicant, Alderman Carra? Yeah, can you just give me a little more clarity as to what that actually looks like typologically? Sure. sure. So this here is just a sample streetscape of what a zero uh, lot line product would look like. Um, the tentative plan has been submitted for the um, for this area, and um, whether we go with semi-detached uh, units or we go with the sample streetscape, um, they would lot it exactly the same. The one thing that we will have to do with um, with the zero lot line is we do have to submit a development permit, a comprehensive development permit for the whole area, because you're going with a zero lot line. Um, it's basically a relaxation and there's some other building code um, components that, that kick in. But um, there will be another level of application that gets submitted on a comprehensive level and that will give the city the assurances of the product that would be going in with the zero lot line product. Explain to me what zero lot line, how it's, that applies to what looks like. It's a typical, what it does is it, it, um, it gives a five foot dif uh, distance between the houses so they're a little bit closer together. So that's where the fire, um, there's fire construction elements that are part of the houses. So they end up a little bit closer together. So you're essentially, you're almost taking the, the distance that you'd have with a semi, you're giving a little bit more kind of between the houses, not as much as you'd get in a typical subdivision or a typical, a typical um, R1 zoning, for example, or R2 zoning, um, but it just brings them a little bit closer and you, and you give a different product. So you end up with a single family house, but at the same density level as a, as a semi. So a different product for the area that will, um, the market currently is responding to very well. What, what does the glazing look like in those, in the, on the side yards? On the side yards? Um, I might have to get um, Paul Boskowitz from Genstar to talk to that a little bit more, specifically because he's been in contact with the builders more so than myself. Do you have another, any other questions of myself before I pass it over no, to you? No, I'm, I'm interested in that. I mean, I'm just, it seems to me like we're going for like, you know, the density of townhouses without the environmental efficiency of party walls. So if we're doing that, the question is, what are the benefits? And I, I would hope it's sort of like the flood of light that enters the, uh, the spaces because of all the glazing you have on the sidewalls, but with five feet, that doesn't allow for a lot under the fire code. So I'm just curious. So Alderman Carra, I too am curious, this is very interesting, um, and I'll allow it. 
but I should warn you that we are going beyond our jurisdiction in a public hearing on land use. Okay. But nonetheless, I'll allow this one because it's interesting. I, okay, I'm going to ask for a point of clarification on that. Okay. Paul Boskovich with GenStar. Um, I can't answer that question with absolute certainty, but my understanding is that there there is not uh, windows on the houses there uh, in between each house uh, for fire r reasons. This is not unlike in the uh, inner city where you see infills that some of them are attached and some of them are detached, but they're, they're quite close to each other. This just allows the house to be built right on the property line and there's an access easement. Okay, so, so you have one wall of the house is on the property line, and then you've got five feet, and then you've got the wall of the house. Is there a side yard contemplated in, in that space, or? There's, there's an access easement on the, on the other side of each house. So there's an access easement, so the other house has access along the side yard. This, uh, this product is actually quite common in the city of Calgary. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks, Alderman Curran. Just, just for clarification, it's because we were getting to areas of safety code, which are outside of the jurisdiction that we have today. Yeah, well, just a point of order. I mean, I, I, I yeah, I, I guess I was asking, I mean, we've asked for a certain density, and at certain densities, you get certain efficiencies, and it seems like we're removing that efficiency for an aesthetic look. I'm just trying to oh, wrap enough. my mind around this. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the applicant who's already left? <laughs> All right, then. Um, anyone else wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? All right, then. Oh. We'll close the public hearing. And, oh, yeah, well, shall we finish this one? Alderman Dumont? I'd like to move the recommendation to the administration. And three readings of the bylaw. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Any further discussion on this one? All right, then. On the recommendations, are we in favor? Agreed. Thank you. Any opposed? Very well, then. Carried. On first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Very well then, we are recessed until 3.47. Eight, I counted. <laughs> and we're back. Just barely. So, we are now at item 8.4 in your agenda, CPC 2011, already <laughs> 034. Uh, the longest public hearing ever. <laughs> Uh, CPC 2011-034, land use re-exit designation in the neighborhood of Mahogany. Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. The area affected by the proposed redesignation is outlined on red on the location map on the screen. Proposed redesignation will take the lands from the existing SUN, Special Purpose Urban Nature District, and redesignate the lands to SSPR for Municipal uh, Park and SCRI, Special Purpose City and Regional Infrastructure District, to accommodate a lift station. Proposed lands were previously designated SUN as part of an outline plan process. At that time, uh, it was, wasn't recognized that the main pathway system would run through the natural area. Uh, the SUN district is intended for, for environmental reserve type uh, uses. In that respect, this will correct that situation, designate the lands uh, to SSPR and eventually MR, Municipal Reserve, as well as the purple area being 
used as SCRI for a lift station. This will accommodate the design aspects of the outline plan and it was supported by Calgary Planning Commission. In that respect, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt the proposed redesignation from SUN to SCRI and SSPR and that three readings be given to bylaw 25D 2011. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Any questions of clarification for administration on this one? All right, seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Anyone wish to speak in opposition to this proposal? Any in opposition? Very well then, Alderman Keating. So move the uh, bylaw and the three readings. Thank you. The administration recommendations. I would like to move that we refer this, or that we, sorry, table this for two months, please. The reason is um, there, there's a Center Street um, corridor comprehensive study that's going to be done on this, or on the area, and we're not, I'm not clear on what the relationship is between this and that study, and um, what the impact would be. Uh, yes, that's the uh, May 9th meeting, Your Worship. Yeah, if I may, through, through the chair to Mr. Watson, I believe, just wondering as to the timing of his Center Street um, review that's underway. Through the Chair, Alderman Chabot, we, we're just starting to scope out that work. It certainly won't be done by, by May, uh, though Alderman McCaud has spoken to me about wanting to talk about that, plus work in Highland Park in general. So, I mean, it, uh, <clears throat> it's up to Council to decide whether or not you want to put this off for two months to have those conversations or whether you want to deal with it today. And in two months, are we going to be further ahead in this process? Will we know anything more? Well, we'll know a bit more, but whether or not, you know, I can't speak for Alderman McLeod, whether she'll feel more comfortable in proceeding forward on this in two months or not. But oh, well, interesting. we can certainly provide some information and talk to the Highland Park community. So. Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks, Alderman Thanks, Alderman Chabot. And clarification. Um, tabling the motion in front of us to table this to the May 9th combined meeting of council, not 19th, 9th. Um, so on that tabling motion, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed, carried, thank you. That takes us to item 8.6 in your agenda, CPC 2011-036, land use redesignation in the downtown commercial core, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. The area affected by the proposed redesignation is located on 7th Avenue Southwest. The lands affected are outlined in red and form a portion of the existing DC Direct Control District currently in place. The land use will take the lands from the DC Direct Control District, which is tied to plans, and redesignate the lands to the standard downtown district of CM2 Downtown Business District. The uh, redesignation will allow the site to be redeveloped on its own in uh, a similar pattern as to the adjacent lands. Uh, in that respect, it is recommended that Council adopt the proposed redesignation. Uh, the area affected on the air photo or the photograph shown to you right now. It is recommended that Council adopt the proposed redesignation to take the lands from direct control to CM2 and that three readings be given to proposed bylaw 27D 2011. Questions of clarification for administration? Alderman Carra. 
Um, just a question. I mean, obviously, that's a pretty rundown little stretch. Was there a discussion of the heritage character of the site and whether there should be any, or does that not take place? That would take state? place in conjunction with any development permit for the site. Okay. I should note that the existing DC, which a uh, portion of which will remain on 8th Avenue, part of that designation is to protect the heritage condition of those sites on 8th Avenue, not this particular site on 7th. So in terms of protecting this, is this, okay. All right, <clears throat> thank you. On clarification, Alderman Putmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, forgive my simple question. I, it's a function of process. I'm aware of these plans f from this developer, and it's all very exciting and, and would be a wonderful addition to this very difficult area with some very innovative approaches to parking and all the rest of it. I'm just intrigued why we're coming in with a land use application at this point in the process. Are you able to address that, or is that a fair question to you? Um, I can address it briefly, I suppose. The redesignation right now, or the designation on the site right now is direct control, which is tied to plans. There is no opportunity to do anything else on the site other than that was originally proposed, I believe, back in 1983. Yeah, in here, so. uh, which is clearly not what the intention the applicants have to do with the land now. So in order to get the site into a position where ongoing planning can occur, they need to redesignate the site to allow that to happen. I guess that's my question. Why do we have to redesignate to allow planning to continue? Are there financing implications or investment? Or that would be, have to be a, a question you put to the applicant. Is, yeah, is there anyone to address that? I, not, yes. Well, it might not be appropriate. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cope. Thank you. Mr. Cope, I, ha I actually have one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a note in here that says something about um, the density um, under the density levels permitted under the proposed CM2 are lower than the 20.1 FAR approved under the existing DC. Can you just speak to that for a moment? Um, what, what's the difference? CM2, uh, the standard district, has a base uh, um, base density of seven FAR, based on the what it's called the uh, um, A bonus provisions, A group provi provisions. You can get additional density uh, using Group B and Group C bonusing to build up your your densities on the site. I'm presuming, on although I do not have it before me at this time, the existing DC incorporated all those things based on the exact proposed plans that were being provided, and so uh, that exact density is no longer available to the site unless they do something similar with the Group A, B, and C provisions. Thank you, that's very helpful. Seeing no further questions of clarification, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this application? Anyone wish to speak in favor? Good afternoon. My name is Neil Richardson, president of Heritage Property Corporation, and we're the applicant in this matter. I don't really intend to uh, make a presentation, but I'll certainly uh, answer any questions that council may have. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Alderman Putmans, do you want to ask your question now? Yes. Uh, thank you. And um, thank you, Mr. Richardson. I'm aware of your projects and the number of wonderful ones you've contributed to the downtown core, so thank you. The uh, Just a question of process at this point. Do Are your Maybe it's an industry que indiscreet question, so if, if you want to avoid it, that's fine. But are, are your pr plans progressed to a certain point where this is necessary? I'm just intrigued by where we're at in the process. We've, uh, we've been working with administration for a little over two years. And when we first approached them, there was a, a debate about whether we should apply for our own DC zoning for the site or whether we should uh, uh, do what we're doing now, which is, which is applied to sort of remove the existing DC and proceed with a development permit. The challenge we have is the site is currently zoned with land that we, know, that we don't own. It's, it involves uh, part of the laneway. It involves part of uh, properties that are owned on 8th Avenue. And the original 1983 plan was to connect them and build this 52-story building on our piece of the land. And at the end of the uh, discussions with the administration, it was determined that the proper way wouldn't be to apply for another DC zoning, but to basically erase the current one and go through a development permit process. So that's what we're choosing to do. William, thank you. Perhaps, uh, 
Perhaps Mr. Watson can add a little bit more clarification to this question. Oh, thank you. Sure. Through the chair, thank you. Well, actually, Mr. Richardson's actually made it quite clear of the, uh, and I, I had something to do with the 26Z83, which was, I'll, I'll tell council, a beautiful development, but it will never be realized, and it, it is one of the challenges with DC, which gets stale after a while. It'd be very difficult for Mr. Richardson or anyone to do anything on that site with that zoning except build what was approved 20 some years ago. So in order to do anything else, and partly because it's a split ownership now, it was all one ownership at one time, uh, this is the most efficient way to get us back to a level playing field so we can start over again. <coughs> really a housekeeping matter, I believe, in order to get us to the zoning that then we can continue discussions on Mr. Richardson's idea or any others in the downtown. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Thanks. Uh, Alderman Farrell for Mr. Richardson. Thank you. Thank you for being here today, Mr. Richardson. And I have to say, a lot of people breathed a sigh of relief when you purchased this block. Now we need to figure out how to move forward in, in preserving some important heritage. I think it would be important important for new members of council und to understand what your aspirations are for this block. So I'm wondering if you take a minute to just go over some of your ideas. So they would maybe put into context um, why this application is before us and how important this block is to the history of Calgary. I think that this is a very interesting and useful question and I'll invite Mr. Richardson to answer it briefly. But I will remind you that we have to be careful not to go beyond what we're being asked to decide today. We're not making a decision on mm -hmm. what Mr. Richardson is about to describe to us. We're simply making a decision on changing the zoning of this parcel. Yes, and I, I think that's an important clarification. Previous members of council have been aware of, of this issue. It's been discussed for some time. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, the uh, property is located mid-block on 7th Avenue, so it doesn't include lands to the east or west of it, so it's somewhat landlocked. Um, it's also located on 7th Avenue that has no vehicle access to it because of the, uh, the LRT corridor. Um, the heritage buildings are probably um, important individually, but they're really more important as a collection. Um, the heritage planner calls it Stephen Avenue's little sister because it's one of the few um, intact streetscapes uh, left from the early 1900s up to about the uh, 1920s, 1930s. What our concept is for the site is to restore the heritage buildings and put arts and culture uses into the buildings so they'll be compatible with some of the surrounding developments with the uh, uh, what used to be the cultural district, what used to be called the Olympic Plaza Cultural District, the Art Central across the street, the uh, um, Grand Theatre a block or so away, the Epcor Center, but also to make the economics of the development work, we intend to build a robotic parkade that's accessed off the back lane. So it can be a small parkade and structure, it can be um, non-obtrusive to the heritage buildings um, and allow the heritage buildings to be preserved while still providing uh, what we hope is an amenity in terms of parking for the neighborhood. And that in, in a nutshell is the development. Okay, thank you, I think help, that helps a little, thank you. Thanks very much, Alderman Farrell. Alderman Collier, cart for Mr. Richardson. All right, anyone else for Mr. Richardson? Thank you for being here today, sir. Anyone else like to speak in favor of this application? Anyone else speak in favor? Anyone like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Anyone in opposition? All right then, Alderman Farrell. Thank you, I would like to move the recommendations of CPC in three readings. Thanks, and Alderman Marr has seconded that motion. Any further discussion or questions for administration? All right then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, that takes us to disposition of public reserve, item 9.1 in your agenda, CPC 2011-037. Disposal of reserve in the neighborhood of Cougar Ridge, Mr. Cope. Thank you, Your Worship. The area affected by this redesignation or disposal of reserve is located in Cougar Ridge, the area outlined in red, uh, just uh, south of the 
uh, COP residential development, which is ongoing. The proposal will take the existing strip of reserve land and remove the MR designation, allowing for an increase in size of the adjacent uh, stormwater retention pond. We have an aerial photo showing the existing pond and the stretch of green space as it now exists. And the additional photo that we have showing the land from 85th Street, the uh, current condition of the pond and the land to which the pond is going to be extended into. In that respect, JUCC has supported the uh, removal of the reserve designation with the promise that a, an equivalent amount of land will be dedicated in the COP development, which you can just see on the right-hand side of that uh, picture, uh, will provide some additional land for reserve as part of their development area. Until that does occur, a deferred reserve caveat in the amount owing will be registered on the appropriate title. In that respect, uh, Calgary Planning Commission is recommending that Council adopt by resolution the disposition of 0.421 hectares of reserve land and that Council direct a designated officer to notify the Registrar of the South Alberta Land Titles Office that the requirements of the MGA have been fulfilled and that the removal of the municipal reserve designation is appropriate. Mr. Cope, I have a question of clarification on this one. I was a little bit confused by this one because we have three different parties, um, including Windsport Canada and Canada Olympic Park. So just tell me if I'm describing the situation correctly. The expansion of the stormwater pond will assist in the redevelopment of Canada Olympic Park and that's why they're willing to give up some of their land for reserve. Did I get that right? As I understand it, the expansion is required to accommodate the additional lands being developed with COP, which is in the white area just north of the lands being uh, disposed of. Uh, so in return uh, for that accommodation, COP will provide reserve land in addition to what they are required to provide on their site north of the uh, what's called the 4th Avenue Southwest alignment there. Okay. Within the white area, they will provide additional reserve land in compensation for this MR land. Okay, thank you. That's, that's what I thought I understood, but I wanted to clarify Alderman Putman's. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I've discussed this with the community association and others in the area. Uh, they're well aware of it from previous discussions during outline plan stage and are very comfortable with this. So I've, it's an appropriate time to move. Uh, we have to have a public hearing. Oh, we have to, oh, we're having a full public hearing. Oh, okay. So just about. <laughs> Um, but we will open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this proposal? Good afternoon, Your Worship, members of Council. Um, Richard Priest, Chief Operating Officer with Apex. Um, not really going to make a presentation. I think it was well covered. Thank you very much. Uh, just wanted to uh, say thank you very much to administration for the very expeditious process that uh, uh, they undertook for us to get this project through the approval stage and, any, uh, and get us to the point where we're at now. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions of council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Priest. And uh, Mr. Watson uh, highlighted for me that you were thanking us for the expeditious process, which we uh, don't always hear at these public hearings. <laughs> any questions for Mr. Priest? All right, then. Oh, oh, Alderman Putmans? Considering, Mr. Priest, you made the uh, trip down, we... <laughs> <laughs> I just like <laughs> this. Um, uh, when will construction start? When will you be... Will, you, will there be much construction in terms of expanding the... Um... Uh, the, the construction of the pond has been uh, completed, actually. Oh, yeah, it's already completed. So now, uh, oh, yeah, the liner's in, was, everything's in. Oh, I thought there was more work to be done on the north side. Uh, no, now it's just the landscaping. Oh, well, I'm glad I asked the question. Yeah, no, Thank all the much. pipes are in, the liner's in, and everything. It's, uh, uh, and in fact, phase one is built. What you can see up there, R1, R1N, and R1S, that's all constructed. So we're just waiting, to, waiting for conditions to put the pavement down and the landscaping around the pond. Thank you very much. And then the next step is burying that uh, 138 kV power line. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Priest? Okay, thank you for being here right. today, sir. Thank you. 
Anyone else like to speak in favor of this application? Anyone else in favor? Anyone else speak against this application? Anyone in opposition? Very well then, Alderman Putmans. So moved, I move that we uh, proceed with this recommendation. Second. Thanks, and, and Alderman Chabot is seconding. And three, um, three There's more. There's no bylaw. No, no bylaw, okay. So, any discussion on this one, folks? All right then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Hodges is opposed. Carried. Thank you. That takes us to the end of our public hearing. We'll place some musical chairs here and move to the regular portion of our meeting. Uh, for the um, interest of the members of the gallery, uh, the rest of the public hearing is, um, the rest of our council meeting is certainly open to the public and you're welcome to stick around, but there will not be an opportunity for the public to make submissions. The items in the rest of this have largely, um, those that required public hearings have already had that happen at the committee level. All right, so that takes us to 10.1.1 in your agenda, which is um, Amendment to Council's Civic Census Policy. Can I have someone move this to get it on the floor, please? Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Keating. Uh, we'll let everyone else flip to it. Um, and I wonder if administration wants to introduce this at all? No. No? All right, Alderman Hodges? No. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Worship. Yeah, it is, except for uh, one small item. Uh, what's the question that uh, Transportation Department wants in the census? What are we quizzing the public on? Uh, GM Logan's not quite here yet. Can I defer that question? We'll get to another couple people on the list and we'll bring it back. Because I don't see him coming. <laughs> That's the only question. Uh... Your Worship, Ms. Cedar is here. Oh, is she? Oh, great. Ms. Cedar, why don't you take that one? Your Worship, um, the question that we're going to be asking um, citizens is the triannual question. It'll be starting this year. Um, and our question actually is what mode of transportation did you take to the last day you worked? And uh, the selection is basically by um, bicycle by walking, by di different modes in our legend. And if the individual is not working, either as a volunteer or in terms of paid employment, then what? Then that is left blank. No response. No response. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Alderman Lowe? Thank you, Your Worship. And on the same question, yes. I, I had a question on, on the question. Uh, it says you're only offering that question to one individual in a household. Why? Um, it's just a random survey. I can't answer to the transportation requirements. I think that would be best answered by um, somebody from transportation and planning. Okay, it just struck me as odd because most houses now, many houses nowadays have. In Indeed, fact, it's, it's, a random, it's, it's a random. It's it's a random response that they'd like to get a, a nice mix up but again you would need to get somebody from transportation and planning to answer to that okay my second question uh, had to do with the school board information and uh, you know I, I understand there's a cost sharing arrangement between CBE and the Catholic board but do we have other boards in the city or operating in the city now do we provide information for them and do we get is there an exchange uh, of resources? Lines? Thank you. Your Lord. Worship, no. The agreement is simply with the two boards that you have mentioned. Uh -huh. What about the, the, uh, the French board? What about the charter schools they, and so on? Uh, I, I do not believe that uh, they have been in contact with Barb Clifford, um, who I could take this question back to and have her respond. Yeah, I'd, also, you know, I'd be curious also to know about, uh, you know, we have an increasing population of private schools in the city. Which the question on the census is, is basically given, the question we ask is um, not related to tax dollars. It's simply an opinion to see what the demographics are. Um, so there are selections of other, other being homeschooling or through other means. Okay, yeah, I, I would think it would be the other that I'd be interested mm -hmm. in. You know, what, what percentage of our population is not using 
the Catholic board or the, or the public board, and you know, where else are they going here and what's the impact on us? But that's just an observation, Your Worship. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Um, did you want to ask your question again now that Mr. Logan is here? I will, Mr. Logan. I, in the, uh, the transportation questions being asked is of one individual in the house, what was your last mode of trend, you know, when you went to work? My question was why only one person in the household? Given that many, many households now have more than one person employed or doing volunteer work. Uh, your Worship, um, to be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure, but you are correct. It is, is it, it, it is specific to whomever the person is that has the next birthday is what I'm advised. If there's more than one person in the household that's working, then I was just checking yeah. the instructions. That, that actually, all right, that actually does make sense. I, I feel like I've been lecturing people on stats a lot this weekend since well, we got polls come out. Feel last free, week. Your Worship, because that was one subject I never did well. In. <laughs> so it's a, it's a what, what uh, Mr. Logan is saying is it's a purely random sample. Mm -hmm. So they only want a random person. They don't want to know the whole family because that would skew the sample if they all carpool or whatever. So they're just picking a random person in the house based on their birthday so that we get a fully randomized sample through the city. Okay, and I can understand that part. I guess I'd, I would have been more interested in the quantums mm. because that's what's going to come back and whack us in the head here. Mm. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Chabot? Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship. Lower than Chabot, it's a common theme. Thank you. Um, I had the same question for Mr. Logan, and thank you for that response. Not necessarily like it, but um, uh, Ms. Cedar, um, through this last election and, this, and the census that we got, or the, the voters list that we got, I, I noticed that there was a number of people that have been residing in their residence for a number of years that weren't on this year's census. And I'm just wondering, do we ever carry forward information? Uh, the census and the voters list, Your Worship, are two different processes. Um, so I can speak to the census. I would prefer to leave the election to Barbara Clifford. Um, census, we don't collect any personal data. There are no names associated. There are indeed addresses, and addresses have a tendency to change, uh, thereby dwellings being removed and another dwelling going in its place. Um, I am uncertain as to your question as to uh, the growth pattern. No, I'm just wondering why some people who had lived in their residence for so many years weren't on the, on the, the elect enumeration. enumeration list, yeah. That would have to be directed to Barbara Clifford. Okay. And I can indeed pass that question along to you. I'm here to speak to the census today. All right. Okay, specific to the census. No names. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, you for that. Um, so determination of secondary suites. How, how do we go about making that determination? We don't, Your Worship. We simply ask the question um, of dwelling units. How many people reside at this dwelling? Yeah, I'm just wondering how we can facilitate getting a better, more clear response out of that. If there's like two mailboxes, that's usually pretty indicative of the fact that there's two residences, but. It's an outstanding question, Alderman Chabot. Um, I'm not going to put Ms. Flown on the spot right at the moment, but it's a bit weird to ask someone to describe whether they're engaging in an illegal activity as part of a census, no? But we don't ask for names, right? Correct, we don't. I, I'm just... What do you think, Ms. Flown? <laughs> Your Worship, we can ask all sorts of things, but people are not required to answer. Mm. Interesting. So we can't arbitrarily make an assessment on our own, is what you're saying? No, the census is not mandatory, exactly. Um, it's up to the individual whether they wish to participate or not. You see, my point, Your Worship, is that I believe there are more secondary suites than we've identified. And, <laughs> and I think it would, be, it would be probably wise to know roughly how many there are. Whether or not people choose to admit that there's a secondary suite, there's certainly a number of different ways that we can assess whether or not there are secondary suites. And so that's you know, the reason I'm asking that. You know, I don't disagree with you. And I think that um, maybe, maybe you can answer this question, which is if 
Alderman Chabot were to make a motion today, perhaps later on in this agenda, um, to add a question on secondary suites to the civic census, what's the timing on that? Could we actually do that for the 2011 census or are we too late? Uh, your Worship, it's too late. Everything is now in place. We are in fact training as we speak. Figured, because it's we April, will be, isn't it? Indeed, we are going out April 1st. Every oh. year it's April 1st. We could, some, we could perhaps consider this for a future census if we wanted to. Uh, that could be considered in a future census, Your Worship. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I, uh, I appreciate that advice, and it's certainly something I will take under advisement. Um, now, Ms. Cedar, if I may ask as well, in regards to the percentage of responses, um, I know my wife has done stuff before, but I think it's probably more for the enumeration uh, aspect where there was a very uh, small tolerance in regards to the number of homes that you could not record information on. What's your what's your typical response requirement from your? Your Worship, we ask that one percent of the assigned area be unable to contact. That's a goal we we strive for. Um, whether or not we can achieve that, it is dependent on um, participation. Yes. But that is generally what we, we hope to See, achieve. Your Worship, and the reason I asked the previous question to this one is because I think the two are kind of inex inextricably linked, i.e., is there a secondary suite and is there somebody responding at that secondary suite? You see what I'm getting at? One percent is based on registered addresses, right? Your Worship, may I um, add on to that? Sure. Unable to contact means exactly that, that the person wasn't there at a numerous attempts. And there's no way we could get the information. If the individual isn't there at a certain point, we will go to a neighbor and ask. That neighbor won't know whether or not, whether they choose to answer correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Unable to contact means that there is no information. We also have other codings such as uh, no, they don't want to participate, no information, but that's not an unable to contact. Right. Well, the secondary suite might be an unable to contact if we could identify that it was a secondary suite is my point. Anyways, I, I, I guess that's all I need to know for now. I do the get you, but it's asking. an interesting um, flight of fancy for our discussion today. Well, but the it's fact an important it's, one. The fact that the question is there, I think, is um, is at least a very valid attempt to make those assessments. No, I think you're right. Thank you for that. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any further discussion on this item? Alderman Lowe, did you want to close? All right, then. Uh, on the recommendation to adopt the amended civic census policy, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 10.1.2, then, uh, in your agenda. Uh, report on the City of Calgary's communication function. A reminder that during our budget deliberations we asked for this report um, and here it is. So I'll take a motion to get this one on the table. Thanks Alderman Lowe. Do I have a seconder? Thanks Alderman Pincott. Um, Mr. Stevens, did you want to say something about this report? No. Questions to administration or discussion? I have some. Well, Mr. Stevens, <laughs> um, we have seen um, a fair bit of growth in this department, and if I'm look, if I'm reading it correctly, if we exclude 311 uh, in straight up communications, we've had over the years. Um, oh, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, 34 staff transfer in from other places uh, since the year 2000, and 31 new staff. Could you speak a little bit to those 31 new staff and the kinds of responsibilities that they're doing that may be different than what was the case before we started this uh, department in the year 2000? Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. A lot of, um, the vast majority of that staff would be involved in uh, providing services uh, from the central function to the business units. They would also be provided uh, service in the um, what I would refer to as the uh, creative services function, where we provide the print, multimedia production, some of the graphic design, the writing and editing, some of that, uh, especially with the growth of the multimedia platform, that's where a lot of the resources have gone. Mr. Stevens, while you're up, um, there has been some discussion around the corporation of 
the placement of this sort of as a service unit for the rest of the corporation. Um, and the fact that that would indicate the communications decisions are rather decentralized, that they're made across the corporation, that this unit doesn't really have any control over the overall message. Would you suggest that that's a fair statement? Um, and have we been thinking about how to manage that? Um, I, I would say that that is a struggle. I, th I would say that's a, a fair comment. Um, that is one of the, the coordination of the message is a difficult thing when you've got essentially there's nearly 30 businesses and a couple of hundred lines of service. I, I, I won't dispute that. So we do have some corporate um, oversight that we provide on certain things, branding, um, web, our, uh, some of our external presence. But with respect to uh, messaging around specific projects and businesses, that is not controlled centrally. Thank you. Um, I may have a couple more, and I'll reserve the right to ask more, but I see some lights are on. So, Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. And I'm not sure who to ask this question to. And now I look at 2010 Permanent communi Communications FTEs paid by department, um, as opposed to 2010 Permanent Communication FTEs paid by CSC. And uh, I'm just wondering, is this like the total out of each of the different business units? Yes, it is. Now, we're talking about staff dedicated to the development of communications. Does that include capital components to that? Yes. Really? Yes, you'll, you'll find in some of them that the, they are funded out of capital. They are involve uh, projects in communities that are funded out of capital for a short period of time, they are included. There are others that are base and they are funded out of, out of operating. If we're, and I can refer to my department, for example. If you look in uh, corporate services, there are some primarily in our business units that are fundamentally capital driven. They are, they are funded out of uh, capital. A specific reference, uh, Your Worship, if you wanted to take a look at attachment five. Um, page one, you can see corporate services, where you've got significant, significant amounts of capital in corporate properties and buildings and IT, for example. Some of that is very specific project work where communications are required, for example, out of vacating a building. You'll want to do a full communication plan to staff about what the impact would be, the movement there would be, they would be funded out of capital. Okay. Well, not, to, not going to pick on you, Mr. Stevens, but... Um... I'm looking at specifically utilities and environment, and I see a total here of what, 12 FTEs, but I've seen significant amount of communications and advertisements specifically related to UNE, and I'm just wondering if 12 FTEs, that covers the capital cost and everything of, of all the advertisement that goes out specifically in regards to water conservation, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you, Your Worship. If I can, if I could just speak to the utilities and environmental protection communication resources. And if you see the build-up of resources since 2000, between 2000 and 2010, you know, the majority of that uh, increase has been really geared to the fact that um, a large part of our environmental success in terms of delivering programs and, and, and reducing uh, waste and, and increasing diversion, uh, increasing water conservation, all those kinds of programs, um, creating public awareness to uh, about um, you know how the stormwater goes down the drain and all the responsible uh, you know behaviours that, that that go into water resource management. Um, that's why we've got those resources, and they they help us um, create the message and and the and the. Um, uh, the information that we put out in our various uh, bill inserts or um, on, uh, on television or radio or whatever, they're, they're helping us craft those messages. And if, if we didn't have those people, um, we'd still have to be doing that. And, and our view is that, that the right people to, to give those messages are the professional communicators who are trained to, to do that. And so they take the content, uh, the kind of technical content, the, the important issues that we're trying to portray, and then they turn it into uh, into language that's more user friendly, if you like, uh, for the broader community. So they're, they're very critical. Uh, Maybe I didn't word my question properly. These 12 FTEs are are embedded within CSC's department. No. 
they're embedded they're, within your own department. Yeah, they'll be out at um, the water center. They'll be out at uh, waste and recycling. Um, they're responding to issues management. They're responding to the messaging around if there's a, you know serious issues with water main breaks. They're 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 getting out all the sort of day to day operational messaging. And so, to, in in regards to the uh, Mr. Stevens' con uh, comments about. Uh, the consistency of messaging and the corporate messaging, that there's some messaging that we have to put out very, very quickly that is very, very unique to our business. And, yep. and so that... Um, That's why you have those in, yeah. in internal people yeah. specifically dedicated yeah. to communication strategy. So so my question then is, is this, is this fully born here with regards to the cost for communications within your department? Does that yes. include... The cost for the advertisement, the cost for the artwork, the cost for the printing of the material. Well, that's that's a separate budget. This is the, this is the um, this is the people, the FTEs that we have um, that we need to do to do our work. Now they will contract with, or they will they will work with the centralized customer service and communications group in creative services and those kinds of people. And and the cost of that work is it shows up elsewhere in in, in the report. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Stevens is telling me attachment six. So, so I think that each of these attachments has a different purpose. I think attachment five is specifically intended to illustrate where the different departments have um, resources embedded in their business that they need in order to do their business um, that is paid for by the business, just the operational component. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if I'm getting across here as to what I'm trying to get at. It seems like I'm not, but I'm trying to figure out your worship respectfully what what our overall communications costs are but there seems to be some costs that aren't reflected in these numbers from my perspective and I understand that we have a communications um, department that's dedicated to coordinating the city's messaging but I, I somehow get the feeling that there's some additional costs within individual business units that are dedicated towards communications that aren't necessarily flushed out in this report. Mr. Tobert. Uh, Your Worship, the information is presented in two different pieces, one of which is an FTE count, <clears throat> which is probably the most easy means for council members to see the growth of FTEs and the distribution of those over time. On attachment six, 10.1.2 is a list of the expenditures on communications by department by business unit. So you can see for 2010, the amount is $12,636,000. Yep. That's exclusive of wages and salaries of those folks that are dedicated to that full time. So this is this is creative work, advertising buys, that sort of thing. Yes. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Does that help, Alderman Chabot? Um, a little. Um, so you're saying that 12.6 is in addition to the other total that I had for communications? I'm not too sure which other total you had. It's it's exclusive of wages and salaries for the full-time FTEs. Okay, what's the total cost for communications? 18 million? Where, where is that? Uh, I had the number here previously. I just didn't mark it up well enough, I guess. While you're, while you're looking for that, I can suggest that, um, I was going to suggest, if I'm reading my, um, if I'm reading correctly, then we have 84.6 FTEs in 311, 65 FTEs in communications, another 57 FTEs embedded in departments, and we spend 12 million a year on creative services. So it doesn't give you a total, but it at least gives you a quantum so of what we're talking about. Total of 149.6 FTEs, I gather? Uh, that includes 311, yeah. And then yeah. plus another 57 in departments. At varying rates, though, right? They're not all. Yeah, they're not all the right? same. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's that's what I'm trying to find out, Your Worship, is what what is the total? Do we have that number in here, including wages and benefits, Mr. Tobert? Your Worship, this report does not contain that. What it tries to show council is two things, the growth of FTEs over time and the distribution of those. And then really what's relevant now is how much are we spending on communicating once you have the capacity in place. What you're looking for is a gross number. Yes. It's not here. 
Yeah, and, and don't get me wrong, there's a ton of information here that tells me about how much we've improved efficiency within this department, and I have no issue with that. It's, I'm just trying to understand what the overall costs for the, the corporation are in regards to communications and total gross agreed, but uh, I'm not there yet. Maybe I'll find out more when I listen. Thank you. I agree with you, um, Alderman Chabot, that the total cost would be an extremely helpful number here, and we ought not to have to go fishing for it. Um, I do have another place for you to look, though. Um, on page 12 of 14, you'll see that the budget for that department, Mr. Stevens, maybe you can speak to this. The budget for that department is $15.506 million. Now, Mr. Stevens, I, I am assuming that that number includes the wages and benefits within the department but perhaps not the full 12 million in creative because that gets charged to the departments. Your Worship, we're, we're narrowing it on. I can get that number. We don't need to okay. search for it, but you're right. What this, the, the, the outstanding number, and you've, you've characterized it exactly correct, Your Worship, there are 149.6 FTs within communications and the cost of that is set out on attachment four, the uh, page three of three. $15.927 million. Plus the cost that's in attachment six, the cost that I don't have for you is the cost of the additional 57 business units, or the 57, 57 FTEs in the business units, which I, could, which I could provide. I think it would, I think from Alderman Chabot's line of questioning, which I echo, it would be helpful to see even the growth of that number over time. Uh, you know, one of the challenges in here, and one of the reasons that well, I was going to say I requested, the council requested at my urging this report, was really to understand the growth of that big number over time. Because it is, it is challenging when we're looking at budget to be able to really follow through this, this particular department. It's one of the more difficult ones, this one in IT. So it would be helpful for us to be able to understand that. Your Worship, I can do that. Would you, uh, I understood Alderman Chabot's question to be about communications. Obviously that includes the 311 number. Do you want the overall number which I can get? I, I would like it, but I would also like it with 311 broken out, okay. which, is, uh, which is sort of, as you know, a different service. I'll send a memo to council. Thank you. Alderman Lowe? Well, thank you very much, Your Worship. That's uh, exactly the question I had outstanding on it. And uh, other than that, I, unless there's other lights on, okay. The uh, just as a matter of when I read the report, I found it uh, an interesting report to read. It took me a while to, to struggle through it. The thing I did note, and I forget which attachment is, the sort of chronology of the development of it. And it seems to me, Your Worship, that every time this group of people won an award, we cut their budget. spelled out there. I mentioned that to one of the media people. He said, that sort of sounds like the press. So there we are. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Farrell, you're, oh, you turned your light off? You're good? Okay. Uh, anyone else? All right, so with the understanding that Mr. Stevens uh, is going to uh, take on <coughs> the, uh, that memo that we're asking for with that additional information, uh, Alderman Lowe, did you want to close? All right, then. So on the recommendation to receive the report for information, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right. That then takes us to the SPC on Finance and Corporate Services, item 10.2.1 in your agenda, FCS 2011-04, or Alderman Lowe? We move the recommendations and three readings of the proposed bylaw, Your Worship. Thank you, sir. Did you want to introduce it at all? Uh, no, it's uh, a standard... Uh, it's the uh, supplementary property tax assessment and tax bylaws. It's the standard report that comes to us. Okay, uh, Alderman Collier Cart, you're seconding. Any discussion on this item? Very well, then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. First reading of bylaw 11M2011, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Carried. On bylaw 12M 2011, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we ag Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. LPT 2011-14, item, missing a number, 10.3.1 in your agenda, Alderman Chabot. 
Um, yes, Your Worship. I'd be happy to move all the recommendations of uh, the LPT with the um, exception of LPT 2011-11, of course, as you know, there was no recommendation by committee, but I do have an alternate recommendation that I would like to move on that particular item. Absolutely, but happy to move all the others at this point and okay. happy to open and close on any and all if need be. Thank you. Do you want to open on the Marlboro one? Um, well, very briefly, um, looking at identifying parking zones, this one has been an issue for some time even before we introduced Park and Ride. Um, it has created some challenges for the adjacent uh, neighborhood. Not only that, but uh, as well as the fact that at one point the adjacent um, apartment building was was um, charging for their parking and, uh, and some of the residents refused to pay it and ended up parking on the street, which further exacerbated the whole issue. Uh, the residents have been putting up with it for some time. This is an opportunity for them to petition the rest of the street to provide on-street parking requirements. Um, and I do have a question, but um, I'll take a seconder for all of these with the exception of the secondary suites one. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, thanks, Alderman Hodges. So we've got that. Um, Mr. Logan, and only because this is the street I grew <coughs> up on, <laughs> I have a special interest in this particular one. Um, is this park and ride driven? Do we have a sense of if we're doing this and on April 1st the problem will go away? Not this one. <coughs> Your Worship, I wouldn't say it's entirely park and ride driven. I think there's, uh, there is one station. Uh, we have vacancies in that lot. Um, I think the problem stems from all sorts of different land uses in this in this particular neighborhood, to be honest. There's there's a number of commercial developments, and as Alderman Chabot just mentioned, there are multifamilies that are uh, resulting in a lot of cars being on the street. So given what you just said, mm -hmm. um, just for the new members of council in my edification, how many parking passes do you get if you have a house? Two. Yeah. Two? It's an echo. Yes. Two on the street. Yes, and, and I know that most house. of these homes do have back lanes um, and garages as well. Yes. Now, the other question that I had was this is strikes me as quite a large zone um, along Maryvale Drive, the street I grew up on. Mm -hmm. It goes almost from 36th Street all the way to 52nd Street. Do we do, we do these standard this large? I mean, that's quite a distance from the from 36th Street hub of activity in the C train. Typically, um, Your Worship, if it was related to a specific use, it would be a smaller zone. Um, our experience has been that the walking, walking, parking and walking falls off considerably after about four to 600 meters. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other discussion on this one? Alderman Chabot, did you wanna close? Yeah, very briefly, um, it, this is actually not a really large parking area. It's, um, if you'll note, it's uh, areas bounded north by Marbank Drive from 36th Street to Marlin Way and east by the alleys east of Miranda Close. And I, was just, I was just looking at the map. I was sad that there was no map in here. Yeah, but when you get down to Maryvale Drive, it goes all the way to 50th Street, so it's pretty far. But it, it only goes down to Maryvale. It's, it's, uh, it's actually not a long block there. Okay. It's, uh, it's in and around that whole multifamily housing um, development, and it's predominantly what's driven to the, to the, the issues map. related to parking. Uh, deficiencies that exist on the street. It's primarily okay. to respond to that. Thank, thanks very much. I, I just saw the map. Uh, I didn't have to Google map it. Thank you. <laughs> and in fact, the house I grew up in is just outside of the zone, so all the parking would go there. Um, <laughs> but I don't live there anymore, so it's all right. I will consider this closed then. On the recommendations, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Pincott is opposed. On behalf of my neighbors, thank you, Alderman Pincott. <laughs> um, um, and three readings then of the proposed bylaw 13M 2011. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Pincott is opposed. Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Pincott is opposed. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried unanimously. Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Pincott is opposed. Carried. Thank you. LPT 2011-09, Center City Levies Update. Uh, Alderman Chabot, did you want to? Um, well, briefly, Your Worship, we've uh, established uh, levies um, based on frontage, and uh, I think the uh, 
the proposal is pretty straightforward. There's monies that have been collected with the intention of being spent at some point in time when they're required for the ended purpose. Other than that, not much more to say. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any discussion or questions on this item? Very well, then, on the recommendations, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. 10.3.3, then. By I don't law. think. Was there a bylaw there? 18M211. Oh, there it is. My apologies. My apologies. Um, all right, then, bylaw 18M2011. First reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. 10.3.3 uh, then. Um, uh, zone fares for taxis and limousines, Alderman Chabot. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, the proposed amendments to zone based fares for taxi and limousine has been recommended by TLAC committee. Uh, there was some debate on this issue in committee. Um, there are some amendments that I would ask somebody to put on my behalf, and it's specifically in regards to the date of implementation. Of course, the date of implementation should mirror the date of the closure of Barlow, and I don't believe that that's reflected accurately in the bylaw. Closure of Barlow should be April 3rd, 2011. I know that one. Um, and what does it say in the bylaw? Comes into force the day it's passed, and that should actually say that this bylaw comes into force on April 3rd. Um, sure. It, would someone like to move that amendment, please? Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Do I have a seconder? Yep. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. On the amendment, any discussion? All right, then on the amendment, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? All right, carried. So the amendment is as you suggested. Um, <coughs> Alderman Chabot. Um, Respectfully, Your Worship, I believe that the amendment. Oh, is it to the, the bylaw? bylaw? Has to be at second so we reading. We have to do it at second reading. My yeah. apologies. This no is worries. an amendment to the bylaw, not to the recommendation. Yeah. We'll do that again in a few Thank moments uh, then. Sorry, Alderman Chabot. Thank you for catching that. Um, question, Mr. I, I guess it's Mr. Logan. Mr. Watson. Oh, it's Mr. Watson. How are you? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that was not the question. I was. <laughs> I was looking at, um, given that this is driven by the, um, the closure of Barlow Trail, I was looking at the Northeast um, fares, which I would imagine would be the ones that would be most impacted by that closure. But I noticed that for reasons I couldn't quite figure out, some of them went up and some of them went down. Can you speak to that? Uh, through the chair, yes I can, Your Worship. The uh, fares were originally set a number of years ago but this time we went back and actually drove them uh, several times, both in rush hour, non-rush hour, and found out, frankly, that the previous fares were not all that accurate. This is a much more accurate representation of what the distances are and the fares should be. Okay, so it's just a, it's more it's scientific a cleanup, this time, Which is why it's a bit of a cleanup, as well as, as uh, Alderman Chabot points out, with the closure of Barlow Trail, we have to rejig them anyway because the, the distances mm -hmm. are all different. Yeah, this is one of the first places where we start to see the impacts of that. There will, I suspect, be other places where we see the impact of that. Um, very well then, uh, any other questions on the recommend, uh, questions or discussion on the recommendations? Did you want to close, Alderman Chabot? Just to echo what Mr. Watson just said, the rates that are going down are to more accurate, accurately reflect what the realities are in regards to running these, uh, these uh, these routes and so as you said some are up some are down it's nice to see that some are actually going down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not to my neighborhood but to the neighborhood next door <laughs> um, may get dropped off on the corner from now on <laughs> um, great <laughs> so on the recommendations then are we agreed uh, first reading of the bylaw are we agreed any opposed carried Second reading of the bylaw, Alderman Stevenson. Same amendment I made before, right? So rather than the bylaw coming into force on the day it's passed, the bylaw should Past come into them, force yeah. on April 3rd, 2011. And do I have a seconder? Thanks, Alderman Jones. Uh, on the amendment, are we agreed? Any opposed? 
Carried. So second reading of the bylaw as amended, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. And third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. All right. Hey, how did 10.3.4 get in the agenda? Yeah. Didn't know that was going to be an issue today. Alderman Chabot. Thank you, Your Worship. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. I'm sorry, Alderman Chabot. Before I recognize you, got to do a little housekeeping here. Alderman Marr. Thank you. Uh, it's with a heavy heart, Your Worship, that uh, I will um, again declare a pecuniary interest in this issue. Uh, as uh, member, many of the public know, and uh, certainly administration and council is aware, I am presently building my new house, with, uh, which includes a secondary suite in the plan above the garage. Uh, as a result, I... Uh, I been acknowledged by uh, City Law Department as having a pecuniary interest and will not be participating in the vote nor in the discussion. I'd like to recuse myself and have that noted for the minutes at this time. Thank you, Alderman Marr. Thank you. With a heavy heart. Um, Alderman Keating. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I unfortunately find myself on the same boat as it will be within a matter of uh, days or, or weeks or so that I will be applying for a secondary suite in my primary residence, so I'm declaring a pecuniary interest and recluse myself from the debate. Thank you, Alderman Keating. Um, Ms. Flown, just given that there's been a great deal of public discussion on this item, would you mind just explaining this pecuniary interest for the interests of those who are watching? Absolutely, Your Worship. Um, the municipal government imposes constraints on members of council uh, with respect to pecuniary interests. Specifically, sections 170 to 174 of the MGA are extremely important. and. The, the MGA sets out that, um, generally speaking, a member of council has pecuniary interest if the matter could monetarily affect the councillor. Um, each member of council has an obligation to examine their circumstances and make the determination uh, if they have a pecuniary interest, and if they do, they are required to disclose that, both at committee and council meetings. And uh, they must disclose this pecuniary interest prior to the discussion of the matter by committee or by council. And they must abstain from voting and subject to very limited exemptions, which do not apply in this case, uh, they are required to leave the room. Uh, the consequences, Your Worship, for non-compliance with this obligation is disqualification from council. Um, in this particular circumstance, both Alderman Marr and Alderman Keating either have an application in the works for a secondary suite or have one uh, that is coming forward imminently. And as such, uh, by participating in this matter, it is very possible that uh, they would be making it much easier and less expensive uh, for themselves to obtain approval, as well as uh, the, the uh, possibility that they would be enhancing the value of their personal real estate if, in fact, the suite is constructed. Ms. Flone, um, before you sit down, I uh, just wanted to highlight one thing you said either have an application currently um, out there or have one imminent. Did, does the department have an opinion on the word imminent, what that means? Your Worship, uh, that's fact specific. Every, every um, arguable pecuniary interest must be assessed on its facts. In Alderman Marr's case, it is very clear that he has an application in the system. Um, it's a very immediate uh, benefit to him in the event that uh, some amendments went through that were perhaps favorable to his position. Um, with respect to Alderman Keating's position, it's a little less clear in that his application is not in the system, but based upon discussions that we had, this is not a, a, a pie in the sky or a very long range possibility that may come to fruition one day. This is something that he plans on making a reality in the very near future. So the act itself does not speak to imminency. That is a, a circumstance that is very specific to his situation. Thank you very much, Ms. Flo, and I think all of us appreciate that clarification. Uh, sure, I'll take it now. Thank you. Ms. Flo, can you just expand on, I mean, I don't see how anyone who, does, who owns a property that, that conceivably could be upzoned to a suite and benefit from that financial lift is not also in a pecuniary position. Can you tell me how law drew, drew that line, please? Your Worship, as I mentioned earlier, it is the obligation of each member of council to make their own determination. 
um, based on their own very specific facts. So what we're doing is talking about the issue in a very general way. Uh, one item that I would point out to Council <coughs> is that there are a number of exceptions to when a pecuniary interest exists and those are outlined in section 170 sub 3 of the MGA and there are a number of them. Um, and one of them is even though a member of council could monetary or a matter could monetarily affect a member of council, um, that does not become a pecuniary interest if the um, if the matter it, or if if the interest is held in common with the majority of electors of the municipality, or if it only affects part of the municipality, and that's under subsection I. And in this particular case, uh, we are of the view that because of the imminency of the application and because of the, the application that's already in the works, this isn't falling within the realm of general electors. People who own property, sure, it's, it's certainly up to them to, um, or it, the possibility exists that they could make an application to upzone their property as you've suggested. However, these are two very real and very immediate situations that I would suggest differentiate it from the general interest of the rest of the electors. Thanks, Ms. Flone. Alderman Chabot, back to you. Oh, I had a question. Yeah. My question was: uh, Is the uh, when 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 a when a member recuses themselves, is it permanent on that matter? I'm not. Or can sure. they come in and out on it? Uh, Your Worship, if unless the, the situation changes dramatically, I don't see how how one could come in and out. Once one is declared a pecuniary interest, right. they have a pecuniary interest, and the Act does right. speak to that um, to some extent uh, with respect to declaring the interest at committee. They are obligated to remove themselves at council. Thank you. Alderman Putman's for Ms. Flone. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. Ms. Flone, you mentioned uh, the um, consequences would be disqualification from council. Could you expand on that? I'm not sure what a disqualification from council really means. Absolutely, uh, Your Worship. <laughs> it is um, very significant consequences, and what that means is you are no longer a member of council. You are deposted, so to speak. Deposted. <laughs> yes, and and Your Worship, Section 174 <laughs> of the uh, Municipal Government Act speaks specifically to that, and it requires that. Um, oh, pardon me. 175 speaks to that, and it, it speaks to the fact that a councillor that is disqualified, which is explained under Section 174, must resign immediately. If a councillor does not resign immediately, then council may apply by originating notice to the court um, to get an order determining whether or not they were qualified, or whether or not they had a pecuniary interest and whether they should be disqualified. Alternatively, an elector may also make that same application. Thank you. I don't know why, but I just find this whole conversation awfully morbid all of a sudden. Alderman Jones, did you have a question for Ms. Sloan? Um, Alderman Farrell or Hodges for Ms. Sloan? Uh, Ms. Sloan, the courts have done this in Alberta, and I think the uh, most recent example I recall was Medicine Hat. It wasn't on a matter of land use, it was on a matter of a business or a business license, as I recall, in the early 80s. Is that not the case? So there are there are some actual court uh, decisions. There definitely are, Your Worship, um, across the country, specifically in Alberta. Yeah. Was it for Ms. Phone, Alderman Farrell? Go ahead. Thank you. So, if the application is approved or rejected by the planning department, and there's no live application or no imminent application, then the situation will have changed. Is that correct? Your Worship, every set of circumstances must be examined closely and um, on its own merits. And I am very hesitant to give blanket advice in that regard. Um, it's, it's very possible that circumstances could change, in which case that perhaps we could re-examine it. Um, but until that happens, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant to give any blanket advice because the facts are very critical to these determinations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm scared to, but I will. So if, for example, one of the aldermen who recused himself has his 
application for land use change uh, approved by this council, so council no longer has power over it, could that alderman presumably then debate on future secondary suite debates? Your Worship, pecuniary interest only extends insofar as the, um, the matter could monetarily affect that councillor. Okay, so in that case, it, it wouldn't after that if there's, okay, I got it. You don't have to answer that, I got it, okay. Um, Alderman Chabot. I might as well carry on that theme, Your Worship. Um, if, uh, if a member of council currently resides in a secondary suite or has a secondary suite, would they, by virtue of that, have a, have a pecuniary interest? Your Worship, um, again, it's up to each councillor to make their own determination. I can certainly assist if there are any facts. I'm not aware of any facts in that regard. Um, and again, giving blanket advice in that respect, I'm, I'm very hesitant to do so because a slight change in the facts could get to a very different answer. Okay. All right. Well, I won't belabor the issue. Um, Your Worship, I, I have, I believe, 35 copies. There's a word that I've omitted on these, and so I've been quickly trying to pen the addition here as I've been uh, listening to all this very interesting debate on pecuniary interest. And I didn't quite give you 35 copies, Madam Clerk, but hopefully there's enough to get around to members of council while I continue to make these amendments. Peter, let's have a look at that. Just keep carrying on there. Um, Your Worship, I, there's, I have five recommendations here, and um, these are discussions, of course, that uh, you and I have had over the weekend, and trying to find a compromise to provide for additional um, secondary suites or facilitation of secondary suites in areas where it's uh, more conducive to do so. Uh, although I have five recommendations here, I'm personally not prepared to put forth all five recommendations. Uh, I will submit these five, but I'm only prepared to move recommendation one at this time. And. Uh, being as all members of council will then have this in hand if somebody should choose to make some further amendments or further recommendations uh, I'd be certainly willing to listen and uh, and vote accordingly but um, at this point I'm not prepared to move those others your worship so respectfully I'm moving recommendation one and let the chips fall where they may Thanks, uh, Alderman Chabot. Uh, just before I ask for a seconder and before you sit down, there's just a wording change on number one that we may wish to make here. Um, if you want to allow them in semi-detached, yeah. then I think what you want to do. Um, R2 could be excluded from that list, Your Worship. I just noticed that because it's, it's already listed as permitted under R2. I think they can figure it out from there because it is says secondary suites that are currently involved as a discretionary use. So that's what we're really asking them to change. Not they RCT, can figure it out when they write to the bylaw. Attached mm -hmm. and detached. Right. Uh, and sorry, um, Mr. Watson, in R2 zones, are they already a permitted use? That's correct. Okay. So the motion is number one as put by Alderman Chabot, but with the exception of R2 within the brackets. Um, and we'll get that up on the screen soon. I think that clerk has an um, electronic version as well. And do I have a seconder for that one, please? Thanks, Alderman McLeod. All right, so what we'll do, um, Alderman Chabot, I think, given that we have no recommendation in front of us, is we'll take that one, and then if people want to move the other ones or anything else, we'll take them after this one. So um, on this one, and the idea here is to change from discretionary use to permitted use in the zones where secondary suites are currently allowed as a discretionary use. Uh, Mr. Watson, could you just speak for a moment on um, the nature of the appeals that we currently receive in these areas? All right, it's just, uh, it, it's what you, I think you've all received it by email as well, but it, what we've got right now is just number one. That's all that's on the floor now. Yeah, I think it's coming.
end, you can strike R2 out of that list. Yeah. No, actually. Okay, are you all ready? All right then, sorry Mr. Watson. Back to you. Excuse me, through the chair. Since uh, the land use bylaw was uh, approved in 2007, in June of that year, there's been 159 actual secondary suite applications. Uh, very few of them have been appealed, some have. In fact, most of the appeals we get are not through secondary suite applications, they're actually through orders that are placed on complaints that we investigate that we then move to orders to eventually uh, deal with. And in fact, we're running at about a thousand of those uh, complaints a year. Uh, and those are the ones that are actually the bulk of the work that actually goes through to SDAB because of course then the applicant asks, tries to get a development permit that gets refused, goes to SDAB, we're working through the, the process of SDAB. Interestingly enough, in R2, which is where uh, we were just saying that uh, secondary suites is actually a permitted use, uh, we've had very, very few applications uh, since the land use bylaw has been put in place. R2, if you'll remember, Council, is on the outer edges, it's R2 is now in the developing areas, it's not in the developed areas. But in those locations where you could have a secondary suite, of course you can have other uses, semi-detached, uh, et cetera, most, most of those are, are turning to semi-detached as opposed to going or even con considering a, a secondary suite. Your Worship, I'm not sure whether that fully answered it, but. but. No, it, it certainly did for me. Thank you, Alderman Jones. Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship, the first question I got is, so what happens to the administration recommendations that were on this? Are you filing them or? Well, because the committee is forwarding this to council without recommendation, um, what Alderman Chabot put on the floor is the only thing on the floor right now. Mutually, Your Worship, if, if this motion passes, then the proper motion, I believe, would be to file the recommendations. Of, of administration. Of administration. I think that's right. Okay. So I'll speak to this shortly, just briefly, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Watson, this this is the 116,000 suites that we were told about. There are dwelling units that could be utilized right now in committee? Uh, that 116,000, Your Worship, were the number of parcels that were under various um, districts that allowed secondary suites in terms of the total. So they are... RC1N, the RC2, the R1N, the R2, the R2M, and the R1S. Now those are all the number of parcels that exist in the city, which totals just above 116,000, of which we've done some further calculation, almost 86,000, uh, 87,000 of those have single detached houses on them today. So if you really think about that, very few people are going to probably go from a single detached house to a secondary suite in terms of, of putting one in. So you're, you're probably looking at another 20, 30,000. But at, regardless, that's the 116,000. That's what the uh, this top number is. Now that also includes some of the multifamily districts that council allowed secondary suites to go into, but the number of, that was mainly in cases where you had a, a stranded parcel and we wanted to allow the flexibility for somebody to put a secondary suite in a number of those parcels is pretty small and a number of these parcels could also be a little bit better than a secondary suite there's probably a higher more intense use than just that's exactly suite. right i mean if you you have some of these especially say the multifamilies, the chances of you wanting to increase your uh, value by simply putting a secondary suite in is minimal unless there's nothing else and you're a stranded parcel or you have a single attached house in it or something. some people may use it as temporary use well, Your Worship, uh, 
I, uh, after hearing that in committee, that was why I was basically opposed to the Menor One areas. I felt that we should maximize the use of the areas that haven't been maximized yet. I think there's motion in the discussion that a number of us have had over the weekend uh, that precipitated these five recommendations was worthwhile. It's too bad we didn't have it prior to committee. It could have saved a lot of time and it could have saved a lot of effort over the last two weeks and probably a lot of name calling as well that's cre been created from this. I'm not personally a person that believes in surveys. I believe in the calls and the emails that I've received in my office and they were very predominant on about an eight to nine to one basis that people were very insistent that they did not want these in an Arwen area in my communities. And that also came from every one of my community associations of which I have letters from them indicating the same thing and that was why I took the stance that I did. But with this motion, at least number one, we'll see what happens with two, three, four, and five, with number one, at least it addresses the concerns that everybody has about affordable housing in the interim. It allows for a possibility of in excess of 116,000 sites where we could put secondary suites. And I guess that's a start. And we'll see what happens in future. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Jones. Uh, on number one, Alderman Putmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm just trying to understand between one and three. Um, it makes reference to R1 and number one and also part th uh, number three as it relates to proximity to an LRT station. Um, so in number one, R1 uh, suites would become a permitted use and under three they would become a discretionary use. Uh, no, um, Alderman Putmans, uh, number one only speaks to R1S. R1LS. Oh, I missed that. Thank okay, you. Those are the okay. ones that are already have secondary suites, some of which there are very, very, very few in the city right that now. Is, gotcha. In fact, I believe if I was reading my reading the map correctly, there are a grand total of five parcels that are R1S today. Thank you. I'll come back on other matters. Thanks. Did I get that wrong, Mr. Watson? Yeah, we did. We approved nine more. Sorry, excuse me. You just approved more than five, I think, in Cougar Ridge about 15 minutes ago. But it is a smaller number than some of the other numbers we're talking about. Thank you. Alderman Carra. <laughs> ...of this and have a... Not, not, not yet? Well, then I don't really have a lot to say about this, except that I'm totally in support of it. Well, Your Worship, uh, I think Alderman Jones summed up uh, most certainly my experience very plainly. Um, I, too, uh, surveys I look at are not are the uh, emails and calls I get, but, but I even break it down a little bit further than that. Those who've actually sat down and written me a thoughtful note as opposed to a boilerplate uh, are the ones that I look at. And uh, most certainly nine to one was the ratio I was getting out of my ward. Eight to, eight to two for the rest of the city was what was coming into me. So it, it does uh, put 116,000 parcels out there where we can, uh, secondary suites can go in. Uh, you know, the amount of, and the, the uh, land use we did up in Sage Hill, uh, one of my concerns was that we placed those R1S lots very, very carefully, in very careful consultation with the applicant at the time, recognizing the fact that it was, you know, it's, a, it's a not a laned product. Uh, we placed them so that they'd be sensitive to the community. So they are there, but it's true, it'll be 15 or 20 years before we realize what the uptake in those will be. But uh, at least now that those who buy the lots know what they can do with them, those who buy the lots around them know what may be expected in the future. And that's the key. And uh, so I, I have no difficulty with number one. I will tell you candidly, uh, number two and three do not consult. They fail. They fail. So uh, that's where my line is. Yeah. Point of order. Should we be discussing number one now and then we can move on to the others? Okay. Thanks. Alderman Hodges. Everybody's got one more point to make today. It's a very interesting day today. Uh, Your Worship and, uh, and members of council, number one, council hereby direct administration. 
So uh, the last uh, couple lines of uh, number one is, would not require development permit while uh, detached forms of secondary suites such as uh, in such land use districts will remain as a discretionary use. Right. But what's being missed is our regulars, the landowners, require a building permit. So somewhere, Mr. Watson, I'd like someone to put in red highlighted letters the requirements for building permits, whether, in, whether they need a development permit or not. Now, generally around here, we know that. But out in the real world, they don't. I even got a call on Friday from uh, someone who's plainly the owner of an illegal suite in a <laughs> RC2 district, and all he want, what he wanted to make sure is all this got passed on Monday so his illegal suite could be legalized. Uh, sorry, little buddy. You <laughs> never did bother with a building permit, did you? Mm. But I didn't trouble him with the facts. <laughs> Somewhere, though, we have to trouble somebody with the facts, and your, the little booklet your department produces does that. But this isn't a bestseller yet, which it ought to be. Mr. Watson? Uh, well, no, I don't think it is a bestseller. I mean, we're probably trying to get it on Indigo or somewhere, but um, you're absolutely right. Our expectation and, and certainly our hope would be that any, certainly any new construction would need a building permit. And anyone who wants to come in at any point and say, I've got a suite and perhaps I didn't know I was supposed to have a building permit, we would want to take them through that process. Now, there is further on in, in the the recommendations here, some discussion about the uh, Alberta building code, and of course the companion document, the fire code that we're going to have to do some work on. Obviously someone who has built a suite doesn't want to tell us about it and isn't interested in doing any changes based on anything that's not likely to be coming in. But also farther on there's some discussion about how we can uh, focus on enforcement ideas and maybe turn this into a bestseller at some point. But it's a real challenge. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and say this is going to be an easy, easy route. I mean, people that are already in owning suites that have not come forward, don't want to come forward, uh, very little incentive. But certainly our hope would be that they, we end up with safe suites. Uh, safe legal suites would be the best solution. Yes, I agree, Mr. Watson. So, uh, Your Worship, uh, I think uh, somewhere in this first recommendation, uh, the uh, reference to a building permit uh, being required should be there. I know it's belt and braces, but still it should be there. The whole process doesn't end whether you need a development permit or not, or land use change or not. But could we, um, I'm just checking with Ms. Flown here. If Alderman Hodges were to make an amendment saying where it says therefore not require a development permit but would require a building permit, would that be <coughs> legit? Your Worship, the difficulty is that it's the province that determines what requires a building permit and what does not require a building permit. It's not the land use bylaw. And the Safety Codes Act is very clear that the extent to which a bylaw purports to regulate something in the provincial domain is inoperative. But when we say permitted use right now, I just I think it's important for everyone to understand this. When we say permitted use in our land use bylaw right now, does that automatically imply that a building permit is required? Your Worship, um, I think generally speaking, yes. But something to keep in mind is that even though something might be a permitted use, it does not necessarily mean that it is, it is exempt from requiring a development permit. Gotcha. The only time that something is exempt <laughs> from a DP requirement is if it's in the list of specific exemptions. Right, and that would be something that, that, this, um, that this motion presupposes for a change to the land use bylaw, yeah? Um, if, if you want it specifically exempted from a development permit requirement, I would suggest that you put that in there. It does say that, though, doesn't it? Does it? Uh, suites and attached forms in such land use districts would oh. therefore not require development Pardon permit. Pardon me, yes. Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. Well, my concern then still remains, uh, Your Worship, no one's going up to Edmonton or tapping in online, as I guess it is these days, to get a, a building permit. Uh, they whip down here, they're supposed to, up on the third floor in the in the uh, building regulations uh, section. So I 
technically, Ms. Lowen is correct, but again, uh, the city's in the business of uh, providing building permits. If anyone would be so good as to bring some drawings in that would indicate what they're going to do. Um, understanding what Ms. Flown uh, has suggested and also understanding that the bylaw amendment is yet to come back, if you, wanted to put, if you wanted to put an amendment to put those words in to direct as best we can the bylaw amendment that's being asked for here, uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would allow that if you want to do it now. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, therefore not require a building permit, comma, but may require a building permit comma while detached forms and then the rest of it is a separate really a separate part of the whole exercise while detached forms of secondary suites in such land use will remain as a discretionary use so you want to add comma but may require a building permit comma yep. before the word while yep okay so i'll have a second do i have a seconder for That's that the best Thanks, i can Jones. do it on, on the floor of council here your worship okay this little booklet uh miss flown just uh, if you haven't had a chance to read page four <laughs> does say Additional dwelling units, meaning secondary suites built after December 31st, 2006, must comply with the Alberta Building Code. So the information the city's providing is based on the rules of the building, Alberta Building Code. Now, notwithstanding, it's the province's document not, and, and rules, not ours. But this does get, that's why I'd like it, Mr. Watson, to promote it as a bit of a bestseller in the next uh, while, in the next year or so. However, you have to do that, mail it to every household, put it in the utility bills. I don't know what you do. You get the message out there. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, uh, Alderman Hodges. And for the record, you can call me Little Buddy anytime you want. I kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> on the amendment, any discussion on the amendment? Just wave. All right, then. Uh, on the amendment, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Back to the motion at hand, then. Alderman Pincott. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm going to support this. Uh, I'm going to unequivocally support this. Uh, I, 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 I do have to say I find it um, uh, disappointing that we're actually looking at trying to piecemeal this uh, and trying to uh, Trying to, f and and I'm I'm not going to call it compromise because I, I do actually agree with compromise and finding those those uh, those avenues where where we need to move move forward. But this this to me feels, um, as opposed to compromise, feels piecemeal. And I guess my disappointment lies in the, in a lot of the discussion that has been happening uh, in the public around this issue for the last few weeks. And I think that a lot of as Alderman Jones called it, name calling, uh, mis misinformation, misunderstanding uh, could have been avoided if uh, we'd actually gone about doing this properly, talking about what this means properly, um, having the discussion in a respectful manner. I think that, uh, that um, uh, there's been, <laughs> in a way, uh, trying to set up um, our constituents, our, our residents, our neighbors as adversaries in this has not served. It has not served uh, anyone in trying to actually move forward. I think uh, I, I, I do have to say that both sides of the debate have been have been wrong. Both sides of the debate around secondary suites have been disrespectful of each other. Those who, who promote this as the panacea to affordable housing, that this is the solution. It's not. It's not the solution. It's a piece. It's a part of what we need to do to have a com complete community. It's about supporting people. It's about supporting community. It's about uh, creating a degree of affordability. But it is not the solution. It is not the magic bullet. So for those who have been touting this as the magic bullet for affordable housing and how dare we not support this to, uh, to make sure that everybody has a place to live. It, it's not going to do that. But then again, for those on the, on, the, on the opponent side who've been touting this as the thing that is going to lead to the destruction of community, it's not going to do that either. The secondary suite is still going to cost, still going to require a building permit. It's still going to cost, I don't know, $50,000 to put one in. Uh, 
that's uh, there's there's not going to be a huge rush to have that put in. I, you know, when you take a look at, at at what Edmonton, the experience in Edmonton around secondary suites, where they've they've put in, I don't know, generous 100, 120 a year since they made them a permitted use. Let's say we're wildly successful in Calgary, wildly successful, and Calgarians are knocking down the door, and we put in 500 a year across the city. Well, split that out amongst 150 communities. We're talking about, well, hell, let's say they're only going in half the communities. We're talking about seven in a community. That's what we're talking about. That's not, dis that's not on average, exactly. That's not destroying a community. So both sides of this debate have been wrong, and I think it's, it's unfortunate. I think it's because at the end of the day, I, I, I have to say that I think that it's because we, we as a council, we as a city, uh, have handled it badly. We actually, have, ha actually haven't had the discussion. I was just at FCM last week, and I, and, and I talked to a lot of people about secondary suites. And I have to say that a lot of, a lot of our sister cities across the country said they were, a lot of times I got, well, what, you haven't done that yet? It's not an issue. It isn't an issue. It hasn't been an issue as part of the Affordable Housing Task Force uh, where we, we looked at uh, other cities. It wasn't an issue. Uh, I will support some of these. I won't support all of the, the potential um, um, recommendations that will be before us. But I, I have to just say that I support them. I support this. Um, not reluctantly, but just uh, as uh, just the piecemeal approach is just not a way to move forward for our city, and I and it is disappointing. Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Um, Alderman Carr, you've spoken on this already. Did you have a, another question? Oh, for the next one, Alderman Putmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I echo um, many of Alderman Pincott's comments. Um, I suppose we all feel to some extent disappointed that this hasn't been the, the idealistic and utopian fully informed public debate. And um, that to me is a tragedy. The extreme emotions on both sides for the past three weeks have been remarkable. Um, our staff in Ward 6 has put together a list of um, yes and no calls and um, emails. Uh, 150 no's, 99 yeses. Changed from the original opening. The momentum is going towards a yes, but nonetheless still at this point three to two against. The compelling input that I receive though is in community discussions when I'm at the skating parties or the barbecues or, or, or whatever for the past several weeks. And I think the best word to describe the feelings in Ward 6 is that it, there's been apprehension. I think there's been a real worry about home values, behavioral problems, owner occupancy, parking, safety, the, the key issues we've been talking about, which I hope are enshrined in final you know, documents that aren't articulated in these proposals that are on the table right now, but I, I, I will be looking for those in the bylaw amendments somehow included as part of the laws for the city. I think. Um, going this route with R2 and, and, and um, all the other um, land use districts enumerated, I think is a very soft first step. And I'm not sure shows the political will that, that, that perhaps the city could be, but I think is something that uh, Ward 6 would, I think, be amenable towards. I look forward to reading the bylaw amendment. I have some questions. I'm not sure if now is the appropriate time to be asking questions about the process as it, re as it re revolves around bringing forth this bylaw amendment. Will it be going through CPC? I guess I posed that question. Is that what will happen? Will there be a public, uh, will it then come to council as part of a public hearing, Mr. Watson? Through the chair, all uh, amendments to the land use bylaw come through Calgary Planning Commission and come for a public hearing at City Council. So there'll be an opportunity for public input at that point? That's correct. That will be a fulsome debate. Thank you. As opposed to, to so much time for a fulsome debate. Uh, then on that note, Your Honour, thank you very much. Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Anyone else on number one before we I call on Alderman Chabot to close? 
Alderman Chabot. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Well, um, you're right, members of council, there has been a lot of debate. There's been a lot of debate on this issue for many, many years, actually, not just for the last couple, three months. Um, we just approved the municipal development plan, which talks about intensification. Intensification in, in a sensitive manner in close proximity to transit and nodal developments. Um, blanket approach, I don't think is consistent with the municipal development plan because it doesn't concentrate intensification in places that make sense. This, at the very least, is uh, there's a, a certain sense of expectation that at some point in time, a secondary suite may develop next door to you. By moving it from discretionary to permitted use, then facilitates that opportunity. It provides an increased opportunity for people to develop secondary suites in those areas where at least at some point in time, somebody is gonna say, ah, you know what, I, I bought in this area with the expectation that this might happen. The, um, this is not gonna make one single illegal suite legal, not one. However, it will provide an increased opportunity. We heard the numbers, 116,000, but because we've excluded R1S, or R1N and RC1N, it actually reduces the number down to uh, some 66,800 or something. But then again, that also does not include the MCG, MCL, MC2, M MH, uh, MH1, MH2, MH3, and I don't know what that number constitutes. But I can tell you that the other ones um, represents about 66,800 additional homes or additional properties that will move from discretionary to permitted. So people are concerned that this, in essence, takes away the opportunity for people to uh, voice their opinion on this. It, it, um, it doesn't really change things from discretionary to permitted other than it facilitates it. It makes it cheaper to do. It doesn't create an onerous process for somebody should they want to apply for uh, for a secondary suite because with discretionary people can can object to it, send their comments to the to the authority and subsequently if the authority approves it they, they can still file an appeal and, and go in front of subdivision development appeal board. The cost for a development permit is significantly more than a building permit. Um, the, um, some of the new communities have been designed specifically to accommodate um, a higher density development than, than what was um, strictly approved based on the density uh, by the inclusion of RC1S. Um, again, some of those people buying those homes may now want to go through the process and pay the additional costs associated with a development permit. This is saving people money. It's providing increased opportunity. Um, as, insofar as the RC1 and R1, and the reason that I, I wasn't prepared to move the rest of the amendments and why I wanted to move just this is, again, in keeping with the MDP, which talks about sensitive intensification, public engagement, um, opportunity for people to provide input onto what they would like to see their community develop out as. What are the infrastructure costs associated with increased intensity? Um, many of the new communities in particular had a particular density that was envisioned. And if we start increasing by virtue of a blanket approval, there may be a need to increase our road infrastructure, more police, more fire protection, more recreational facilities. The list goes on. Where do we do a cost recovery? There is no mechanism by way of the land use bylaw to do that without imposing additional levies specifically on secondary suites. Now, that's why this is something that is expected. It's not out of context. It's in keeping with the MDP. It's, uh, it's not a panacea, but it is at least providing additional opportunity uh, for providing some affordable housing um, without, um, without negatively impacting some of the community. And to suggest that this may not have uh, a negative impact on the community, I would argue otherwise. Some people say that they may this is going to open the doors if we make uh, do a blanket approval. And some say that, well, look at other cities. That what has the experience been in other cities? Only 200 applications. 200 applications, yes, in Edmonton. 
200 legal applications. Currently, we know that there's anywhere from 50,000 on up of illegal secondary suites on the basis of that they are illegal. If we were to make a, a transition from uh, just from not permitted to permitted, there'd be a sense of expectation that they are that they are allowed, not whether they're permitted or not permitted or discretionary, allowed. So how many other illegal suites do, do we think will develop? How many illegal suites develop in some of these other communities? We don't know that. No one's ever given us that number. All they've given us is how many legal applications there's been. So uh, I'm not prepared to move forward on a blanket approval. I think this is a, a, at least a soft approach, and I think we should take a soft approach. We are not any other city. We are Calgary. Um, we are unique, and I think we need to take a unique approach. And I think this is the be best mechanism moving forward. So I hope you'll support this. Thanks very much, Alderman Chabot. So on this recommendation, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Alderman Carra. Thank you. Now we get into the real debate. Um, and as preference to the real debate, I'd like to uh, state that I don't think anyone has made the assertion that secondary suites are the answer to affordable housing. I think everyone's made the argument that they are an integral component of the solution. Um, I started communicating with my communities in Ward 9 quite a while ago, telling them that this is something that's coming down the pike and that the issue is fraught because it's really a two-part question. On the first side, it's a principled issue. And I think the principled issues are pretty, pretty significantly on the side of the angels. Secondary suites are a critical opportunity for the city of Calgary in terms of affordable housing, and we're talking about for students, we're talking about for artists, we're talking about for workers, we're talking about for seniors and for allowing seniors to stay in their homes. We're talking about for disabled. It's a poverty reduction strategy. It's not a panacea. It's not the only solution, but it's part of the solution. It's part of the city's commitment to complete communities. It's part of the city's need to be economically competitive, especially as we come out of a recession. And it's an expression of positive po property rights as opposed to negative property rights, which is one of the few arguments that's being made on the other side at the principal level. And so I recommended that my communities read the mayor's platform. I sent them links and to start having a real conversation. I said, because when you send me your letters, I want you to talk to me about the principles in terms of the principles, because the principles are undeniably on the side of the angels. There's another side to this equa equation, too, and that has to do with the technical challenges surrounding secondary suites, and that is a very important but a secondary matter, a separate matter. And the technical requirements um, have to do with problems with our land use bylaw. They have to do with problems with our neighborhood-based planning processes. They have to do with problems with our development approvals processes and our development appeals processes where a lot of these discretionary issues are, you know, destined to end up. They have to do with our enforcement practices and they have to do with our ability to have influence with regards to the reform of provincial building and fire and safety codes. We're not going to be able to address those technical issues in any sort of meaningful way unless we make a strong statement regarding the first proposition, which is the principled side of the equation. Having made that argument to my communities, I don't know what you're saying to me. I'm in the middle of speaking. Thank you. Um, He's getting there. <laughs> okay, well, I'm about to make a motion, and this is my prelude to making the motion. He just has lots of whereases. <laughs> yeah, it's a preamble. That's right. Uh, with, with my communities, I've received 46 thoughtful letters and emails in favor, 28 thoughtful letters against, 
four undecided, and I've received another 35 in favor from the city at large and 27 against from the city at large. Um, but it comes down to the technical proposition that we have to be able to solve this problem and we're not putting ourselves into a position where we can solve it. So having said that, I would like to move recommendation number five, which refers LPT 2011-11 back to administration for further work to examine the question of allowing secondary suites as a legal use in all land use districts with specific consideration to, and these are the technical issues that are major barriers, the feasibility of a business license system for secondary suites to regulate owner occupation as well as enforce neighborhood <laughs> standards, and B, the development of a new enforcement approach to focus on suites that are unsafe or otherwise non-compliant. The reality is we have a huge black market in suites that is a reality. These people are living with safety issues and they're living with social justice issues and we have to address that. And so I think number five makes that motion, puts us on the right path and is a strong step and I encourage council to support motion five. And if you don't, please explain to me from the principal side and from the technical side why you're not. Thanks, Alderman Hodges. Very well, Alderman Pincott. Oh, thank you, Worship. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to propose an amendment to the motion, and that is to delete. Why not? It's a referral motion. You can only, that's why he said it separately from the others. You can only you can only Fine. amend it as to time. Uh, then uh, then I will vote against this. Uh, if, if this if, fails, if it you did can if it did contain uh, just B. Uh, uh, around uh, enforcement because that actually is one of the issues that we've heard about uh, that I've certainly heard from a lot of residents is uh, okay so you make this legal everywhere how are you going to enforce it how are we going to enforce how are we going to make sure so I fully support uh, uh, actually looking at how we can do in, uh, enforcement around compliance and non-compliance as to A, I, there, and the reason I will not support this referral is because of A. I don't see the point of making it a permitted use, removing the development permit process, and then actually adding a business license pro process on top of it. I do not see the point of saying to that 85-year-old grandmother who wants to have a secondary suite in her home so that somebody will mow the lawn and clean the sidewalk of snow in the winter, oh, and by the way, you have to have a business. You have to have a business license to do this. Um, I don't think it's an appropriate path to go down. I think replacing one permit process with a licensing process is doesn't cut red tape. Uh, I don't want to have to turn an 85-year-old grandmother into a business owner. So on that notion, because it has been moved and I can't amend it, I can't amend a referral, though I do see the orange books out. You can amend a referral, but we're trying to figure out if we can call them separately. Okay. Uh, if they can be called separately, I will support B. But if they can be called separately, I would ask that you call A separately so that I could vote against it and I hope everybody else would as well. <coughs> I uh, should otherwise, otherwise I, I should point out for clarification Alderman Pincott well that was beautifully well spoken as always. A actually doesn't say do that. A says go investigate if that's going to work or not and I just want to be clear that that's uh, not what you said. That's, that, that's fine. I don't, I, then I would like to not w have us waste administration time and money investigating something which I believe is completely inappropriate. Better, thank you. Uh, we're still looking on whether we can call them separately, but Alderman Chabot. Well, thank you, uh, Your Worship, and, uh, and Alderman Pincott for making that very passionate plea to not tie it to owner occupancy. Um, for me, it um, B is equally as challenging, if not even more challenging. And, and the reason I say that is because of the number of, uh, of unsafe suites that I've had to deal with in my community and the challenge that the enforcement officer has to try and, and bring those into compliance. Their inability to enter the premises, 
the court's not upholding the request to enter into those premises. This isn't a city of Calgary issue. This is a this is a constitutional issue. This goes far beyond our ability to legislate, beyond what it is that we've tried to do. Um, in fact, I've had both arguments. People, people complaining about secondary, illegal, unsafe secondary suites next door to them, as well as complaints from from uh, people that own some of these suites by uh, how forceful our our enforcement officers have been in trying to get in the door and, and how they've made their way into the door, um, in their opinion, uh, contrary to what is is uh, ethical. And yet, I hear from the enforcement officers that 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 is their only opportunity to be able to get in there. Otherwise, it's virtually impossible. So, B, um, I can't see how we could possibly change it without changing our courts system, changing provincial legislation and federal legislation to to facilitate that or give us an opportunity to uh, actually go into these suites and determine where the deficiencies are and try and correct them. We just don't have the tools to do it, we, and nor do we have the officers. The, our officers have such a huge backlog on just a complaint basis number of, of illegal suites that exist that they can't keep up with the current workload. I'm just, I can't, I can't see how this can actually work. So I'm not gonna support it. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Lowe? Well, Your Worship, uh, excuse me, Alderman Pincott uh, summed up the difficulty I have with, with A very well, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. Further, if it was possible to amend the, the body of uh, number five to, say, uh, refer administration back for further work, including consultation with R1 and RC1 communities, I might might be able to do something with it because it seems to me and that would be an opportunity Alderman Kara, to advance the principled as you call it argument and see if it in fact trumps how people feel about property rights as a principle so uh, recognizing that I can't amend this I can't support it uh, basically because it does not include the very people who are directly affected, the people who made the single biggest investment of their lives probably, researched it carefully and chose, chose to live in an R1 or RC1 community with an expectation that those conditions would not change at least without, uh, without their being consulted they may not agree, and I'll use Alderman Farrell's experience in Brentwood. Uh, some stunning results out of that, detractors all over the place, but you consult and you achieve, at the end of the day, something. Point of order, if Alderman Lowe would be willing to crap, sorry, if you'd be willing to find the way to insert that in three words or less, I'd be happy to include it as a friendly the fact, amendment. The fact, the fact is, Alderman Craw, the procedural bylaw says I can't do it. Alderman Pin Pincott couldn't do his. The only thing I can amend is as as to time. Yeah, so we can in fact take them separately. However We can't we can't include three words as a friendly No, amendment. not in a referral motion. Not in a referral act. However, mm -hmm. if you and the seconder, Alderman Hodges, um, wanted to withdraw your motion and we had unanimous consent of all the members present, then you could put a different motion. He wants to include community consultation. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Alderman Hodges? Are we agreed to allow Alderman Carra to withdraw this motion? Any well, opposed? Just, just, whoa, 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 oh, whoa, never mind. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Has to stay on the table. Alderman Chabot is opposed. Why? Okay, fine. It stays on the table. My question was going to be, could we address Alderman Pincott's issue yes. at the same time? we can but, vote on them separately. But obviously we cannot. Uh, Alderman Chabot has said no. So uh, that leaves me, and I would suggest anybody who's interested in 
respecting their RC1 property and on R1 and RC1 property owners. No alternative but not to support it as written. Now, once that happens, Your Worship, somebody can get up in their hind legs and replace the motion. Yes, if it fails, that is certainly possible to do so. Thank you. Alderman Hodges. I don't know if you'll allow this as debate or not, Your Worship, so I'll wait for you to no. st state. Uh, in all the years of uh, the SDAB appeals and uh, discussing things with uh, staff in the Planning Department, the uh, Bylaw Enforcement Division, I've uh, not run into a case, and maybe Ms. Flohn has, where a Bylaw Enforcement Officer, though he was refused entry, ultimately couldn't, in fact, achieve entry to a building to uh, based on a complaint he was or she was following up on. It seems to me since the 80s, the city has had the legislation in the MGA, now part 17 of the MGA, the planning section, uh, to obtain um, uh, access, whether by means of court order or a landlord property owner voluntarily, voluntarily agreeing to allow an inspection. And that seems to me that's the way the system is unless there's some, been some radical change in the last few hours. Your Worship, um, it, it's possible for the inspectors to enter a property uh, provided that the owner or resident consents to their entry. Um, however, if they do not get the consent, then there is an ability under the Municipal Government Act to make an application to the Court of Queen's Bench for an entry order. However, there is a cost for a filing fee in excess of $200. There is a need for staff resources to actually prepare an affidavit and an originating notice. It can be opposed. Um, my experience with them, um, I have done some, um, is they are fairly straightforward, but you never can predict what will arrive at, at the court's doorstep. So there are some resource implications, but there is a tool available in the MGA. That, that's why I want to clarify, Your Worship, and uh, that's mm -hmm. the issue the city faced back in the previous bylaw, 2P80. So uh, uh, as far as I know, there's an ability to do that, though it's somewhat onerous. There's a fee involved, and of course, it's before a court, and you're not guaranteed the result, but the pathway pathway to the court is set out in the legislation. Thank you, Alderman Hodges. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Well, I will support the referral with reluctance. I, um, I do think that there is a lack of, of clarity by members of the public on the difference between a, a poorly maintained illegal suite that is creating havoc in their community and what we're recommending, which is a secondary suite, a very different animal. Yes. And until we can somehow explain to Calgarians the difference and how we will manage the difference, I think we'll continue to have this debate. We've had this debate, um, I think, since I got elected. So, uh, and I do hope that members of the administration can find some solutions, some meaningful solutions to deal with item B, which is deal with the unsafe, non-compliant. And I think we need to uh, we need to use some teeth in the bylaw. I know the bylaws exist, but perhaps it's the reluctance that we've had to um, to uh, clean these places up because they're the only solution to a lot of tenants. But um, council, I urge every one of you to uh, look Mr. Halliday in the face, the father who lost his daughter in the Parkdale fire, excuse me, and tell him we shouldn't be addressing this issue. We must address this issue if we can look in the mirror at night. No, as Alderman Pincott said, this is not a panacea, but at my research with the Committee to End Homelessness, we looked at Portland, Edmonton, Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, and each of them looked at us with, with sort of blank faces going, well, of course you do this. This, this is a no-brainer. 
In most of those cities, it offered 10% of the housing, affordable housing solution. That's 10% of the housing solution without a public subsidy. So no, it's not a panacea, but it is very meaningful. And they were just including the individuals that were being assisted, the tenants that were being assisted, not certainly the mortgage helper for young families and the seniors who were able to stay in their homes. Um, we have communities in R1 that have the lowest population of, in their history because they have an aging population or family sizes are lower. So any discussion that this is going to put a burden on our water or sewer or fire department is frankly laughable. It's invisible density, Council. Um, and it is um, something I believe that we, we at some point in time have to get our heads around. So I'll support this simply because I know that we don't have the numbers to go forward. Um, and I think that some of this work may help get some people on side who have a fear of what this will do the, to their community. So um, meaningful discussion, not just a delay. Please, Council. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Alderman McLeod? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, too, have had quite a number of emails on this issue. Um, and quite frankly, I, most of what I've had have been, uh, at some level, have, there's been a lot of misinformation, um, as Alderman Hodge has pointed out on the process in particular. Um, and I do think that we need to do, we need some more time to do a better job with respect to informing people what this really means. I was um, part of the tenure, the development of the 10-year plan to end homelessness. I did serve on a subcommittee, and this, this inclusive zoning was part of the recommendations that we made. And I have to say, this was part of a very big puzzle. There was many pieces to it. This is one small piece in a very large puzzle. It is not going to solve the um, the problems that we have with housing and homelessness. And I would hazard a guess that very few people will, will actually move forward. For many of the existing illegal suites, they can't be made legal for reasons of the structure of the house or costs related. And I'm, I think that um, our ability to uh, accommodate people who um, are transitioning in their life, who are getting older and want somebody in their, in, to live with them in the basement um, because they're becoming more infirm or because they are um, needing some support in other ways. Uh, I think that's important and I think it, so it, it deals with, with financial issues. It deals with, um, you know, another example is somebody who gets divorced, it allows the family to stay in the house if they can rent out a basement or a bedroom for that matter. And we, we do have, um, you know, the whole empty bedroom thing and, and, and you know, the, the, the effective usage of the square footage of the houses that we have that allows us to use our infrastructure more effectively. Um, I am uh, a little concerned, I am more than a little concerned about the whole notion of a business license, but I, I will support this motion for the reason that I do not want to see the whole thing defeated. I think that, and it's an odd way of doing things, I think, but um, I think we need to deal with the fears that have been expressed in many of the emails, and I think we need to specifically address how this is not going to impact the quality of life of people that live in R1 areas. And we need to be really clear and we need to communicate that. Because of all the emails I've had, that is the overarching piece, is that it, this is going to impact my quality of life. And I also have to add that the emails that I've had that have been opposed have been very specific to one community in the ward. Not entirely, but very specifically to one community. Most of the rest have been broadly um, over, over the rest of the communities. So there is some, some differentials there that I think we also need to address. And I, for those reasons, I will support the referral. Thank you, Alderman McLeod. Alderman DeMong?
I will not be supporting this either, uh, mostly for the same reasons that uh, so eloquently stated by Alderman Lowe and Pincott. Um, I do want to mention that the section B, I, I, I believe, is, is the most important part that we have to deal with. I'd rather it not be stated if this comes up again in another form or manner, not so much as an enforcement only approach. I'd like to see it come up in a carrot and stick approach. There are two ways to deal with, with, with the suites and just saying enforcing the rules isn't always the, the, the only way. Encouraging them to, bring them to bring up to code would be a far better manner. Um, but no, in the, in the manner it's written now, I, I will certainly not be supporting it. Folks, eye on the clock. Um, well, we actually have just another minute. Alderman Putmans, did you want to? In that case, we are recessed until 7.15. Thank you. Alderman Poopmans. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, present and accounted for. Um, I'm just thinking, indeed. Uh, after a productive series of discussions after supper, I think we're moving to number five next. We're on number five. What, 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 where are we at right now? Have we moved, yet? Have we moved number five yet? Number, number five, five has, is moved. has been moved by Alderman Kara, and we're debating number five. Yes, I have a lot to say, as a matter of fact. I'm just collecting my thoughts. <laughs> I think the key to number five is that we really do need to learn more. When we ask for a fully informed debate, I'm not sure any of us have experienced the kind of debate that we would have ideally sought for an issue of this importance. So I am going to support number five as is. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Putmans. Alderman McLeod, would you mind trading places with me? <laughs> Your Worship. Thanks very much, Alderman McLeod. I, too, am going to support number five for a very straightforward reason. We have been talking to Calgarians for weeks and weeks and weeks on this. And unlike Alderman Pincott, I don't regret the conversation. I think it's been a good conversation. And I think that while well, passions have been high, passions should be high. Because this is a really important issue for the future of the city. What we heard consistently was that the present system doesn't work. Even the most hardcore opponents of change admit that it is ridiculous for city council to make decisions on individual secondary suite applications. Even the most strident of opponents agree that a system where we willingly turn a blind <coughs> eye to tens of thousands of our neighbors 
allowing them to live in a world without the basic legal protections that the rest of us enjoy is not a world or a community in which they want to live. We've heard that consistently. And all this motion does, it's very straightforward, is it says, go back and think some more. We don't have all the solutions. We don't have all the right answers. But we are not willing to stop. We are not willing to freeze in the system that doesn't make any sense. And I think this is important. Because what Alderman Farrell pointed out about those kids in Parkdale is very, very true. They didn't have enough heat. They had no one to complain to. The only option they got was an unsafe space heater. And we know what happened to those people. And it's because we as a community have willingly chosen to turn a blind eye because we know that we can't actually enforce the system we have right now. We can't do it anymore, Council. And so my goal in all of this, it wasn't me who brought this forward. I know the media love to say it was me who brought this forward. It was a report that came from, through the LPT, that was initiated by the previous council. But I was pleased that it came forward. Because now that it is on the table, we can no longer stop. We can no longer say, look, the logjam that council has been stuck in on this for years is good enough. Because it isn't. And so, yeah, we heard lots of great ideas. And I would fully admit that what we had on the table going into today was probably not exactly the right answer. But we've had lots of good ideas. And all this motion does is allow us to be able to move forward. It doesn't say you have to have licenses. It doesn't say you have to have a new enforcement approach. It says go think about it. Come back to council with some ideas because we understand that the system the way it is today is not the right answer. It's not the final system we need. So I encourage all of you to vote in favor of this because it really gives us the ability to move forward, to do some more thinking, and for council to ultimately make a decision on the kind of system we think our constituents want. The last thing I should say is there's been so much back and forth on who's in favor of this, who is against it. Here's what we know. We know that there have been two scientific polls done in the last year. And we know both of those polls showed overwhelming support for change. In fact, so much support that I would suggest if we ask Calgarians, has this winter been too long, we wouldn't actually get the same levels of support. It's as close to a consensus as we're ever going to get. And yeah, it's true that some people who have their alderman on speed dial, and hey, I was one of those people before I got up here, may be the ones who are complaining about this. It's true. If you guys want more data, I'll give you more data. We've had 500 communications to my office. 67 or 69% of them have been in favor of change. The scientific polls that we've done have consistently shown that 75 to 80% of people are in favor of change. And if we'd asked them the question, is the status quo a good answer, I would suggest to you that 99% of them would have said no. So again, I encourage you all to move this ball forward, to help us move down the field, and to help us do what's right for all of our neighbors. Thank you, Your Worship. There's no other lights on, so we'll call the question. I've had a... Oh. Hmm. Alderman Carra to close. Yeah, I agree with what the mayor said. Um, we talked about... I just want to make the point that nothing that we've agreed to do or even contemplated to do today is the answer to any question. It's sort of a chicken and egg situation. Uh, secondary suites are not the answer to affordable housing. Nothing we've contemplated today or considered contemplating today is the answer to secondary suites. It's just a step of motion in the direction of getting there. And so I encourage you guys to support this because it's moving out of our current untenable situation and it provides the opportunity to get to a tenable place in the future. And so I hope, uh, I hope we'll vote for this. Thank you. Claude. Thank you, Alderman Carra. I just want to uh, ensure or confirm that we can call this in two parts, with part, with subsection A being the second part. That is my understanding. Thank you. And I've been asked for a recorded vote as well on each. How am I going to call it? We'll call A first and then B. Uh -oh. 
proceed you, Your Worship. The, uh, the difficulty with that <coughs> is, you know, the, the preamble has some content in it which I cannot support. A has, for example, I can't support. And B, but because, so it, it's got to be called in three parts, I guess, is my question. If you can't support any of them, vote in on A and B. <clears throat> if I may, uh, Alderman McLeod, again on procedure, I did check with Ms. Flone, and the preamble is read into A and it's read into B. So what you're really calling is preamble A and then preamble B. Okay. Is everybody clear what we're voting on? Sorry, I, I, I am not, because are we, if from what the mayor just said, are, would we be technically voting on the preamble twice? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that, thank you. That would be my understanding. So we're <laughs> calling a recorded vote on A. On the recorded vote, Alderman Hodges, four, Alderman Farrell, four, Alderman Curra, four, Alderman Collier, Cart against, Alderman Chabot, against, Alderman Demong, against, Mayor Nenshi, four, Alderman Lowe, against, Alderman Putmans, four, Alderman Stevenson, against, Alderman Jones, against, Alderman Pincock, against, Acting Mayor McLeod, four. That's lost, Your Worship. Six, seven. Thank you. And now we'll vote on B. On the recorded vote for 5B, Alderman Hodges, 4, Alderman Farrell, 4, Alderman Carra, 4, Alderman Collier, Cart against, Alderman Chabot against, Alderman Demong against, Mayor Nenshi, 4, Alderman Lowe against, Alderman Putmans, 4, Alderman Stevenson against, Alderman Jones against, Alderman Pincott, 4, Acting Mayor McLeod, 4. That's carried, Your Worship. Seven six. Ouch. And we're back. <clears throat> Alderman Kara. Thank you, Your Worship. Again, this is a series of chicken and eggs that we're dealing with today. Um, Recommendation number four, directs administration to examine the Alberta Building Code requirements for secondary suites with re respect to requirements that have a material impact on the construction cost of such suites, but do not have an impact on the safety of those houses. Based on those findings, prepare a set of recommended changes to the Building Code for presentation to the provincial government and report back to Council no later than 2011 June. This is an essential component of the process. We cannot even begin to address secondary suites without addressing this. There's a bunch of other things that we have to address, but we need to bring the province on side. And we need to send a strong message to the province that we're eager to do this work. So I encourage you guys to support this. Uh, thanks, Alderman Carra. And Alderman Farrell is seconding. 
Um, and I would be really happy if someone were to ask me a question about my conversations with the provincial government on this particular issue. When they get to it, Alderman Hodges. Well, I think I'll ask that question because, uh, in fact, that's what was going through my mind there for a couple of seconds as to whether, in fact, there hasn't already been a discussion about this, given what I heard an MLA whisper in my ear uh, during the <coughs> celebration of the uh, uh, Chinese New Year's at the end of January of 2011. Yeah, um, I, can, I can certainly fill counsel in on my conversations. To back up a little bit, um, as many of you know, there was an MLA committee chaired by MLA Mo Amory some years ago um, whose goal was to simplify building and fire code regulations around secondary suites. And most of them make sense. They're very common sense. There is one sticky one, which is the requirement for a separate heating system and ductwork for the secondary suite. And in fact, we just got an interpretation memo that said that that could be defined as, you guys are going to be shocked at this, a separate furnace or a space heater. <gasps> yes, exactly. So um, I have, I've talked uh, with Minister Dennis on this issue a number of times, uh, and he has suggested, as has Minister, and Minister Goudreau, in fact, wrote me back, wrote a letter to me back, saying that um, this is something they would be willing to consider. Um, my sense in reading between the lines is it would be easier for them to consider it if council were to authorize us to actually make, a, make an ask on that. So for me, this really is about that two furnaces issue. Yes, but uh, you're, the danger would be the, pro the problem. I'm trying to be serious. The problem would be if they take the second furnace out as a requirement and leave the space heater in. Well, yeah. So your worship, I, when you're discussing it with them, as I know, or they're discussing it with you, keep an eye uh, you know, on that, that they don't, we don't uh -huh. end up with the space heater routine. I absolutely will, Alderman Hodges. Um, and in fact, I, I, I misspoke slightly a moment ago. It was actually the letter from the minister that said, in his mind, a space heater is good. And if council passes this, I will be able to write him a note going, uh, no. Uh, Alderman Chabot. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, well, um, as you indicated, there was some discussion some time ago to try and relax some of those regulations to facilitate um, bringing some of these units into compliance more easily. And um, when it comes to uh, relaxation of regulations, and uh, although some may not believe it has a material safety uh, impact, um, as you pointed out yourself, even a separate furnace um, Having lived in basement suites myself personally, I can, I can attest to one thing for sure. We never seem to agree on, on temperature, us and the people above. So whether it's the upstairs that's uh, boiling or the downstairs that's boiling, there seems to be a need to supplement heat somehow, some way in one of the rooms. And therein lies part of the challenge. Um, and it goes beyond that. I, what other relaxations will there be? I know one of the proposals had to do with ceiling heights, relax the requirement for ceiling heights. I know that ceiling heights may not be a problem for a guy of my height, but uh, people that are significantly taller than me, which is probably the majority of the population, may have issue with the relaxation on some of those ceiling heights, especially when you're in the midst of a, of a crisis and you can't see where you're going. Um, what other relaxations would there be? separate entrance, um, door that opens in versus out. I don't know what all the relaxations are, but um, I'm not supportive of any initiative that will compromise or potentially compromise the safety of individuals that reside within a building. So I'm not going to support this. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Lowe? My questions to, uh, I'm not too sure who can answer it, is how long does it usually take the government of Alberta to make a regulatory change like this? Mr. Watson. It takes a long time. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in, as a matter of fact, April 15th is when we have to get all 
our changes, proposed changes to the Alberta government, and there's a, it was on my desk a week ago, and there's an, a memo from my Sorry, Mr. Company. Watson, I wonder if I could get, get you to just. I'm sorry. Is that better? That's better, yeah. I was just saying that April 15th is actually a deadline right now for them to consider changes for the 2012 Alberta Building Code, as a matter of fact. So that, that's, that's the kind of lead time they're talking about. I have a memo coming to you in a couple of days that they're going to outline the ones that we are bringing forward. Um, I, obviously, I don't think we can get this into that pipeline that quickly. We'll certainly bring it forward. The minister, I think in order in council, I think um, solicitor is the right term, can actually do something out of sync with the rest of it, but that even becomes more difficult. But we can certainly look at it. The, the large issue in terms of cost, as His Worship has mentioned, is the requirement under all new construction now for secondary suites to provide a separate uh, heating system. Uh, we may be able to get a, a, an agreement with the province, as His Worship has mentioned, that a space heater is the equivalent of a separate heating system. We'll certainly uh, take that under advisement. We're talking with the province almost on a daily basis on some of these code changes. Okay. It, you know, that, that you answered actually two questions in one there was how long, a long time is the right answer and when's the cutoff date and that's the 15th of April this year. I also understand that, that through Northern Council things can happen. I always worry when that happens because very often like our ex election expenses things, they're not really wholly baked when they get through there. So it's a, a, a bit of a concern. If you could add something else to the list, Mr. Watson. Uh, to the space heater. I just uh, had an application for a secondary suite in our one district across my desk today. The interesting thing about it was that to get to the mechanical room, you had to go walk through the full length of the suite. And uh, that struck me as being a bit odd, uh, particularly, and, and, it, and you know, that, that was between where the people were living and the way out of the house, I might add, too. So it's uh, it's a bit of an interesting conundrum. So uh, while I, I appreciate it, Alderman Carra, and I have, and I agree, this is uh, an essential element. I have no difficulty supporting this, but uh, quite frankly, uh, we're probably looking at 18 months conservatively until we have something material in our hands to work with. But you've got to start somewhere. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Alderman McLeod. Thank you, Worship. I'll be brief on this. Um, I think this is another one of those barriers to creating safe and affordable suites, and I think that the province has committed themselves to the 10-year plan. This is a piece of that puzzle, and I think it needs to be supported um, for that and many other reasons. I, I think that um, the code with respect to secondary suites um, is something that actually um, prevents people, uh, it encourages people not to get them legalized, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alderman McLeod. Alderman Collier. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> I was just reviewing those uh, recommendations from the 2006 report of the province, and uh, basically what we're being asked to do here is covered in those recommendations. I mean, they do talk a lot about the, the cost. Um, the number one recommendation was uh, standards for secondary suites should be developed for use in single family homes to address the need for safety and affordability. And they have a bunch of numbers around that. The government should establish province wide standards for secondary suites under the Alberta Building and Fire Codes and continue to have choice to determine where uh, these suites should be permitted. Uh, standards for secondary suites should apply to both new and existing homes and there's others. I guess what I would rather see, Mr. Watson, is to have you scope out what this piece of work would entail. Because if you don't have the resources in order to do this, something has to come off the table in order for us to undertake this work. I think it's important work, but uh, what you could do would be to look at the recommendations as they were approved by the government in 06 and, and, and look at that five-year period on, on where we've come since those recommendations were made. So my question to you is, uh, if, we do, if we were to refer this and have you come back in a week or two to scope this out with the resources that would be required, 
uh, to do this work, especially if it's going to take 18 months, I don't know how long it would take, to scope it out uh, and a timeline. Would that, uh, would, would that be useful? Get this right yet? Thank you. Uh, I don't think the actual amount of work to scope this out is that large. With respect, um, the hard work is more the discussions with the province and the negotiations to get people on side to support it, both within the the building industry. Although again, I don't think that should be a huge issue. Uh, I'm not as worried about the. Uh, we have people in building regulations now. Their job is to look at the code and make changes all the time and figure out how to move it forward. And you're absolutely right. Based on the work that was done in 2006, there's a lot of work already, preparatory work already done that we can bring back up again and look at. So it's not so much getting it ready to go. It's more about getting it over the goal line with the province. That takes a much longer process. Right. So I appreciate that. I'm probably going to have more problems on the enforcement side than I am on making code changes in terms of staff and resources. So. And this doesn't speak at all to consulting with anyone, this piece? Well, no. The, the, the way it's these, these become very technical issues that um, there are code specialists, and this is less of a con consultational process than it is uh, making sure that we coordinate with our partners in fire and then making sure that we can get partnerships with other municipalities and then build a case for the, uh, the various committees that deal with code changes at the province. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman collier -Cart. Um Anyone else before I call on Alderman Carra to close? Alderman Carra? Um, yeah, I think obviously this is a chicken and egg situation that we're dealing with and we have to just get moving rather than contemplate what comes first. Uh, I hope you support this. Closed. Thanks Alderman Carra. On this recommendation are we agreed? Any opposed? Opposed. Uh, I only see two. Chabot and Hodges are opposed. Very well then. Alderman Carra. <coughs> Thank you Your Worship. Um, We've had a lot of talk today, and I mean, I think the one thing that I heard that isn't contained in the remaining two motions is the potential for uh, community consultation. And I did say in my opening address that I think that we have to get our community planning processes uh, to the next level. But in the spirit of addressing the principled issues, which are housing affordability, which are competitiveness of Calgary as we enter a, a, an ec economic upturn, um, positive property rights as opposed to negative pop property rights, the fact that people have the right to do things on their property rather than say what other people can do on, their, on the property surrounding them. Um, I'm going to move uh, two and three, two directing administration to prepare a bylaw amendment that allows for secondary suites in attached and detached forms be a discretionary use in all districts currently zoned R1, RC1, and RC1L within a 2.5 kilometer radius of Mount Royal University State, ACAD, Bow Valley College, and the University of Calgary. And number three directs administration to prepare a bylaw amendment that allows for secondary suites attached and detached forms to be a discretionary use in all, all districts currently zoned R1, RC1, and RC1L within 400 meters of an LRT station or BRT stop. I encourage uh, the debate surrounding this to differentiate between the principal issues and the uh, technical issues because that's really the, the crux of the, of the matter. I do need a seconder, uh, Alderman Carra. Is anyone willing to second this? Thanks, Alderman McLeod. All right, we got her on the table. Um, Alderman, put, and, and we will vote. I, I'm not even going to ask you. We will vote on them separately. Alderman Putmans. Thank you, Your Worship. I think in the spirit of previous two motions ago where we passed a referral to administration for more work on this subject, um, in a keen sense from my point of view of wanting to learn how 
secondary suites can be allowed to come out into the open, become safe, address parking issues, address owner occupancy, all of these issues which I expect administration to consider, and furthermore, in due course, a fully evolved public consultation and full public debate. I would expect both the issues of number two, that is allowing in a discretionary, discretionary use in all districts currently zoned R1, RC1 and RC1L within a 2.5 radius in Ward 6 of Mount Royal University, the vast majority of that space will be in Glamorgan, which is RC1. I would expect that matter to come under the consideration of number five. In other words, I would expect administration to report on the implications of that for Glamorgan in particular, and I would assume other neighborhoods affected by the discretionary use now permitted or to be permitted around the other educational institutions, SAIT, ACAD, Bow Valley, and University of Calgary. Similarly, in number three, um, directing administration to prepare a bylaw amendment that allows for secondary suites attached and detached forms to be a discretionary use in all currently zoned R1, RC1, and RC1L within 400 meters of an LRT station. I think that the implications for a number of the current LRT stations and those under construction um, will also be similarly affected and perhaps um, could be subject of some of the work and research that administration does. So therefore, I will not be supporting number two or number three in anticipation of the results of the research that will be done by administration. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Alderman Putman's Alderman Hodges. Yeah, uh, Your Worship, uh, those are uh, uh, good comments, but there's just uh, one problem. In number two and number three, we're not asking the administration to do any research about anything and they're being given no direction other than a land use application that will fly forth sooner or later, probably sooner, to the various community associations and we, the, the obligation may be on the city, may be on the association or other organized groups or not so organized groups to uh, hold uh, some public discussion about it. So if, Alderman Putmans, if you had suggested that there be a public engagement exercise attached to number two and in fact to number three as well because that affects a lot of areas in the city given that BRT is a much more extensive system than it used to be then you need to let the administration know you expect a full public engagement process just as a, a private uh, company a private developer would do with land use application this is what this is only it affects many 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 more uh, residential and uh, commercial areas res residential is the issue here of course than any uh, private, uh, private uh, land use, private developer's application uh, may, uh, would, would ever do. So uh, I'm not uh, going to be supporting two and three as they st uh, stand either, and unless someone can define a good public engagement process that goes with it, otherwise we're leaving Mr. Watson and his staff hang out to try. Alderman Pincock. Thank you. Um, question for Mr. Watson around 400 meters. Um, when we've talked about walk distances and walking distances, has it, has it not typically been a 500 meter radius that we Six. talk about? Through the chair, there, there's not a lot of science in this. There's been over the last year or so talk about 600 meters. Then in the uh, Calgary Transportation Plan, it was decided to be 400 meters. Uh, 400 meters is what, about half a mile? Uh, quarter of a mile. Quarter of a mile, yeah, more like a quarter. Okay. Uh, so 400 meters is consistent with what we've identified in the CTP? 400 is consistent with the Calgary Transportation Plan, which is why I think if, you know, if you're looking for a number, <clears throat> 400 is not an right. unreasonable number in terms of I mean, obviously, and, and the, the magic around all these things is, of course, as you go farther, the, the number of people willing to walk drops off, and, and whether or not there's connectivity in the sidewalks and so on. Right. It's always, uh, you it's can always pick tied 500, to the urban you can form. Six, pick 600. I mean, it, okay. all it's right. making so, the circle bigger. Okay, I just wanted to check because I wasn't sure whether the 400 was consistent. <clears throat> uh, Your Worship, I would actually like to, at this point, like to propose an amendment. Thank you. My amendment will be in number three, 
mm -hmm. uh, would be to take the word discretionary and change uh, amend that to be permitted. Oh, come on. Really? That is my amendment. Okay. I will allow it. Do we have a seconder? I would second it if I could, Brian, but. <laughs> well, I uh, find that disappointing that, uh, that there wouldn't be a seconder for that. We, uh, when we talk about the city that we, uh, <laughs> that we just talk about in the, uh, in the transportation plan, in the municipal development plan, it talks about, did I see a hand, did I, did I see a hand go up for a second? Oh, no. I think I did. I think you got your second. <clears throat> well, that's good. Then I um, will. Actually, hold on, hold no, on, hold she on. Actually, Can uh, she, she seconded, seconded the, the main motion, right? Okay. Sorry. Never mind. Uh, so I find that, dis thank you, Alderman McLeod. Valiant effort. Uh, you know, w we talk about concentrating or, and starting to look around how we, we make use, make, make maximal use of our transit nodes. And to make secondary suites a permitted use around our transit nodes uh, seems to me to be pretty much the place you want to start. Urban CSA uh, last year gave a great report to Council uh, on exactly how you could start with permitted use secondary suites, 400 meters around, uh, around LRT stations, <coughs> and how that would serve the, the student population. Uh, and how that would actually be able for allow us to maximize that uh, affordable housing for a population that is underserved. Um, so uh, I just, you know, again, so I, I find it disappointing that we're here once again. We're talking about discretionary use. Uh, boy, if we we're worried about, uh, uh, you know, workload at SDAB, uh, I, uh, I will, again. Uh, as I said initially, uh, I will support this, but again, m my disappointment is in that it is piecemeal. And I, and I do wish that at the very least, we could have had secondary suites be a permitted use around the one place that they should be to start with. Alderman Pincott, your remarkable powers of persuasion are on display yet again because you just got yourself a seconder. Thank you. Open. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, an, we have an amendment on the floor to change the word. It was number, just number three, not number two. OK, so to change the word discretionary to permitted in number three on the amendment, just wave your hand if you'd like to speak on the amendment. Alderman Chabot. Um, Your Worship, I'm just wondering whether or not we shouldn't move an amendment to the amendment on the basis of that we're moving into a completely um, new land use designation. Discretionary is one step. This is taking two steps. And uh, in light of that, I think a public consultative process is absolutely essential um, in order to uh, move into this permitted use as opposed to discretionary. Discretionary is one thing, um, and, and I'm all for thinking outside of the box, but right now we need to first think inside the box before we start thinking outside the box. And so that's why I'm going to propose that, uh, that we add um, to that motion following a, a public engagement process. Hold on, Alderman Chabot. The effect of what you're suggesting would be that regardless of the results of the public engagement, they would still come back with a bylaw amendment making that change. Is that your intent? Or would you rather have them go think about it and then come back maybe with a bylaw amendment? Um, it would probably be preferred the other way, as you said. So what, so what I would suggest is the following, if you, if you go with me. Leave it for now. Let's let the motion go. If the motion passes, there's no point because they would have come back with that anyway. If the motion fails, I will recognize you and you can put a new motion that says go do public engagement on this issue. If it fails. If it fails. Point to order. 
You can't do an amendment to an amendment to an amendment anyway. It's not an amendment to an amendment to an amendment. We're only at two. This is all amendments. No, this is this is motions arising. No. It's all it's not new motions. motions. Yeah. Motions. These are motions. See? So what do you think, Alderman Chabot? Um, it, it's not an amendment to an amendment. To amendment. To it's just an amendment. Un, so then you're suggesting that if this fails that, that I should come bring forward an, an alternate motion that says yeah because the, the challenge here I mean you can do it I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rule it out of order it's just the challenge is the way it's worded now we're doing public engagement but they've only got one option at the end of the public engagement which is not engaged which is to bring forward the the bylaw and it seems a bit disingenuous to do that yeah okay I will stand down thank you for that advice thanks Alderman Chabot uh, anyone else on the amendment just wave Alderman Lowe well, Your Worship, as you're aware, uh, I had, uh, in anticipation of number five failing twice, put together a, a motion which addressed the issue of community by community public engagement to do the research to determine that Mr. Watson is, is <laughs> to do the research that uh, would, would provide the options of going this route. That failed, and I'm, I'm still sitting here looking at the language uh, because I, I rolled into it issues concerning uh, the safety of suites and uh, community identified safety issues around suites, and there are many. And they are identified by the communities whether or not we agree there they are safety issues or not. Everything, you know, perception is reality in these cases. So I'm not without the community by community consultation. I believe, Alderman Putman, you said this, this hits, what, four or five in, in communities in your ward. It will uh, hit uh, four in mine. And what we're doing is eliminating the work done at Planning Commission where we've put in R1S into, into community plans and so on that are not developed now, but where there are uh, uh, LRT stations or BRT stations either now or planned. And what this does is eliminates all of that. And it does it without consulting the people. And I can't support that. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you want to get people on board and you want to have a discussion with them on the principles, as Alderman Carras says, the principles, uh, principled item issues around this, then you had better talk to the folks. If you want massive pushback, do this. And I, for one, am not interested in the pushback. I think if we approach this properly, there's an opportunity to have some acceptance. But this will guarantee that won't happen. So I won't support two or three. Or the amendment, which is what you're actually debating on, right? Alderman or Obama? the amendment. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm doing it all at once, Your Worship. That's all right. I've got a bad throat, and I'm, I'm trying to save it for the real argument here. I appreciate your being efficient, Alderman Lowe. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it's a question of how you go about this if you want community buy-in or not. This will not get community buy-in. And in, unless you talk to people about it, you're not going to get community buy-in. Alderman Hodges is exactly right. This is exactly like a land use. Thank you. Um, to the amendment, Alderman Carra, then Alderman Putmans. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, 400 meters, five-minute walk. The quarter, the quarter mile walk. It's you know a time-honored, across civilization measurement. Most human settlements sort of fit within that 400-meter radius settlement pattern, and it's been proven that people will walk five minutes to catch the bus provided they're walking through environments that are somewhat pleasant to walk through. 
people will walk 800 meters to catch high quality train service, provided they're walking through a high quality pedestrian environment. These are quantitatively established facts and best practices for 30 years of urban design. So that's where those numbers come from. Um, we're, well, all things being equal, but you know, there's a lot of walkable cities in frozen places, whether it's Scandinavia or Denmark or Montreal. No, they're quite, five minutes is, is a gold-plated standard. Also, we're building a transit infrastructure that's going out to these, that's going out into these communities that represent a massive investment. We have high level city policy that's saying we are going to create complete communities around there. Secondary suites does not a complete community make. It's a small step in that amendment, direction. Alderman Kara, the amendments. <laughs> We're speaking on the amendment. Yeah, I know. Okay. And I'm saying, and I'm saying I, I did not make, I thought a baby step of discretionary use was the very least that we should responsibly tackle as, as people who represent a municipal development plan that was passed by council and that was the result of exhaustive public engagement with the citizens of Calgary. This is a rubber hits the road point. I'd be happy to support permitted because I think it's the very least we can do. I think it's almost the very least we can do. Discretionary use is the very least we can do. So I'll support this. Thank you very much, Alderman Kara. On the amendment, Alderman Potmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. On the amendment, um, I'm a little concerned by the, the freewheeling sense I have here of how we're proceeding through some fairly major policy decisions. I have heard experts tell us, and at LPT for that matter, um, wise and experienced planners say, if we are looking at at discretionary, at, at, at secondary suites, period. Let's just leave it at that for the moment. At secondary suites as a solution for density around LRT and BRT stations, we've really missed the mark. These are not a density solution. I've heard my dear colleague this evening say that this is an affordability issue. And I'm not so sure it's that either. Just because it's proximity to an LRT, yes, it has some elements of that, but I'm not sure that's the policy either. I'm familiar with the MDP and other documents. Um, there are a host of people that suggest by forcing anything around these LRT stations, especially new ones as they go into established communities, we're probably making a mistake. We're rushing headlong into this without even a heads up to some of our communities who have a bare inkling that this might be on the horizon. And now all of a sudden, we're entertaining an amendment to suggest permitted use in these areas. Um, this is several steps beyond what I think the communities and certainly myself are comfortable with. So on that basis, I will not be supporting the amendment. Thank you, Alderman Putmans. Anyone else on the amendment? On the amendment. Alderman Pinkott, did you want to close? Yes. Well, I, I want to gra grab one word that Alderman Putman said. And he said force. We're not forcing anything. We're not forcing anybody to do anything. We're saying that within an area, within a radius, within an area that makes sense from our ND, MDP's perspective, that makes sense if, if we want to look at the affordable component to maximize affordability, we are giving you, the homeowner, the option to do this. We're permitting you to do something with your property. We're not forcing anybody to do anything. And I think that if we are going to start somewhere with permitted use, which as we, anybody who's looked at this at other municipalities, other jurisdictions in Canada, other places, permitted use is where almost everybody gets to, it's where it's what you do, then this is the place to start, is exactly around uh, LRT and BRT stations, exactly around those mass public transit hubs. So we're not forcing anybody to do anything. With this amendment, what we're saying is we're giving, we're allowing people to do things if they choose. We're not forcing any community to change, anybody to change. I hope you do support this amendment. Uh, I think it is, if, if we want to be incremental, let us be incremental. Let us be incremental towards where 
we know we need to get to, which is permitted use for secondary suites. And let's start around the place that it makes the most sense. On the amendment, closed on the amendment. Uh, recorded vote on the amendment, Your Worship, please. Okay. On the amendment, the amendment is simply to change the word discretionary to permit it. That's the only thing we're voting on now. Okay. Um, in number three, change the word discretionary to admit it, to permit it in number three. On the recorded vote, Alderman Hodges against, Alderman Farrell for, Alderman Carra for, Alderman Collier Cart against, Alderman Chabot against, Alderman DeMong against, Alderman McLeod for, Alderman Lowe against, Alderman Putmans against, Alderman Stevenson against, Alderman Jones against, Alderman Pincott for, Mernenshi against. That's lost your worship. Thank you. Back to the motion on the floor, which is number two and number three on your screen. I think you've already spoken on this. Oh, no, you haven't, Alderman Lowe. You only spoke on the amendment. So if you want to hit the main motion, you may. No, I spoke to both, Your Worship. I'm not supporting anyone. I know, but he still has the right. Thanks, Alderman Lowe. Alderman Putmans, you've already spoken on the main motion, I think. You said you didn't like it. Okay. Alderman DeMong. Would seem it's amendment time. I don't know if you're going to consider this to be uh, conflictory. Um, I would like not to have the BRT stop listed as they're mostly a transitional stage uh, at this point. What? What BRT stop? No, he said separately? he wants it to be an amendment. So my um, my um, practice on this one, Alderman Demong, even though Alderman Chabot will say it's not in the procedure bylaw, my practice is to ask the mover and seconder if they yep. find it contrary. So Alderman DeMong is proposing an amendment. He's, I'm not asking you to vote yay or nay, but he's proposing an amendment to remove or BRT stop from number three. So Alderman Carra and Alderman McLeod, would you find that contrary to your motion? We are going to call them separately. Uh -huh. It's fine. Okay, so I'll call them. I'll call them in three sections then. I just want to note that I think that BRT stop in your clothes. Okay. Well, I just, oh, you don't just like a the point of stop. order. I just think no. I think it's BRT. Not a point of order. <laughs> it's what? not a point of order at all. <laughs> 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 Even though you're the deputy. <laughs> it was a good try, though. Okay, Alderman Zamong, So we'll call them separately. Okay. Uh, continuing on, we are getting rid of the. Yeah. Okay. Permitted scratch, scratched off. Is a two and a half kilometer radius a realistic area to actually have this as a discretionary? It seems like an extremely long way. I mean, that's how many minutes is that, G Giancarlo? It's Sorry, long. that's <laughs> in walk. incorrect. Hour walk? Um, yeah. I, I, I will tell you, Alderman DeMong, that we went back and forth on that number, and I was actually thinking of a 30 minute walk when I thought that that would sense. All right. Thank you. On the motion, Alderman Schmoe. Just wonder if you're going to make the suggestion on this, um, as you did on the previous motion, if I were to suggest that we would probably want to undertake a consultative process on, around this issue. Same issue, right? Consultative process amounts to the same thing. Okay. Thank you. I'm not trying to steamroll you, Alderman Chabot, but if it's council's will to just move forward today, then there's there's not much point. If it's not council's will, then I'll recognize you right away, and you can put um, to move forward on a, a very simple motion to direct administration to engage in a consultative process around, and then just turn two and three into bullet points. Okay. Um, all right. Anyone else on this motion? Um, yeah, actually, I would. Alderman Pincott? Thank you. 
Oh, really? <laughs> Very nice. Thanks, uh, Alderman Pincott. Uh, Alderman Pincott just looked over at me and said, don't you want to debate? I'm comfortable with moving forward uh, on these two particular motions. I understand that council, you know, uh, has had a bit of a discussion around these, but these two also have been on the, on the docket, if you will, for some time. Uh, number three is very much uh, part of the municipal development plan and the Calgary transportation plan, um, at least in my opinion it is, that we've already passed. Number two just makes sense. And you remember that one of the reasons that I've been raising this for so very long is because I really truly believe that we need to afford protections to the folks who are living in these illegal suites. Someone some time ago talked about a carrot and stick approach. I think it was Alderman DeMong. The problem with the situation we have right now is that we have no carrot, we only have a stick. And the stick we have to use is the same stick for everyone. So Alderman Chabot and I were speaking out over dinner and we were saying that in the neighborhood in which he lives and in which I grew up, most of the illegal suites are, you know, fine. They're decent places to live. But in other neighborhoods, they're not. In other neighborhoods in his ward, they're not. And I would agree with that. The problem is right now that we only have the ability to treat them exactly the same. The real fire pit versus the actual totally decent place to live with the decent landlord. What this allows us to do in those areas, particularly around the universities where we know there are a large concentration of illegal suites, is it actually provides us with the carrot. Because then we can go to the landlords and say, this is what you need to move into compliance, instead of saying, kick those students out. And that's really what this is all about. Uh, and I would, you know, I, underst I would understand certainly if council wanted to think more about this one, but I think we've thought through this one quite well. We've had some very good input from the students associations over the last couple of years about this one. They strongly are in favor because it protects their members. And I think that today we're ready, we're, we're ready to move on this one. And I would, I, would, I, I would urge council to go forward and move on these two. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna have requests for a recorded vote. When I'm, three? three so thank you so a recorded vote then on number two that is before us the universities first oh i apologize alderman craw closed your light on so thank you consider it closed uh then um uh recorded vote on number two No, actually, I think Alderman Lowe's going to have one more. Well, if this fails, Chabot's going to have one more. Oh, well, if this if this fails, which on the recorded vote, Alderman Hodges against Alderman Farrell four. Alderman Carra four, Alderman Collier Cart against, Alderman Chabot against, Alderman DeMong against, Alderman McLeod four, Alderman Lowe against, Alderman Putmans against, Alderman Stevenson against, Alderman Jones four, Mayor Nenshi four, Deputy Mayor Pincott four. It's lost your worship. Thank you very much. On number two, up to the words uh, station, so LRT station, so without the last three words. Recorded vote, please.
On the recorded vote, Alderman Hodges against, Alderman Farrell for, Alderman Carra for, Alderman Collier Cart against, Alderman Chabot against, Alderman DeMong against, Alderman McLeod for, Alderman Lowe against, Alderman Putman's against, Alderman Stevenson against, Alderman Jones for, Mayor Nenshi for, Acting Mayor Pincott for. Exactly. It's lost to worship. Thank you. And with that, there is no point in voting for the last one. Well, no, there still is. It's three words not hanging on anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're actually right. Okay. They actually do presume the preamble. But... <laughs> Alderman Schmo. Um, as predicted, probably, Your Worship, I have uh, an alternate proposed motion which is, uh, I've got it partially written out, which is direct administration to undertake a consultative process to consider rezoning R1, RC1, RC1L, to consider amending the land use bylaw to add secondary suites as discretionary use within 2.5 kilometer radius of Mount Royal University site, ACAD, Bow Valley College, and University of Calgary. And I wonder if we could undertake a similar a direction for recommendation number three. I think what we can. I think what we can probably do, Alderman Chabot, is do what you just said as the preamble, and then just show what are currently two and three as the points underneath. Make sense? Yep. Okay. If that's clear enough for for the Madam Clerk, is that clear enough for you? Want to read it one more time, the preamble? Okay. Direct administration to undertake a consultative process to consider rezoning R1, RC1, RC1L, to consider amending the land use bylaw to add secondary suites as a discretionary use within 2.5 kilometer radius of Mount Royal, University, SAIT, ACAD, Bow Valley College, and University of Calgary. And same preamble <coughs> to add secondary suites as discretionary use within 400 meters of LRT station or BRT stops. Very elegant, thank you. So, do we have a seconder for that, please? Just to do a cons oh, public consultation process on those two things that just lost. Alderman Dumont? All right, uh, any discussion on this one? Alderman Lowe? Well, it's getting better. The uh, a public consultation process. <coughs> uh, I'd be happier if it was a community by community public consultation process to explore options. So I will put that amendment to this and that uh, to report back through LPT by February of next year. I'm just waiting until we have the original motion yeah. on the screen, and yeah. then we'll look at your amendment, okay? Sure. No problem. Musical interlude, anyone? Aldrin Fincott, little song and dance? <laughs> no, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was only kidding, Aldrin Fincott. If I really wanted a song and dance, I would have called up Alderman Carra. <laughs> So um, while we're waiting for it to go on the screen, Alderman Lowe, let me just so I understand. Your intent is to do a community by community consultation on these two issues? On these two issues, on okay. the affected communities within the radius as described. Okay. It's quite extensive. And, uh, it is quite extensive. And uh, the other thing is to do that with a view to creating options. Last bit again, Alderman Lowe? With a view to creating options to extend. It will cost a significant amount of money and uh, I would suggest that uh, 
the uh, this would be a worthy candidate for the uh, innovative fund. <laughs> I, I don't know why Mr. Tobert finds that so amusing. Um, <laughs> But the um, also your worship the money okay. would have to come separately since we don't yet have terms of reference for the innovation fund. I, I appreciate that, your worship, and uh, you know, it's also it's it's work that could be conducted by a consultant. Just a thought. While I'm standing here in my feet. Your worship, I just have a question in relation. To, we just said that we're going to do a blanket policy. And report back in December. So shouldn't this come either before or in December as well? Because if it comes in February and we've already decided to do it the other way, it's a mute point. That's exactly why I was wrinkling my forehead. And I, then, since when it's not written, December's just fine. Okay. They can come okay. together. Do we have the wherewithal? Hmm? We have the wherewithal to do that. So with that we'll uh, we'll arrange that out of the uh, or out of the. Uh, Perhaps Mr. Fund. Mr. Watson doesn't have the money to do it. I know that. But we do. We did create an innovation fund. This is innovative use of land, innovative land use. I think it's appropriate that we consider it that way. If we're serious about it, we'll spend the money on it. Alderman Lowe. Mr. Tobert is whispering in my ear uh, that he would much prefer to be able to bring a report back to size this and determine what the cost would look like um, in terms of moving forward. And I, so, if I were Mr. Tobert, that's exactly what I would want to do. But so, since we seem to be so here's direction here, regardless of logic and reason, I have no difficulty. <laughs> asking uh, Mr. Watson or Mr. Tobert to uh, scope this project and bring us a budget. And how quickly could you do that, Mr. Tobert? Your Worship, at least a month? <coughs> Worship? April. He says at least a month. <laughs> then then, <laughs> then uh, we, could, we could do that uh, a month from now. Community, community. Can we do that? <laughs> I guess my point, Your Worship, is there's two two points here: community by community consultation, and options for doing it. I have an idea. So you're referring this? Yes. So I have an idea. Alderman Chabot has had a motion on the floor to direct administration to do this. You write this minute while you're standing rather than move your amendment, could say, refer this, refer this matter to, to the April scope. LPT for a scoping report detailing costs on a community by community consultation. If that gets us out of this bind, I will do that, your worship. If it gets us out of this bind. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Alderman Jones. So what we have in front of us right now is a referral motion because Alderman Chabot does not have enough to do at LPT. <laughs> uh -oh. <gonna> be chairman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> task force. Task force. Don't what we have to do yet today. You know, it's good. It's good that we can all laugh together after what we've been through today. <laughs> so what we have on the table right now is a referral motion moved by Alderman Lowe, seconded by Alderman Jones, to refer Alderman Chabot's motion to the April meeting of LPT with some costing around a community by community consultation. Sound good? You Discussion on yes. Refine that a little bit just to say refer back to the administration for a report to the Thank April. you. Okay. Discussion on the referral motion. Want to close Alderman Lowe? Oh, Alderman Pincott. Yeah, they don't work anymore. Uh, okay. you're, you're, you're turning yourself on and off. Let me try from here. My, my mic's shot. <laughs> yeah. Have a mic. Uh, hey, Mike. Thanks. That's um, uh, Mine's not. I'm just as challenged with the referral as I was with the motion. 
okay. and, and I get part of, to do a large scale community consultation, to even scope it around something that would be a discretionary, discretionary use, so around something then that would always involve community con consultation at the end of the day on every single individual application, okay. feels like, seems like, very large exercise in um, a lot of work and a lot of money that at the end of the day, if we have the community consultation and we decide to do it as discretionary use as per two and three, each individual application will then involve community consultation uh, and development permits do involve community input. Uh, it's, it's, I'm just, we're throwing work on top of work and the first, the, each pile of work is getting bigger. Uh, so for that reason, I, I think that, okay. I think that I, uh, I won't support the referral and I won't support, support the motion either. It, you know what, if we were gonna do it around permitted use, I'd be all over it. <laughs> Thanks, Alderman Pincott. On the referral motion, Alderman Chabot? All right. Oh, my light's not working very well. Oh, interesting. Um, that LED is not working. <laughs> um, I think um, a referral motion is uh, is probably a good idea. It's going to have some cost implications associated with it. Um, if we're going to do this thing right, then probably the appropriate method to go about doing it is a community by community basis. On in light of the fact that we have so many. Uh, LRT stations and, and BRT stations that reside in so many different communities that I uh, I can't help but imagine that my communities would want want to weigh in on the discussion of having R1 RC1 um, develop within close proximity to the uh, to the LRT stations <coughs> if, if it were going to be allowed where it's currently not allowed. This is essentially. Um, providing S designation to all of those RC1s and, and R1 properties. And so it, it equates to a, a, a mass rezoning. Um, as far as whether or not this is going to be a double indemnity kind of a thing where we undertake a co consultative process now and then undertake a subsequent consultative process, community consultative process, is actually not entirely accurate. Um, when you apply for a development permit application, there's a very limited circulation as to who has an opportunity to weigh in on the discussions. Yes, of course, it is notice posted, uh, but typically, unless you're an affected resident, unless you're directly next door to it or two or three doors down from the uh, house that's applying for a development permit application, your input is doesn't carry a lot of weight. The community association, of course, can weigh into it on weigh in on the issue, but as long as you meet the requirements of the land use bylaw i.e. you're providing off-site, uh, on-site parking, uh, you have minimum lot width requirements, you're meeting the, the requirements of the land use bylaw, your argument of I don't want it next door to me just won't fly. It, it bears no, no, no weight. So this, I think, is a very thoughtful approach. It is in keeping with the municipal development plan, looking at sensitive in intensification, providing it where it makes the most sense to do it. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think this is, uh, it may be a baby step, but I think it's the right baby step, and uh, I will be supporting this uh, referral. Thanks, Alderman uh, Chabot. On the referral? I, I'm not done. <laughs> I was just looking around. I've got a whole speaker. I'm just going to go through the speaker's list. I assume you want to speak on the referral. Alderman Jones? Okay. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Um, Your Worship, Members of Council, uh, the terms of reference are important. Uh, uh, hopefully a report can be ready for the April LPT meeting. And uh, I'll be able to make some further comments then about uh, what sort of, as much as uh, Mr. Watson may grit his teeth, about what sort of, uh, what type or what 
it would be the best route to go if you're going to go the consulting route. But I know that uh, Mr. Watson has his strategic reserve in the department. So I'm not as concerned about cost as about uh, how the money is spent. So we can get into that at the April LPT. Question, but I don't think you intended it as such. Alderman Carra. Thank you, Your Worship, members of council. I'm going to agree with Alderman uh, Pincott on this one. I think if we're spending time and resources on community by community consultation, we should be talking about overarching neighborhood change over time. We should not be talking about the just the for the time being incremental no-brainer of allowing secondary suites. Secondary suites are just one part of a comprehensive transformation that has to occur within 400 meters of transit stops. The timing of that, the end look, all of that, you know, uh, unless unless we're doing consultation and design work towards that end, I don't think I don't see the point in spending time or resources. And so I won't be supporting that referral motion. I think it's a waste of everyone's time. Thanks, Alderman Carr. Alderman Putmans. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I will support this motion. I think it is very important that the communities get an opportunity to discuss and learn more about the implications of what is a profound change to the zoning of their communities. When we speak of forcing, what we're speaking of is forcing a policy, a policy which can have profound impacts on the community's <coughs> livability for all stakeholders. It has implications to the look and the feel of the community, and I think anything less than a community-by-community community consultation will be unsatisfactory. The impacts of an LRT station on a Glendale will be different than the LRT impacts on a Christie or an Aspen. So I think all of these areas are entitled to a community-by-community community consultation, and they might well come up with different solutions and different ideas on a community-by-community community basis. So I heartily endorse this referral. Thank you, Your Worship. Thanks, Alderman Putmans, and good for you for being forward-thinking. When you said the LRT station on Glendale, let's think about that for a second. 17th Avenue and 45th Street, right. Uh, someday soon, Alderman Farrell. Thank you. Well, like um, Alderman Pincott and Kara before me, I'm not going to support this. Is, this is a huge body of work, and I'm sorry if it doesn't feel genuine. Um, this reminds me a little bit of the smoking bylaw. I don't know if you guys remember it, but we did get there eventually. Uh, I Can we um, please call it the no smoking bylaw. The, the no smoking <laughs> bylaw. Um, if we can't manage to make these permitted or, or, or even discretionary around LRT when it fits with everything that we've, all of our city policies in the new MDP and Planet and Fair Calgary and all that, that then I, um, I just don't think we're. We're ready, so um, I won't be. I won't be supporting it. And I, I've heard the use of the innovation funds to to fund this very large body of work. And this isn't innovation, Council. Thanks, Alderman Farrell. Anyone else on the referral motion? On the motion to refer, then. Oh, um, did you want to close, Alderman Lowe? Okay. On the referral motion then, this is to refer this to LPT in April for a scoping, are we agreed? Any opposed? Call the roll, please. Alderman Lowe? Yes. Alderman McLeod? No. Alderman Pincott? No. Alderman Putmans? Yes. Alderman Stevenson? Yes. Alderman Carra? No. Alderman Chabot? More work, yes. Alderman collier -Kosh? Yes. Alderman DeMong? Yes. Alderman Farrell? No. Alderman Hodges? Yes. Alderman Jones? Yes. Mayor Ninchy? No. That's carried, Your Worship. Alrighty. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we may be done with 
Oh, no, it was a referral motion. It was a referral motion. Any more motions yeah, arising on 10.3.4? Um, I'd like to make a motion to file the recommendations of LPT. Actually, you, you don't have to, Alderman Chabot, because one of the motions we um, one of the motions that we passed was to explicitly refer the report back to return to LPT. So you don't need to file the recommendations. Oh, okay, darn! I was hoping to file it. <laughs> I know you were looking forward to it, but any other motions arising on ten point three point four? Okay. 10.4.1, progress towards 8020 by 2020 in the residential sector, the UNE reports. Alderman Jones. Your Worship, I'll move all the reports. There was one presentation done that basically occurred, and we had a company come in um, that gave us an alternative, which would, hence gives you the direction on number four to include in the report other ways of uh, alternate concepts that were presented to look at how we can do waste, and uh, that's about it. And does that, do those alternative, was there a discussion at the committee if those alternatives included the waste to energy stuff that's in the report? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Do I have a seconder for that? Second. Thanks, uh, Alderman Pincott. So we're going to move, remember there's two now. So 10.4.1 and the one that we removed from the consent agenda, which was 10.4.2 on multifamily recycling. Questions, discussion on 10.4.1? Oh, I'll do it. Mr. Pritchard, <laughs> waste energy. I was a bit perplexed by the report, to be frank. Um, it seemed to dismiss a lot of what's going on on waste energy a bit out of hand. Am I reading too much into it? Thank you, Your Worship. Actually, we spent 18 months and uh, uh, produced a 750-page report, Your Worship, that uh, really looked at, um, amongst other things, waste to energy um, and the alternative um, approaches to dealing with organics. So we started off with the um, um, looking at uh, composting um, and then we looked at a number of other technologies and all the way up to the most advanced waste to energy technologies. And the recommendation that came from the consultant after that study was that um, um, there is a place for waste to energy and there's a time for it. But, um, but, the, uh, but the simplest and most expedient uh, way to deal with the initial problem of yard waste and food waste from residential is actually to go with a simple composting route. And then um, by the time we get to sort of 75% uh, diversion, that's the time when we would start looking at uh, uh, um, the waste to energy technologies. And by that time, a lot of the, um, um, the sort of untried and, and tested uh, technologies will have uh, been around for a bit longer and we'll have a better track record of, uh, of knowing how they perform and, and so on. So th this, it's quite a thought, uh, well thought out strategy, Your Worship, in terms of uh, the proposals. That is precisely what I needed to hear, Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. Alderman Carra. Asked and answered right there. Thank you. Alderman Hodges, next item. Anything more on this one? So on the committee's recommendations, then did you want to close, Alderman Jones? Close. On the committee's recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Uh, Alderman Chabot is opposed. Carried. 10.4.2 uh, then, which is uh, the one we took off the consent agenda on multifamily recycling. Alderman, it's already been moved and seconded, so Alderman Hodges. Formerly 6.3. Formerly 6.3. I was just looking for it. Thank you. Formerly 6.3. Uh, yes, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Pritchard, uh, this isn't a, a committee meeting I happen to be at. I caught some of it on uh, closed circuit uh, coverage we have in the building next door. And uh, there's uh, a bit more uh, uh, inquiries I'm receiving anyway from uh, condominium, multifamily, but condominium developments where they have no uh, recycling uh, service, whatever, from any either a private company or, or I gather with the rules where they are from the city. So to open this up to, you might say, um, some City of Calgary services, this would require an amendment to the policy we have at the present time, plain and simple? Um, that's correct, Your Worship. But the I th the, the um, present direction we have is that uh, um, that the city does not get involved in multi-family recycling until um, it's evident that we're not going to achieve our 80-20 goal by 2020, and, and that's not the case at the moment. So, so 
complying with that direction, we would wait. And, and I think the strategy that we have here, again, is quite, um, quite well developed in terms of being able to um, spend a little bit of time really working a lot more with the, um, with the industry, uh, the private recyclers, uh, looking at what perhaps the city's position might be um, ultimately, and then coming back with a, with a full plan for council to consider um, uh, in the 2015 to 17 business cycle. Yeah, it's a couple of years out, yeah. though, isn't it? Yeah. And then I can uh, pursue this conversation with you offline. Thank you. Alderman Chabot. Thank you. Mr. Pritchard, where are we at with regards to uh, the possibility of these private organizations uh, depositing material directly to the MERF facility, or how are we facilitating that? Thank you, Your Worship. The the um, arrangement that we've made at present is to um, facilitate that by having a, a drop-off um, station at our Shepherd landfill, so that the uh, so that the private recyclers can come to our uh, facility at, at uh, our landfill and drop it off there, and then we we take it in our uh, trucks to the uh, multi uh, to, to the MRF, uh, the materials recycling facility. Okay, so they they pay a standard tipping fee then. They they pay. It's around. I think it's thirty two dollars a ton. Um, to be able to drop it off at our facility, and that covers our costs of basically operating that um, that uh, facility and, and getting the um, recyclables to the MRF. It doesn't cover the cost of the processing fee at the MRF, so it's it's just covering our costs to be able to do that. And it it you know it, it would probably amount to twenty or thirty cents per per customer per month or something like that. It's not it wouldn't have a huge impact on on their customer base. Okay. It's what 120 or something per ton typically for regular waste. If to dispose of waste in in the landfill is 95 dollars a ton. I'm right sorry. 95 a ton right okay. now. Oh, it's still under 100 bucks. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, hoping to do something on administrative inquiry specifically related to that issue. Thank you. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. Just to um, clear up because of Alderman Hodges' question, when we when I moved the motion back um, two and a half years ago uh, to do this, to leave the uh, multifamily open to the uh, private sector, at that same time, the uh, a part of that direction was for the uh, uh, our administration to work at getting access for those private contractors to the MRF. Uh, that hasn't it hasn't happened until just in. December, the private contractors were uh, brought together, and then in January, they were allowed to dump at this transfer site. So it's just now, as of 2011, that the private contractors can actually get going at this. And so I think you're going to see quite an uptake on this because there is a lot of pressure from condominium associations to find a method of uh, moving their recyclables. And I, so I think you're going to see more of that now that there's some action taken on it. I'm not happy with the action because I'm not happy with the fact that these uh, uh, private contractors are not able to take the, um, their recyclables straight to the MRF. But at least um, Waste and Recycling has set up this transfer from Shepherd which is, uh, is good for the interim, and they're still going to keep working on getting it set up at the MRF. Thank you, Your Worship. I still think we should have called it the Sustainable Materials Recycling Facility so we could call it the SMRF every time you say MRF. <laughs> Alderman Pincott. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pritchard, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I missed this meeting. With the changes in, in making it so that, so that private recyclers can drop off materials, in consultation with the industry, how much uptake do we think we're, we're actually going to get? Or how much do you think we can anticipate over the next few years? Well, I think we, you, you worship, we are quite surprised actually at how many people uh, multifamily um, facilities already have recycling. And, 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 and we're just beginning to find out more and more about who's, who's doing what out there. And part of the challenge is, is that the huge diversity of um, Obviously, um, housing and apartment types that, that could fall into the multifamily um, sector. So there's not really a simple solution to any particular one um, one housing type. And and some recyclers prefer to pick up just fiber. Some don't prefer it to be commingled. And 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 
probably would not want to go to the, to the MRF. Uh, many others would. Um, but I think we're quite optimistic that if we have, um, as, as Alderman Stevenson said, we haven't really uh, had a really good engaging uh, conversation with the industry until fairly recently. And I think we're quite optimistic that if we do that and spend time with them and look at the opportunities for transfer stations, for um, uh, possible easier access to the MRF with the right vehicle types and so on, that, um, that there will be a, a tremendous uptake because um, we, we're hearing from, uh, condom, uh, from multifamily residents that they, that they want this service. Okay, are, are, are we being, uh, because we sort of have this, for lack of a better word, prohibition on the city actually doing this, uh, are we being proactive in trying to not just engage the private recyclers but actually encourage and prod them into doing this because I, I got to tell you after after the rollout of the blue bins and sort of dealing with the challenge of, of the rollout and people understanding how they worked the only call that I get in my office the only call since the re, since the rollout is how come I can't recycle how come I don't get it and, and I think the, I mean, the answer to that is that, I mean, as, as you know, the opportunity for recycling for the multifamily sector at the moment is the community recycle depots, the, the CRDs that we have, 52 right. of them in, around the city. And that option is, is there for multifamily residents, or they can engage the services of, of um, I th we were quite surprised at how many um, uh, private recyclers there are out there in, in, in business, um, and they can engage the services of those. Um, and and um, we are um, having fairly active discussions with that industry to try and encourage more, um, uh, or to try and facilitate um, multifamily recycling. Um, and if, if in the report, the, uh, the attachment talks about the strategy of uh, attachment one, talks about the sort of multifaceted approach that we're going to take to try and encourage multifamily uh, recycling over the next... Um, over the next little while, and, and then with a view to really developing a proper, comprehensive, uh, full service in time for the 15 to 17 business cycle. Okay, one last question. When somebody calls 311 and they live in a condo or an apartment and they don't have recycling and they call our 311 to say, why don't I have recycling? Do we give them a list of private recyclers that they can call? That I don't know, Your Worship. We'd have to look into that. I think that would be a great idea if we could ensure that it, that we are supporting, pushing people towards that. Yeah, we can certainly look into that and work with Mr. Stevens. Great. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Anyone else? Alderman Jones, did you want to close? Closed. Closed? So on the motion to accept the administration recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. 10.5.1, Audit Committee Terms of Reference Review, Alderman Pincott. Uh, thank you, Worship. Move the recommendations of committee. Alderman Pincott. Oh, let, let's get a seconder. Alderman Putmans. Alderman Pincott. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Collier. -Cart. Alderman McLeod will second it. Um, Alderman Pincott, just so I understand the recommendations of the committee, I believe they are let's work with the new auditor to get this right rather than accept the previous set of recommendations. Is that right? Indeed. The, the, and the recommendations are to uh, uh, not just to, um, to uh, look at terms of reference for the audit committee, but actually to be quite uh, uh, a little bit more forceful okay. and, uh, and actually create, develop a, an audit committee bylaw so that, so that the, the terms of reference for the committee are would be embedded in a bylaw. Enshrined in a bylaw. Yep. Okay. I think, and uh, and when when you take a look at best practices that are out there, it 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 is the way that things are going. Okay. For the record, Alderman Pincott, I do like recommendation number C in the original recommendation, so I hope we talk about it. Um. Anyone else on this one? Okay. Very well then. On the committee's recommendations, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Land Committee. Oh, I do? 
Um, yep. Land Committee, item 10.6.1, LAS 2011-02. Um, Alderman Hodges. Yes, uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, this uh, <clears throat> was the subject of some discussion at Land Committee uh, over the space of two meetings. We ran out of time on uh, the first uh, meeting, and so we set up a second one. The, the uh, report was uh, uh, accepted by the committee. And you have two recommendations to authorize the lease recommendations as outlined in attachment two. And number two, direct administration to give a status report on the progress of negotiations between Innovate Calgary and Vakova to the uh, Land and Asset Strategy Committee not later than September 13th, 2011. Vakova, of course, is the new name for the VRRI, which has been in place up on uh, 32nd Avenue Northwest uh, since uh, 1967. Um, they're looking for a longer lease, Your Worship, uh, in order to facilitate their uh, program of rebuilding the VRRI, uh, renovating the uh, facilities, and um, in fact, re perhaps rebuilding on that site. But none of this is going to happen unless uh, we agree to extend the lease that they have on the city-owned land. With that, I shall see. Sorry. Sorry, Alderman Hodges. I have a bunch of questions yeah. on this one. Do we have so, a seconder? So did the committee. Do we have a seconder, first of all? Alderman Lowe, thank you. Yeah. You know uh, something? I'm going to do something extremely um, uh, uncharacteristic. I'm going to get on my chair now um, because I do have a number of questions on this one that I'd like to present to administration. Alderman Crow? Oh, sorry, Alderman right. Hodges, you're done? I'm done with the introduction, and we'll see what your questions are. Okay. Uh, Mayor Nenshi. <laughs> the swagger. He's good at that, isn't he? Don't get in the habit. <laughs> I found this uh, whole thing rather perplexing. Um, to start with, uh, I have a lot of experience, as many of you know, in the nonprofit sector and in capital campaigns and the like, and I have never heard of a nonprofit organization making the claim that unless their lease is extended for a period beyond the useful life of a building, that they cannot fundraise for the building. It's a, it's a shall we say, dubious claim at best. Um, that said, I'm a very, very big fan of this organization. I think they do extraordinary work in the community. Um, but I have also spoken with the folks at Innovate Calgary who, quite frankly, don't have any plans yet. They're a new organization, and what they're looking for is ultimate flexibility. So, Mr. Stevens, I don't get these recommendations. It sounds to me like recommendation number one is extend the lease for a big, long period of time, and recommendation number two is report back on the negotiations. But if we extend the lease, doesn't that by definition mean the negotiations are over? Your Worship, um that, that's correct. The, uh, the, rec the second recommendation was added after, on the second day. Uh, and if I can be so bold, I'll try and interpret. I think where committee was going was to say, in fact, Innovate Calgary did not have any specific plans, but there was a desire by committee to see if the two groups couldn't get together in this period of time to see if they couldn't come to a, a better resolution between the two of them. And the encouragement was for the two of them to do that and then for the administration to come back in um, no later than September to see if they had made any progress in their discussion. So, so I can live with recommendation number two because I think both parties are kind of being bad actors a little bit here, but doesn't recommendation number one put the thumb on the scale? Doesn't it say Vakovia can stay there forever and ever and ever, now you can go negotiate? Um, yes. it uh, it. it uh, that that the the original uh, recommendation was was not that w was to say you know what we've got these two groups um, their claim being what it was they could not proceed um, it, it it gives the opportunity for what Bacovia was saying 
we weren't we weren't having any success in the previous discussions because we weren't getting anywhere with Innovate Calgary because mm. of all of their changes. Okay. That's the, that's the key piece I was missing. Okay. Um, because they felt like the, there was no incentive to continue. Well, it wasn't only that. As you're aware, Your Worship, that, that Innovate Calgary's gone through a number of iterations, number of changes, changes in leadership and, and guidance from uh, the university and the province as to whether or not they were going to participate. And it was Vicovia's position, I believe, to the committee, and committee members can correct me, they really needed to get some type of formal consent by way of lease so that they could get into the discussions with uh, Innovate Calgary. Okay. I think given that, I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Stevens, and I think given that, we, I, I still have some trouble with this. Um, Alderman Hodges might freak out at this. I can understand the need to bring the two organizations together, and I can understand the need to give them a deadline, but I have a lot of trouble with making, letting one of the parties um, have all the power in the negotiation. So as a result, I was just, really? Could do. I, what I was going to do was I was going to suggest an amendment to number one, which is to authorize the lease recommendations outlined in attachment two as of 2011, September 15th, pending the outcome of recommendation number two. So in other words, they've got a deadline. If they can't come to an agreement by September the 15th, then the Covia gets what they want. I understand that still means they've got a they've got a, a, a incentive to drag their heels on this, but I think it at least says to Innovate Calgary you can come to the table as a partner here, um, and the city doesn't have a preordained outcome. So I'm going to suggest that amendment. Second. Alderman Chabot. Any discussion to that proposed amendment? I have my light on you. Alderman Hodges. Right, thank you. Uh, Your Worship, members of council, I think uh, the committee might have uh, agreed with an amendment like that uh, through the chair, uh, Mayor Nenshi, except that the uh, parties have been in discussions at various times in the last uh, three or four years. And these discussions resulted in no agreement uh, whatsoever. In fact, uh, what Innovate Calgary presented at committee was a delay of six months uh, in the first meeting and second meeting, it was a delay of three months. And uh, personally, if I had thought there would be any agreement in three months or six months, I might have agreed with Mr. Masters. But I know there will not be an agreement in three months. I know there will not be an agreement in six months. So uh, given the issues involved, uh, Innovate Calgary, quite frankly, Your Worship, see uh, uh, Vacovia as being in their way. So their idea is to have a negotiation set up somehow with the province to relocate them in the Innovate Calgary area, i.e. north of 32nd Avenue and west of Crochelle Trail. Uh, given my personal experience in trying to uh, be a part of and getting uh, corporate properties involved in a new site, the new site for the Northwest Rec Center, uh, that personally was, uh, with Alderman Lowe and myself, that was three years. So three years in dealing with the province. So I think that's what Mr. Masters is interested in, getting the province involved on their land holdings within the Innovate Calgary area. So I don't, I don't see this delay as really achieving. Normally, I would agree. But given the history of this issue, I will not be supporting your amendment. Alderman Farrell. Thank you. I was just talking with the mayor and thought that um, if this was referred to the mayor, perhaps he could meet with both parties and help facilitate. This is the second time you've referred something to the mayor, Alderman Farrell, and it didn't work out very well the first time, but. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I can live with that. Do you think that would, I think it might be helpful. So Mr. Hodges, or Alderman Hodges. We have Hodges a seconder would, for. Alderman Farrell's referral motion. Until this, was it September? Alderman DeMong seconds. No, not that long. Not Let's, that long? Uh, I got a meeting before that. Give me two minutes. June? Okay, so we're, a motion to refer to the mayor's office um, to report back to council by June. 
Are you comfortable with seconding that, Alderman DeMong? Okay, any discussion surrounding the referral motion? I see. Uh, I Alderman go. Hodges? <laughs> Your Worship, uh, there's nothing like experience in dealing with this issue. And the so part, you and me are both going to be on the part on the parties involved. So uh, uh, I think uh, June is, is a good time because uh, a new lease wouldn't have taken effect till July 1st in any case. And um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, <clears throat> Alderman uh, Farrell, if you can add a report back to land committee, uh, not later than July 15th, because we usually have a committee meeting early in the month. So not later than July 15th of 2011. Perfect. Alderman Farrell, you, you, yeah, I'm just asking if you agree with that amend. Okay, I'm going to allow it. Alderman Lowe? Yeah, my question, Mr. Stevens, is where does this leave us legally? Uh, we're fine, Your Worship. This, th there's nothing that's happened. This, this, uh, the discussions and negotiations are always dependent upon any final direction. From council, and this is a referral back to try and come to a somewhat different conclusion. So there's no there, legally there's no binding obligations. There's no offer and acceptance until council actually dis decides on this. So whatever the outcomes of that were, I understand the direction is to report back in July. I guess my concern in listening to this conversation is the difference between the end of June and the first of July is little as a couple of nanoseconds well your worship the reality is the tenant currently has a lease in place until 2027 oh, okay. anyway okay so this is this is a desire for the group to be able to go out and fundraise and make some commitments on a new building which was the presentation at committee okay thank you thank you your worship Okay, no more discussion to the referral. Anything to close, Alderman Farrell? Can we get clarification on those dates again? So it's return um, to council through land. And that's it. And that's the strategy in June, about to come back to land in July, uh, council in July? Not later than July 15th, so. Okay. Not later than July 15th. Are we all comfortable with the referral motion? I'll call the question. All in favor? Agreed. Opposed? That's carried. All right, um, so that brings us to um, Urgent Business PAC 201106, City Manager's Report on the Council Innovation Fund. What should you do to my table? In terms of reference. Um, can I have someone move this, please? Thanks, Alderman collier Cart. Seconded by Alderman Chabot. Um, so uh, the PAC met as per Council's direction and came up with these simple um, application procedures for the innovation fund. The basic idea here is that PAC will vet the proposals and then council will have the final decision on them. Uh, we, you will be able to apply for the innovation fund up to the 15th of the month. Uh, it will then be considered at the following PAC meeting and there is a guideline that we will hold back approximately half of the remaining funds Oh, we do have it. Great. We will hold back approximately half of the remaining funds to be spent in the second half of the year this year. So very broad guidelines. We didn't want to uh, hurt the innovation concept of the innovation fund too, more, too much, but we did want to make sure that we had some good numbers around it. And what's being handed out now is a form that my office put together, very straightforward, um, that one would fill out in terms of applying. So any questions on this? All right, um, Alderman collier card did you want to close? Sure. Okay. 
Uh, well, it was your it was your initial intent. So if you're happy, I'm happy. Um, all right, then on the motion to accept these terms of reference, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. So we will accept applications up until the 15th of this month to be delivered to my office on this form, please. And I'll make sure you have electronic versions of the form as well. All right, I'll take a motion to go in camera. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Seconded, Alderman Jones. Before we go, did oh. you want to make a motion about the 9.30, just in case we're a little bit longer? In um, yeah, can I, can I take a motion to uh, dispense with the items on the agenda tonight, even if we go after 9.30? I don't think we will. Thanks, Alderman Pincott. Alderman Jones, are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Alderman Farrell is opposed. We needed two-thirds. We're good. And motion to go in camera. Are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? All right, in we go. And we are back, Alderman Hodges. Yeah, I move uh, the committee rise and report to worship. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Second. Alderman Jones, thank you. Are we agreed? Very well then, Alderman Hodges, you've still got the floor. Yes, thank you, Worship. Uh, three uh, land items: uh, land and asset strategy 201104, proposed sale of industrial land, Great Plains, Ward 9. Uh, first recommendation that the uh, land and asset strategy committee recommendation contained in the report. LAS uh, 201104 be adopted in the recommendations. Number two, the recommendations report and attachments remain confidential following the in camera discussion under sections 23.1b, 24.1a, 24.1g, and 25.1b of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act until 2013, December 31. Okay. That's the first one. Do you want to do them all together? Okay. 2011-05 is again a proposed sale uh, of lands in the uh, industri industrial lands, Great Plains, Ward 9. Uh, number one, the Land and Asset Strategy Committee recommendation contained in the report LAS 2011-05 be adopted and that the recommendations report and attachments remain confidential following the in-camera discussions pursuant to the same sections 23-1B, 24-1A, 24-1G and 25-1B sub B of the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act until uh, 2013, December 31. And last but not least. Uh, On a point of order, those first two items that he's referenced, I'm not supportive of those, and I would rather vote on those separately. Rather I was going to vote on them. I was going to vote on them all separately anyway. Okay. Alderman Chua, I was just going to let him put them all on the table. Thank you. Then we'll vote on them separately. And uh, the last one's fairly straightforward. Uh, 2011-06, proposed transactions, North Dufferin Industrial Land, Ward 12, that the Land and Asset Strategy Committee recommendations contain the report, uh, Land and Asset Strategy 2011-06 be adopted. All right, then, um, Alderman Farrell, you're going to second those as the vice chair? Thank you. Um, all right, any discussion on these items? So on the first one, then, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. On the second one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot is opposed. On the third one, are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Um, all right, then, Alderman Jones. Your Worship, the uh, first one is AOC 2011, a review of the allowance account policy and that the Aldermanic Office Coordinating Committee recommendations containing report AOC 2011-05 be adopted. Thank you. Alderman Chabot is seconding. Uh, any, dis uh, uh, any discussion on the... Uh, why don't you put them both on the, on the table? Okay. AOC 2011-15, consideration of increasing the community CSIF allocation awards that the Aldermanic Office Coordinating Committee recommendation containing report AOC 2011-15 be adopted. And Alderman Chabot is seconding. Any discussion on this one? 
Um, these reports are now will now be public once we pass it, right, Madam right. Clerk? Okay, so I can actually say to those intrepid members of the press uh, still in the room, read AOC 201105. <laughs> Alderman Chabot and I may have a difference of opinion on what it says, but uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Okay, on the first one, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. And on the second one, are we agreed? Agreed. Any opposed? Carried. Um, Alderman Stevenson. Thank you, Your Worship. That the verbal report negotiations with the Calgary Airport Authority be received for information and that the discussion with respect to the verbal report remain confidential pursuant to sections 23.1b, 24.1b, 24.1c, 25.1c, and 27.1b of FOIP. Thanks, Alderman Stevenson. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Chabot. Any discussion on this one? Are we agreed? Carried. Alderman McLeod. Um, with respect to the Calgary Public Library Board, that Jane Sidell, Sidnell be appointed to the Calgary Public Library Board as an elected member for three years, and that the in-camera discussion remain confidential under Section 19.1 of the Freedom of Information Privacy Protection Act. Thank you. Alderman Farrell, you're seconding. Thank you. Any discussion on this one? Are we agreed? Any opposed? Carried. Um, who had the last one? Alderman McLeod? All right. That the verbal report uh, personnel item be received for information and that the discussion with respect to the verbal report remain confidential pursuant to sections 24.1b, 1 of the Freedom of uh, Information Privacy Protection Act. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Thanks. Uh, Alderman Pincott, any discussion on this one? Are we agreed? agreed. Carried. Alderman Putman's. Yes, Your Worship, thank you. Verbal report, appointment of regulation of digital, electronic, or computer signage task force. A lot of consonants. That Alderman Chabot, Chair of SPC on LPT, Alderman DeMong, Alderman Marr, be appointed to the regulation of digital, electronic, or computer signage task force, and two, that a terms of reference to include a sunset clause of 2011, June 15, as well as clarification with respect to staffing and public participation, comma, return to the 2011 March 21 regular meeting of council, period. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Alderman Carra. <laughs> um, and yes, Alderman Marr, even though he's not here, did agree that he would like to do it thanks to electronic communication. Um, any discussion on this one? Are we agreed? agreed. Any opposed? Opposed. Uh, Alderman Hodges is opposed. And Alderman Hodges. Yes, uh, move the... Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's about what I was about to move, ah. the waving of the reading of, unless someone wants to hear it. All right. Dispense with the, the Do reading. I have a seconder for that? Thanks, Alderman Jones. Are we agreed? Any opposed? Alderman Chabot really wants to have it read. I'll read it to you privately later, Alderman Chabot. <laughs> um, okay, Alderman Hodges. Move we adjourn. Alderman Jones, are we agreed? Thank you, guys. It's been a good day. Oh, it's only 10 o'clock.